Placebo by David Mason. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Barry Howarth. Placebo by David Mason. The object appeared in the middle of Main Way, about fifty feet from the statue of Vachel Lindsay, and at least a hundred from anything else. It was much too big and complicated to have been hidden anywhere, and it hadn't any wheels, tracks, wings, or other visible means of movement. Corrigan, looking the object over, decided that it could not have come from any logical place in the world. Not being prejudiced, he then thought a little about the illogical places, and the places that weren't in the world. Corrigan decided it must be another attempt at time travel, and he clucked his tongue sympathetically. Well, someone had to break the news. Corrigan arose from the grass and walked towards the object. There was a young man sitting in the object, on a sort of high saddle. He looked a little wild-eyed, and he seemed to be talking to himself as he pulled and twisted at the rows of controls in front of him. Corrigan, looking up at him, decided that he couldn't be very healthy, and that the stiff grey garments he wore must be extremely uncomfortable. "'Greetings, traveller,' Corrigan called. "'You're speaking English!' the young man exclaimed. "'Good. Maybe I can get some help here. What year is this?' "'1955, by most systems.' The young man turned a little paler. I've just left 1955, he said unhappily. Four times, in fact. Four different 1955s. And each one's a bit worse. Now the machine won't work. Your theory's wrong, Corrigan said calmly. Hasn't it occurred to you yet that time travel might be impossible? The young man made a choked sound. He began to climb down from his perch, keeping his eyes fixed suspiciously on Corrigan as he did so. He saw Corrigan as a small brown man, dressed in loose blue trousers, barefoot, and with a puff of white hair that never seemed to have been properly cut. The lawns and grassy roads, the bright and impermanent-looking buildings, and Corrigan himself, all added up to one thing in the young man's mind. "'You're wrong,' Corrigan said. "'I'm not a lunatic, and this isn't an asylum. We don't have them.' The young man on the ground now stared at Corrigan in evident horror. Mind reading? More or less, Corrigan said. It saves time. For instance, you're Darwin and Lena, and you'd like very much to get back to wherever you started from. In fact, you have to, or something unpleasant might happen to you, by your standards. I'd be absent without permission, Lena admitted. I, I wish you wouldn't do that. Only when absolutely necessary, Corrigan smiled. I'm a philosopher by trade myself, not a mind reader. My name's Philip Corrigan, and I'd be very glad to help you on your way. But I think it might be a little difficult. We aren't really a very mechanically minded people here. Lena ran his hands through his hair. I've got to get back. Isn't there anybody who knows something about time machines? Corrigan had been thinking swiftly. He had also been carrying on a conversation which Lena could not possibly hear with a man who was several miles away. Burwell, he wants to go home. Fine, he ought to. Why doesn't he? He's lost his confidence. He thinks his machine's broken down. That kind, eh? I suppose the thing never really did work very well. Most of them don't. They go travelling around, hit or miss, through probability under the operator's own mental steam. But this fellow probably comes from a world where an idea like that's illegal. Sounds like it. Corrigan, take him on a guided tour or something and keep him busy. I'll be over as soon as I can. I'm going to do something for his self-confidence. Here's the story to give him. Corrigan had always enjoyed conducting guided tours, and he was enjoying this one especially well. He had a slightly wicked taste for complicated teasing, and Lena was a perfect object. He had evidently come from one of the more unpleasant probabilities, a world full of complex rules and harshly restrictive. Everything that he saw bothered him. The handsome girls wearing unstrategically placed flowers and very little else, the flocks of children as plentiful as pigeons and apparently as free of supervision, 
the total absence of anybody actually performing useful work. All of it contributed to Lena's increasing nervousness. The guided tour went in a wide circle, and Lena and Corrigan wound up sitting in a tavern facing on Main Way. Lena ignored the green drink before him and peered unhappily out the big window towards his machine. Where is that friend of yours? he asked for the fifth time. He'll be here, Corrigan assured him. Why hurry? Don't you like it here? Lena's mouth hardened. He looked around him and he shook his head. No, he spoke almost apologetically. I'm sorry. Well, look, old fellow, no hard feelings, I hope. But this world of yours is primitive. Degenerate, I'd say. Primitive? No laws, not even morals. Those girls! And of course you don't have any civilised advantages. Not even ground transportation. That man you spoke of has to walk here. And that's something else I don't understand. You say he's another time traveller? Probability traveller, actually, Corrigan corrected. All right, probability. Why does he stay here? Why would a really intelligent man give up civilization? Well, you know how it is. He's gone native, you might say. Life among the lotus eaters and all that. Might happen to anybody, even yourself. Lena shuddered. It's all right, though, Corrigan continued. He'll be here any minute, and I'm sure he'll be able to help. Knows all there is to know about these machines. In fact, here he comes now. Burwell entered, and Corrigan could hardly suppress a small chuckle. Burwell had picked up Lena's ideas about what a man of intelligence and authority ought to look like, and had gone to some trouble to look the part. He was wearing a uniform of some sort, spectacles, and an expression of extreme wisdom. I'm sure I can repair what's wrong, Burwell told Leather. Let's go and look at your machine. Arriving, Burwell climbed over the mechanism with an air of bored ability, occasionally thumping at something, adjusting something else, or hitting a part with a tool until it rang. He muttered to himself as he worked, allowing the sound of his musings to drift in Lena's direction. Hmm, badly twisted impeller. The varnish is more or less waffled. Let's see if... Ah, there we are. He climbed down and solemnly shook hands with Lena. Fine machine you've got there, my boy. It'll take you back to your own place quite easily now. There wasn't a thing wrong with it except the drift crotch. However, I wouldn't use it again if I were you. There's no real control on these things. A man could end up anywhere. And of course you'd never find your way back here without control. Well, thanks, Lena said doubtfully. He glanced around. It's a shame there's no way we could regularly communicate between our worlds. There's a lot we could do for this one. I'm sure of that, Earl said, hastily looking away. But it isn't worth the danger and difficulty of reaching us. For myself, it doesn't matter any more. He assumed a nobly tragic expression. But you are young. You've got your life ahead of you. Your state and your society need you. I'm glad to help you on your way. Lena mounted the machine, and Burwell beamed athwart at Corrigan. I've convinced him that the thing works, and that it would not be easy to come back. Actually, that machine of his is a real work of art. <laughs> it doesn't do a damn thing. This boy comes from a place where they have to have a mechanical crutch for everything. His gadgets are pink pill stuff, something to convince him he can do things he could do anyway. All we have to do now is to give him a small mental shelf to help him along and he'll be home in no time. All right now, shove! Corrigan and Burwell shoved. Lena and his machine faded and were gone, leaving only a flattened place on the grass. Brr, Burwell said. Am I glad that worked. If he'd stayed another week or so, we would have had our first lunatic of the century. Or worse, Corrigan said, stirring the grass with his toes. Did you get what he was thinking about when he talked about his world and ours getting into touch and civilising us? I got it all right, Burwell said. That fellow's mind was a swamp, a real primitive. And just like any other primitive, all he needed was a placebo from a witch doctor. Me, in my savage regalia. 
Just let me get this thing with the glass in it off my nose and these button things opened up a bit and we can get on with that chess game. I hope the next traveller picks somewhere else to land, though. I've never felt so silly in my life. End of Placebo by David Mason Recording by Barry Howarth, Brisbane, Australia The Rat Racket by David H. Keller, M.D. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Robert Griffin. The Rat Racket by David H. Keller, M.D. Richard Moyer, senior partner of the firm of Moyer and Perkins, read that letter over twice before he called in the man who had helped him make the importing of high-grade groceries from England the most profitable business for over twenty years. He simply handed the letter over to Paul Perkins without a word of explanation. The latter read it through and handed it back in equal silence, but the hand that held the letter trembled. Just another racket, exclaimed Moyer, finally. Looks like it. I suppose we were foolish to start in paying for protection. First our trucks were threatened, then the new building, after that our best customers were bombed, and we had to pay to protect them. Your son was kidnapped, and the police. They even went so far as to advise that we keep on paying. And now this letter. We might as well close out the business. All our profits go towards supporting a gang of criminals who have muscled into every type of American industry. On the face of it, the letter looks innocent enough, sighed Perkins, as he picked it up and gave it another reading. Simply says that the rat menace is increasing, cites several business houses where the rodents have done a great deal of damage, and offers to give our warehouse complete protection for 5000 a week. You could show that letter to a 100 police officials, and they would laugh at your fears. But I am not laughing, because that letter was written on the same damaged typewriter that the other letters were written on, and those gangsters have not failed to make any of their threats good. Suppose we pretend that they are honest, and answer their letter and send them a cheque for the first week's protection. They will laugh at you, and send back the cheque. They may, at that, then we will give them the cash. In either case, it will give us time to think. I feel that they are only experimenting with us. They are after larger game than 5,000 a week. We shall see and hear more of this rat business in a while. Write to them, and tell them we will pay the cash, and put the entire matter in the hands of the Chamber of Commerce. If it does not act soon, the entire city will be in the hands of the gangsters. The complaint of Moyer and Perkins was only one of a dozen similar ones which reached the Chamber of Commerce that day. In a secluded room of the Manufacturers Club, a dozen wealthy men met day after day, hearing and weighing evidence against the hundred forms of racketeering which was rapidly becoming a terrible and powerful enemy to the varied industries of the metropolis. Practically every business had been threatened, and more than one captain of the industry blustered openly, but paid his weekly tribute silently in order to protect his business, family, and home. Up to this time, the usual weapon had been the strong-armed man and the bomb. While these were bad enough, they were at least understood. When it came to rats, it was different. Of course, everybody knew something about rats, that they were supposed to be numerous around the riverfronts and warehouses, but on the other hand, Rats were seldom seen in daylight, and there were many New Yorkers who never saw one. Not one of the dozen men had been raised on a farm, and none had served in the trenches during the World War. They did not understand rats, so they hesitated, and finally simply advised the merchants who had received the rat letters to use their own judgment. As a result, some paid tribute and some did not. There is no evidence to show that those who paid were 100% free from rats in their warehouses, but within a week there was ample proof that at least three wholesale groceries and one laundry had been invaded overnight by rats in sufficient quantity to cause thousands of dollars worth of damages. Moyer and Perkins heard the news and decided to pay another 5000 The defence committee of the Chamber of Commerce was called to an extra meeting at the El Dorado Hotel. The owner of the hotel was one of the committee. A man who, so far, had taken a very inactive part in its transactions. He did not waste time in giving the reason for the special meeting. I was called on the telephone this morning, he explained. The person at the other end wanted to protect my hotel from rats for the small compensation of $25,000 a week. He referred casually to the free warehouses and one laundry that had been wrecked last week. Right at the present time I have, on an average, 1,200 guests a night. They are here to be entertained, not to be frightened by rats. But here is the point. 
If I yield, every other hotel in the city will be placed in a similar position. 300,000 strangers are in the city every day. Suppose that 10 hotels were overrun with rats in one week, and the fact was circulated in the press. What would that cost the city? Better pay it, growled one of the men. He happened to own a hotel. He knew how temperamental was the pleasure-seeking stranger. Singularly, that advice was the only brand given by the rest of the committee. They seemed strangely unable to offer any remedy except to keep on paying in every way possible by unpleasant news from the newspapers. Inside of next month, 55 hotels were paying a weekly tax to the rat racketeers. One small hotel refused and was at once deluged with an army of rats which drove out guests and employees, killed one old scrubwoman, and severely injured 20 of the cooks, waiters, and porters who received the brunt of the rodent onslaught. Moyer and Perkins were still paying the 5000 a week when, to their surprise, a visitor dropped into their office and casually suggested that they sell him their business. It used to be a good business, exclaimed Moyer. It still is, interrupted Perkins. What my partner means is this. We have our share of trade, but the overhead has become so heavy that we have not been able to make any money lately. That is what I understand, commented the stranger. In fact, I was sent here by the Chamber of Commerce. They told me that you had been paying money for rat protection. That is about the only reason I want to buy your business. Your business is supposed to be worth about 200000 and your real estate is much more. Suppose I give you half a million and advise you to keep quiet about the sale. You mean carry on the business under the old name? asked Moya, looking at the prospective buyer earnestly. Something like that. The Englishman shook his head. Not and remain in this country. They kidnapped my son, no telling what they will do next. If the policies of the firm are changed, anything that is done, we shall be blamed for, no matter who really owns the business. Then you and your partner take a vacation in Europe. You can afford it. All I am asking for is an exact account of your transactions with these racketeers, so I can have something to work on. May I ask what you want to do with the business? interrogated the junior partner, Perkins. Certainly. I intend to use it as one of my experimental laboratories for the study of a mammal, known as the Mus Norvegicus, called, in common English, the brown rat. He is supposed to have originated from the Mus Humiliatus of Central Asia. Now will you gentlemen take the half a million? We will exclaimed Perkins. Then may I ask your name? Winifred Willoughby. Not the one who is reputed to own more United States bonds than any other man in America, gasped Richard Moyer. I won't admit that I do, but I am the man you are thinking about. Then I simply cannot understand why you want to mix up in this rat business. Simple enough. I am a hundred percent American. For five generations, my people have been born and buried in this city. I own over two hundred million dollars worth of land here. When the dregs of Europe come over to my city and use the rats of Asia to bleed that city white, then I personally protest. I am going to start something. I am not sure what, but when I finish, this city will be practically rat empty and gangster free. A large program, Mr. Willoughby, whispered Perkins. But I am a large man. Now suppose I write you gentlemen a check. Five minutes later, the two partners were alone. Moya looked at the check, then put it in his pocket and his hat on his head. Suppose we get it cashed, he said to Perkins. You can do as you please with your half, but I'm going to take my family and go back to England. That man Willoughby is only half pint size, but his blue eyes look cold to me, and I bet he plays a stiff game of bridge. If he starts fighting those gangsters, I do not want to be caught on the battlefield. How about starting a business over in England? asked Perkins. Not a bad idea. I came over here, and together we made half a million selling English groceries to Americans. Perhaps we can make a million more selling American groceries to Englishmen. Winifred Willoughby not only bought the grocery business of Moyer and Perkins, he bought a laundry, a small hotel, an apartment house, and a theatre. He kept all the old employees, put in a manager, instructed that the weekly tribute should be paid as usual, and then disappeared from New York City. Ten days later, in Paradise Valley, in the broken country below the Poconos of Pennsylvania. He entertained several men, each an authority in his special line of art or science. They kept the appointment, not being at all sure what it was for, but unable to refuse the invitation which was accompanied in each case with a substantial check. They had all heard of Willoughby, but none had ever seen him. No doubt all were rather disappointed in his apparent lack of colour and personality. They quickly changed their mind when he started to talk, for there was a man who, when he had something to say, was able to say it briefly and to the point. You men are all interested in rats, he began, and so am I. You have worked with rats in one way or another for a good many years. Perhaps I ought to introduce you to each other. 
Mr. William Rastell has written the best biological study of rats in the English language. He has done for rats what Beebe did for the pheasant. Now the gentleman next to Mr. Rastell is Mr. Carroll Crawford. I doubt if he ever actually saw or willingly handled a rat in all his life, but I am told he knows more about the folklore and traditions of the rat than any other living person. The third of my guests is Professor Wilson. He is the psychologist who has tried to breed different strains of rats, some of superior intelligence and others of the imbecile type. What I want you gentlemen to tell me is why these rats congregate at times in certain buildings of New York City in such large numbers that they are a serious menace to property and even human life, and then as suddenly disappear as they appeared. Are they actually doing that? asked Professor Wilson, who had suddenly become vitally interested in the conversation. Suppose they are, queried Cavill Crawford, answering the question for Willoughby. That is nothing more than they have done for centuries. You mean migratory movements? asked the biologist, Rastel. Rats have always migrated. I mean nothing of the kind, protested Crawford. I mean their sudden appearance in a town or a building. They're remaining there for a short time, and then their sudden disappearance. The folklore and fairy tales are full of that sort of thing. That is why I asked you to come to this conference, Mr. Crawford, explained Willoughby. There is something peculiar happening in New York at the present time, and it has to do with rats and their actions. In some way, rats of New York seem to be under the control of a set of racketeers who are able to force them to enter any building they select. The rats come and go suddenly. It is all over in a little while, but when they are in the building, they do a lot of damage. Mr. Crawford interrupted him. I doubt if you use the right word when you say the rats were forced to enter the building. Perhaps you mean that the rats were by some means placed in such a psychic condition that they wanted to enter the building. That brings the matter into my field of research, insisted Professor Wilson. I doubt the fact that they were forced, but if they wanted to, why that brings up all kinds of interesting questions. That is what I am after, gentlemen. I simply want to present the problem to you and have you solve it. I personally am satisfied with one thing. These rats are no different than the rats of 5,000 years ago. They are just like the rats of classic Greece and Imperial Rome. Maybe Mr. Crawford will tell us how they acted. The antiquarian fairly beamed as he started to ride his favourite hobby horse. Of course, the story everyone thinks of is the one concerning the Piper of Hamelin. It was in the year 1284. The rats were thick, and the piper agreed to lead them out of town for a certain sum. He played a pipe, no doubt some kind of flute, and the rats followed him. When the people refused to pay, he returned on the 26th of June, the feast of Saints John and Paul, and again played on the pipe. This time, the children, 130 in number, followed him into a cave and were lost. The date is well documented. A number of historians believe that it actually occurred, and on the gate of the town is the statement, Centum terra denos cum magos ab urba puelos duxeret ante anos tu seven tu condita porta fuit. The same story is found, with variations, in all parts of the world. There is, for example, the story of the wicked Hatto, abbot of Fulda. He was visited by a swarm of rats who killed him. I can give you a dozen variations of that story, but in each of them, the rats came and went suddenly, as Mr. Willoughby says they have been doing in New York. I should like to see a few examples of this mass movement of rats. I saw a lemming migration in Norway, but that was different, explained Ristel. It seems to me that if we actually saw one of these nocturnal attacks, we might learn why they wanted to do it. He is deadly right, agreed Professor Wilson. A few actual facts are worth a hundred theories. That is why I have asked you to help me, explained the richest man in New York. I have prepared some experimental stations for your use. I can put you in a grocery warehouse and guarantee that inside of a week, you will see more rats than you ever dreamed of. I have a laundry and a small hotel. We can work out the details right now. All I am asking of you is to find out when the rats come, why they come, and once we know that, we can do something to solve this problem. The game looks interesting, declared the professor of rat psychology. What I am interested in is why the rats do it. I am sure that it is because they want to do it, but are they forced to want to do it? It is a problem that will take a lot of research to solve. But Rastel and I can solve it. With all respects to our friend Mr. Crawford, I think that he had better stay away and just keep on reading about his little pets. A few thousand vicious rats would be hard for him to deal with. I guess you are right, laughed Winfred Willoughby. Crawford and I will stay here and read about it, while you two do the actual scientific work. By the way, Crawford, in that story of the piper, what was given the credit for drawing the rats out of the town? The tune that he played on the pipes. Check and double check. Now I would advise you gentlemen to locate some musical instrument in that warehouse, and if you find one, experiment with it. 
Of course, you will have to be rather clever to find it. In the first place, the people putting it there will have it under cover, and just as soon as the mischief is done, they will remove it. It is nothing like that, laughed Professor Wilson, almost in scorn. These are New York rats. It'll take more than a little music to lead them from their usual haunts, but Rastel and I will start in at once. Give us the address of the buildings and the authority to use them. How shall we know when the rats are going to come? They will appear within seven days after you stop the racket money. Suppose we adjourn the meeting? I want a few words in private with Mr. Crawford. You other gentlemen can get all the rest of the details from my secretary. He will arrange your salary and expense account. Good night. He took Crawford into his bedroom. Do you really believe that story, Crawford? I positively do, and the people believe it. The piper walked down the Bungenstrasse, and to this day, no music is ever played in that street. They even date time in the town from the day the children disappeared. Then, there must be something in it. Suppose we go over to Europe and find out something about that tune, the tune that drew the rats out of Hamelin. Rustell and Wilson followed out their programme. They went to the grocery warehouse and made a rat survey. There were a few rodents there, but not many. Then they issued orders that the weekly payment of $5,000 be stopped. After that, they spent their nights in the warehouse. On the fifth night, the rats came by the thousands. They appeared to be hunting for something, but in the meantime, they ate and soiled whatever came their way. The local cats fought heroically, but were soon killed and eaten. The rats came up from the cellar through the elevator shafts, up the steps, through the cracks in the floor, up and up, till they started to run around the roof. Then, at four in the morning, they started to leave, running down the steps in close formation, seemingly panic-stricken at their own temerity and anxious only to return to their safe, dark haunts. The two scientists, in their wire observation cage, closed their notebook, opened the door of the cage, and started to make a careful search of the building. It revealed nothing but the bones of cats and much spoiled food. For the next two days, they worked carefully through every part of the building, hunting for something to explain the conduct of the rats. They found nothing. All that they were sure of was the fact that the rats had been there and that they had not come back. The following week, they repeated the experiment in the laundry. The course of events was the same. The payment was refused, then the rats came, devoured and destroyed, stayed a night and left. Nothing was found. They decided to go and have a conference with Winifred Willoughby, but he could not be located. The two scientists were left to their own resources. Having no other plausible plan of action, they selected the small hotel for their next experiment. This time, they set a hundred wire traps and caught several hundred living rats. These they subjected to every known experiment, and at the end were forced to acknowledge that all they had learned left them in ignorance as to why the rats came just for one night in such enormous numbers. Two months later, their employer sent for them. It appeared that he had just returned from Europe. He listened to their story, smiled kindly at their perplexity, suggested that they take a vacation and forget about rats for a while, paid all their bills, and discharged them. He even went so far as to say that he was uninterested in rats, that it had just been a passing hobby, and that just at present he was working on other matters. So, he asked them to pass out of his life. But he and Cavill Crawford went into the wilds of Pike County and did some experimenting on his own account. Meantime, things were going from bad to worse in New York City. The rat racketeers were becoming bolder and starting to reach after larger game. There were rumours that the Pennsylvania Railroad was paying to protect its terminal, and that the interurban was being bled white to keep the rats out of the subway. Of course, much of this was rumour, and none of it reached the newspapers, but there is no doubt about the fact that 8 million people were becoming rat-conscious and rat-afraid. It was growing into a worthwhile racket, and those behind it were rapidly acquiring more than riches. They were growing so powerful that they felt able to control the city government. More than one business tried to resist, and more than one business awoke to find that it owned nothing but ruins. Rat protection was worthless when the enemy came by the hundred thousand and even million. The only worthwhile defence against a multitudinous enemy was the payment of the weekly tribute. Small enough each week, but in the course of the year taking the profits from most of the firms compelled to pay. Within a year, the average business in the city was working for the gangsters, and content to, at least, be permitted to stay in business. Then, the racket was transferred to other cities, slowly and on a small scale at first. Then more boldly, Chicago, Philadelphia, and Washington began to feel the pressure. The profits were divided, but always the main share went to New York, for that was where the big boys were, and ruling the big boys was the old man, 
who were so little known and so seldom seen that his very existence was questioned by some of the smaller gangsters. No one knew how he had obtained his power, but no one was brave enough to deny it. The fact remained that he simply ruled, reigned like a Caesar, dictated like a Napoleon, from backstage he pulled the wires to make his puppets dance. It was this man who aroused the interest of Winifred Willoughby. In other times, in former generations, in far past centuries, they might have ruled Rome together, or split it in two ways over their dying bodies. But in 1935, the short sword had been replaced by the ballot box, and civil war by the primary election. Neither man had much that the other craved for, yet both prevented the other from the full enjoyment of life. But it was the blue-blooded patrician who at last gave in and secretly asked for an interview. The conference was held on a fallen log on the shore of Porter's Pond in Pike County, Pennsylvania. Someone said if Mark Hopkins sat on one end of a log and the student on the other end, it was a university. But with Willoughby on one end of the log and the old man on the other, it became nothing more than a conspiracy against the existence and the very life of the nation. It was a strange sight. Those two opposites on the log, the rich man, a little over five feet, barely a hundred pounds, with the body of a boy and the face of an angel. At the other end, a large man, with the torso of an ape, and the face of a titan. A man who had conquered by crushing, ruthlessly and devastatingly, all who had dared to oppose him. The two were great men, but they were equally lonely. Their very positions as leaders of their respective societies prevented any fraternising with their followers. I do not want to waste your time, Mr. Consuelo, began Willoughby. We ought to be able to understand each other. You would do nicely if the federal government would leave you alone but it has the peculiar ability of annoying you and interfering with your plans. Am I right? Absolutely, of course. It does not make any real difference, but it does annoy you. Investigations of your income tax and deporting your men now and then? Well, what of it? Simply this. After some years of effort, I am at last able to say that I control the government. That is a silly brag of a child, sneered the old man. Not at all, and as he said that, Willoughby reached down and picked up a handful of pebbles. See these stones? In the same way, I hold in my hand a majority of the Supreme Court, over two-thirds of the senators and most of the representatives. I can swing the votes of enough of the states to pass any kind of legislation I wish. Now, here is my proposition. You handle the cities, I will turn over the country to you. Together we will run the nation, and all I want is just one thing, just one little favour from you. I bet I can guess what that is, laughed the old man. No doubt, but let me tell you. I want to be the next president. I thought so. I think we ought to be together on this thing. Perhaps I could be elected without your help, even in spite of your opposition. But if I am, I will, naturally try to destroy you. We might end up like the Kilkenny cats. But if we are allies, I have eight years of power, and you have eight years of liberty in which to plunder the richest nation in the world. How about it? The old man drew a deep breath. Is this on the level? It has to be. I have a reputation, and it is respectable. I am placing myself in your hands. What is there to prevent you from giving the press an interview tomorrow? You would deny it, but no one would listen to me. I suppose not. What do you want me to do? I want you to give the order to your leaders. There are a hundred of them, perhaps a few more. No doubt my list is not absolutely accurate. Call them in, from Chicago to St. Louis, New Orleans, Boston, and Philadelphia. Have them all in one room. You introduce me... Let me talk to them. I will open the war chest. Fifty million to start with, and more to come. You promise them anything you want, and I will make the promise good. And you will be there? Right in the room with me? I will be there. I won't do it, growled the old man. I never have, and I never will. I don't do things that way. A whisper to one or two, and the business is done, but not a hundred at one time. Some of these boys have never seen me. Then you want to turn me down? Not exactly, but I am opposed to that meeting. Then we are through talking. I will take you to the first 510 train, or, if you want to, I will have my chauffeur drive you to the city. Let's talk it over. No. How about having six of the big boys there? No. All on my list or none. Your list? Certainly. I am not sure that it is absolutely correct, but it satisfies me. Let me see it. No reason why you should not. The old man took the paper that was handed to him, it was no casual glance he gave the names. At last, he handed it back to the little man with the casual comment. I suppose that is not all you know about my organisation. 
I suppose not, but why not be sensible about this, Mr. Consuelo? If we fight, we will simply kill each other, but if we become allies, who can stop us? But I must be sure of you, and the only way I can be sure is to have you talk to your men, and then let me talk to them. We can have the meeting at night in my offices, you know where, top floor of the Empire Trust. No one need be any the wiser. Half an hour, and all the men can go back with the money in their pockets and the orders in their brains. Okay, when shall we meet? A month from today, at 10pm. Good. I'll give the orders, but I want the money, the 50 million. It is not much, but part of it will help keep the big boys in line. Some of them won't like the idea very much. A little cash will influence them. Now, how about taking you back to the city? Winifred Willoughby made preparations for entertaining his 100 guests. His largest office was transformed into an assembly room. Its inch-thick carpets, overstuffed chairs, and mahogany trimmings gave it an air of luxuriant comfort. There were special chairs for the big boys, and two very special chairs for the old man and the host of the evening. A large picture frame, hanging on one's wall and carefully covered, gave a hint as to part of the evening's ceremony. The Empire Trust belonged to Willoughby. He had built it so that he could have a private office on the top floor, the 63rd from the ground. The elevator reached this floor, but there were no steps. Many buildings surpassed it in height, but none in the view that it gave of the city. The guests who arrived first commented on the view and expanded their chests when they realised that they carried the city in their vast pockets. At last, every chair was occupied. It was a peculiar gathering. It included judges, politicians, pseudo-businessmen, several lawyers, and even the mayor of one of the largest cities in the Mississippi Valley. Facing them sat the old man and Willoughby. Of the hundred men in the audience, not one was at his ease. Most had come because they were afraid to stay away. Many hoped that they would not be recognised. The majority doubted the wisdom of such a meeting, and felt that the old man was slipping mentally. It was the first time that many of them had even seen him. He was almost as much of an unknown to them as the little man sitting next to him. A peculiar silence hung over the assembly. More than one man fondled the handle of his automatic. No one seemed to be sure of what was going to happen next. It was a fortunate thing that the meeting was held at night, with the audience composed of such men. A daylight gathering would have been impossible. The old man and Willoughby held a short whispered conference. Then, the leader of American racketeers stood up. What had been silence before now became the hush of death. The old man was going to talk, and everyone wanted to hear what he had to say. It did not take him long to start. You big boys have been running the cities before, he growled, but from tonight on, we are going to run the country. Congress and the Supreme Court are going to dance to our music and like it. Our new friend here has promised to deliver the goods, and he does not want much in return. I have told him that we will trade, and that what I say goes. Now, you boys listen to Willoughby, and remember that I am back of him. Then he sat down. As far as the records are concerned, that was the longest speech the old man made in his life. The boys hardly knew what to do. They felt they should applaud, but not being certain remained quiet. Then Willoughby stood up. I do not want very much, gentlemen, he remarked. I only want to be the next president of the United States, and I can be, with your help. Let me show you a picture. He walked over to the covered picture, pulled a cord, and unveiled it, and there, life-size, were the old man and Willoughby shaking hands. Anyone could tell who they were and what they were doing. That brought the house down. Everyone felt that it was time for a little noise. Some of them, who knew the big boy well enough, went up and congratulated him on the new political alliance. In the confusion, Winifred Willoughby slipped out of the room and no one noticed his absence. But someone did notice the sideboard and started to sample the bottles. Soon, everyone was drinking a little, but the old man did not drink. He just sat there, moodily chewing his cigar and wondering how much of the 50 million he could keep for his share. Nobody saw the first rat. It dropped from behind the picture and ran under a chair. The next rat did the same. Perhaps fifty rats were in the room before their presence was noticed. By that time they were coming faster, by the dozen, by the hundred. That was different. One rat in a large room meant nothing. A hundred, five hundred in the same room could mean almost anything. And now they were literally pouring out from the back of the picture. A cursing man pulled it to the floor, and there was a large hole in the wall, two feet in diameter, and out of that hole the rats were pouring. Big, brown, hungry rats, dropping to the floor and starting to hunt for food. 
The puzzled men jumped up on top of the chairs. The rats stood on their hind legs and looked at the large chunks of food with black beady binoculars. The old man just sat there, chewing his cigar and cursing. He knew what it all meant seconds before anyone else. A number of the most fearful men made a dash for the elevator. They were driven back by a torrent of rats climbing up the elevator shaft. Then fear came, and panic. With gun and heel, and broken chairs for clubs, they started in to kill rats, and of every one they killed, a hundred fastened to them with chiseled teeth. To make it worse, the lights went out, and they were there in the dark, with mutilation as a beginning, and death as an ending, and still the rats poured into the room, up the elevator shaft, and out of the hole in the wall. The old man walked across the room, kicking the struggling bodies of his followers out of his pathway. Rats ran up his legs and tried to bite his hands. His face, he swept them off as a tiger would wipe ants off his fur. At last he came to the window. There was the city of New York in front of him, the city of a million twinkling lights, the tomb of a billion dead hopes, the morgue of a nation, covered by laughing, painted faces. He raised the sash and sat on the sill. Damn will I be, he said. What a fool I was but I am going to die clean. No rat is going to send me to hell. And then he dropped. In the room, the struggle kept on, for an hour, and then two. At last, the screaming ceased, and the only sound was the gnawing of the rats, the crunching of their teeth, and their satisfied little squeaks of pleasure. The next morning, Winifred Willoughby called on the chief of the Secret Service of New York. With him were several men from Washington. I want to tell you something, he said. A large group of men borrowed my office to have a meeting last night. They wanted privacy and secrecy, and they had heard of my place in the Empire Trust building, so I loaned them the entire floor for the night. But my janitors tell me that something terrible happened. An army of rats invaded the place, as they have been doing with other places in the city, and literally ate every man there, that is, all except one, a fellow by the name of Consuelo, and he preferred to jump out of a window and die clean on the pavement. Consuelo, asked the chief. Not the old man. Not that Consuelo. I think that is the one. Here is a list of the men who were there. I thought you might like to look it over before you gave it to the papers. The chief took the list and read it, puzzled. Do you mean these men were there last night? I understand so. And now they are dead? I think so. Of course, that is for the coroner to say. Do you know who these men were? I suppose they were business associates of Consuelo. At least, that is what he told me. They were the hundred biggest gangsters in America. They were the brains of everything vicious in American society. There was not a man there whom we have not been after for years, but we couldn't pin anything on them. Their death in one night gives the decent people in our country a new lease on life. We can go ahead now and get the little fellows. But tell me, Mr. Willoughby, how did it happen? I told you. They had a meeting, and the rats came. You know there was a rat racket, which no one thoroughly understood. Anyway, the rats came, and killed them. No one can tell exactly what did happen, because everyone who was there was killed. That is all. I am sorry that it happened in my office, but I thought I was doing the man a favour to loan him the place for the meeting. That night, Crawford and Willoughby were talking things over. In rushed Rastell and Wilson, brushing the indignant butler aside. We have heard a thousand rumours, began Rastell, and read as many foolish statements in the papers about the rat tragedy, and we just couldn't wait a minute longer. You just have to tell us what happened. We are not going to leave you till you do. You tell them, Crawford, whispered Willoughby. Whenever I talk about it, my voice becomes squeaky. It happened this way, explained Crawford. After you started to work, Mr. Willoughby decided to go over and study the story of the piper right in the town of Hamelin. We went there, and there was no doubt that the town people really believed that it really happened. They told us all about it, and the more we listened and paid them, the more they told. They gave us the very tune the piper played to make the rats follow him. It was a simple little thing, and we made some phonograph records of it. It seems that when the rats hear that tune, they want to get as close as they can to the source of the music. Then one old man, he gave us some additional bars, which he claimed drove the rats frantic for blood, and we made a record of that also. Afterwards, we came back to America, and went up into Pike County. Not so many rats there, but enough to experiment with. We tried the short tune, and the long tune, and they worked on the American rats, just like they did on the Hamelin ones. We put two and two together, and decided that the rat racketeers in New York were using this method of attracting rats. Just put a repeating phonograph in a building, and started playing, and then the rats would come, and eat everything to pieces. Of course, 
We did not know the psychology of it, but I suppose it has something to do with the effect of musical vibrations on a rat's nervous system. Then Mr. Willoughby thought that it would be a good idea to make a great rat trap and attract all the rats in the city to it. He had a good deal of work done in the Empire Trust, and rigged up a phonograph with a lot of loudspeakers in different parts of the basement. He ran a lot of ropes down a ventilating shaft for the rats to climb on. I think it was his original idea to have them come up to his office by the millions, and then use some kind of gas on them. At least, he wanted to get rid of the rats. Someone must have turned on the phonograph with the entire record. Mr. Willoughby left the room, went down the elevator, and being somewhat absent-minded, told the elevator boy that he could go for the night. Of course, he was surprised to hear all about it the next morning. All he wanted to do was get rid of the rats. Exactly, purred Mr. Winifred Willoughby, and he lit another cigarette. End of the Rat Racket by David H. Keller, M.D. Recording by Robert Griffin The Machine from Outside by Don Howard This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dan Grzynski. The Machine from Outside by Don Howard Men call me mad. Perhaps I am now, but then, before that succession of terrible events, I was at least as sane as the average person. Now the sight of a flame, a red color, or the slightest unusual sound paralyzes my reason with fear and conjures up old memories that haunt me night and day. Then I was normal, aside from the fact that my life was guided, and, I pride myself, guided well by premonition, a mysterious sixth sense that had never failed to warn me correctly. When I did not heed it, disaster invariably followed, but never more swiftly and horribly than that winter night. It was dark, moonless. The stars danced with an unnatural brilliance at the zenith, winking like signal fires, portending some dreadful event. I was walking across the silent snowfields that stretched endlessly in every direction. But were they silent? A low sound reached my ears, a rushing noise like waves beating on a distant shore. A faint luminous glow spread over the sky, and a gigantic shadow of my body was thrown athwart the landscape, a yawning black pit threatening to engulf me. A giant meteor had swept from the sky, as large as the full moon, but much brighter. It neared the earth, enveloped in a cloud of white vapor and a huge train of sparks trailing in its wake. The light on the snow increased to a blinding glare as the meteor rushed at me with the speed of a rifle bullet. In the hope of escaping annihilation, I turned and ran, my way as brilliantly lighted as by a noonday sun. The roar culminated in a terrific explosion as the meteor crashed to earth just beyond the next rise. Darkness threw a smothering shroud over the scene. The force of the impact had thrown me to the ground. I could scarcely breathe in the pall of sulfurous vapor that enveloped me. Gasping, I rose to my feet and looked around. The stars had been blotted out, and the only light visible was a fire that glowed darkly in the supernatural fog. The sparks had started a blaze in a nearby grove of trees. A dark form loomed up before me as suddenly as if it had been materialized from the cloud itself, and I heard a familiar voice speaking. Hello, is that you, Jackson? And then, seeing that his recognition was correct, wasn't it wonderful? Wonderful, I exclaimed. Do you mean that for humor, Dr. Sarantoff? Most assuredly not. Why, Jackson, this is the most extraordinary scientific event I have ever seen. I might have known it. Dr. Sarantoff was one of those brilliant scientists whose imagination had not been quenched by cold-blooded reason. His work, therefore, was little known in scientific circles, where fact and theory must be so skillfully intermingled as not to be easily detected. Sarantoff was unusual. Most men would have called him eccentric, and even at this moment he presented a strange figure. Hatless and coatless, he utterly disregarded the bitter night chill. 
His collar was slightly awry under his iron-gray beard, and his cheeks were flushed from excitement. His small blue eyes were flaming under their bushy brows. "'It must be a gigantic meteorite!' he exclaimed. "'And on my property, too! What luck!' He started off on a wild scramble toward the fire, I following somewhat dubiously, though he assured me that the danger was past. The warmth of the fire did little to relieve my depressed spirits. I felt that nothing good could possibly come from this incident. It was too weird, too ghastly, too supernatural. A moment later we stood at the edge of a pit some ten feet in diameter. The snow had vanished from its sides, and a faint haze of steam rose from its depths. The inner walls were hot to the touch. "'This is where the meteor lies,' said Sarntoff. "'Well,' I answered cynically, "'it can lie there for all I care. A chunk of metal from another star is no different from what we can mine here.' "'I'm not so sure.' he replied. I've been experimenting for years with meteoric iron, and I've found traces of a new metal, not unlike manganese, but upon which acids and heat have little effect. This huge meteor will give me the opportunity I've longed for. I was not disposed to a scientific discussion. Such things usually bore me, and tonight I was unnerved and anxious to return home. Sarntoff, nevertheless, continued to elaborate. If I can prove there is such a metal and discover its properties, we may be able to find it here on the earth. Think of its practical applications. Why, man, it would be one of the most valuable finds of the age. He stopped as I yawned audibly. What cared I about this new metal? Probably it was some fiction of Sarntov's too vivid imagination. But then I did not know. I slept fitfully through the night. The next morning found me so feverish and exhausted that my physicians recommended a complete rest at the seashore. They said I was on the verge of a nervous breakdown. Although I did not see Sarntoff again for more than four months, I followed as well as possible the history of the meteor as it was given in the newspapers. When Sarntoff recovered it from the pit, it was found to weigh more than five tons. A dozen museums and a thousand private collectors bid fabulous sums to induce him to sell it. For a month it was on exhibition at his home until Sarntoff made the announcement that set the scientific world awry. The next day he would start dissolving the meteor to test for the unknown metal. The collectors arose in a body. Destroy irreparably this magnificent scientific relic? They pleaded with Sarntoff begged, chided, scolded, threatened, and finally obtained an injunction through the courts forbidding him to continue his experiments. A month and a half of wrangling passed before Sarntoff won a complete victory. The jury had decided that the meteor was his own property and that he could use it as he wished. Several weeks later I received a telegram. Come to me at once. Most extraordinary development concerning meteor. Sarntoff. I obeyed with misgivings. My nerves had not yet recovered from the shock of close contact with that meteor. In my dreams I could hear it hissing by, feel its heat on my face, and would wake up trembling with fear. The slightest humming noise of any sort was enough to make me sick with dread. This specter haunted me night and day, but nevertheless I returned. Sartoff greeted me excitedly and pulled me toward his laboratory without giving me a chance even to remove my coat. His appearance was enough to startle anyone. I doubt if he had seen sleep inside of a week. His hair had become a shade whiter, but his blue eyes were dancing wildly in his florid face like bubbles of water on a red-hot stove. Could pseudoscience have driven the man mad? "'What is the meaning of all this, Sartoff?' I asked." glancing askance at the disordered laboratory which confronted me. "'Never mind this mess,' he said. "'Look into that vat. There is the most wonderful machine.' "'Everything you see is the most wonderful,' I interrupted, gazing into the huge built-in trough. It was full of an evil-smelling acid and small bubbles of gas that rose from the depths. For a moment I could see nothing. Sartoff switched on a light. Vaguely I glimpsed the outlines of some framework. Yes, a machine, 
but of such an ethereal nature that it seemed scarcely more substantial than the bubbles which floated from it. "'Some new invention of yours?' I asked. "'No, Jackson,' he said in a queer voice that thrilled me to my fingertips. "'It was crystallized in that meteor!' Astonished, I grasped him by the shoulder, and, I warned, shook him more violently than the occasion called for. "'You can mean that!' It was an exclamation rather than a question. Yes, I put the meteor in that vat of acid so that all the soluble matter would disappear. This beautiful engine is the residue. My eyes were now more accustomed to the darkness. I could see the machine plainer. In shape, it approximated a cube two feet in each dimension. The thread-like stays were as lustrous as burnished silver and wound around each other, in and out, like a queer sort of spider web waiting to catch its prey. My heart grew cold within me. My sense of danger had warned. An idea came to me. Perhaps this is no machine, but only the crystalline structure of your new metal that takes on this strange shape. Sarantoff's answer was brief. Look closer. I did so and found that within the threads was a system of small wheels and gears, so complicated that the whole affair was a maze of intricate interlacings. What is its purpose? It is my aim to find that out, he replied quietly. I could sympathize with Sarntoff. His was the mind that rose beyond all difficulties. No doubt in his imagination, this engine was some affair that would solve the mystery of the universe complete the knowledge of the human race, or provide a source of power far beyond human concept. To me it was only an instrument of death, dark and sinister. I confided my fears to Sarntoff. It's a devil engine, a machine from outside. We had better leave it alone. Nonsense, Jackson. If it were built by the devil himself, it would only add to its scientific interest. Though still unconvinced, I turned the conversation into other channels while Sarantov and I sat up late into the night discussing the different angles this affair had taken. I advised informing the newspapers. No, he exploded. I'll not have another gang, either of those inquisitive journalists or those meddling scientists up here. I dropped the point. Sarantov's claim to secrecy was justified. Think of what this all means, Jackson! A machine from another world. It proves that intelligent, perhaps super-intelligent life exists somewhere else in this universe. On Mars? I have an idea that it came from something far beyond. The chemical composition was different from any other meteor I have ever examined, as was its crystalline structure. It was more like the pig iron from our blast furnaces than a meteor. Perhaps it is a fake, then. A hoax. I know what it is. A publicity stunt for the meteor. That successful play of the year. Sarntoff, disgusted at my flippancy, waned into a silence that was not broken for many minutes. When he did speak, the cloud on his florid face had vanished. Excitedly, he sat up. I have a probable explanation for it now. The metal of this machine will withstand high temperatures. After it was finished, the iron was flowed in on top of it. Perhaps the whole affair is a torpedo, shot at us by some distant planet, the machine being the explosive part. And thus for a week we theorized, while Sarntoff and I labored night and day at the devil engine, as I had come to call it. The acids had to be carefully washed from it, until finally it stood clean and dry on the floor of the vat. We dared not move it though it seemed to possess great stability. There it lay, as bright and shining as a dewy cobweb. It scintillated like a diamond, and its jeweled radiance so fascinated me that I would gaze into its depths for hours lost in thought. Only a crystal gazer could have appreciated the hypnotic force that held me. "'What is it for?' I asked Sarntoff a hundred times a day, and I received as many answers as questions." The scientist's imagination was dancing about as much as his flashing blue eyes. He was engrossed in diagramming the gearing. "'Here is something queer,' Sarntoff interjected. "'Look at the color of the light as it shines through the machine in different directions.' 
I had noticed the weird pattern before, and the beautiful display of colors. Jackson, I believe that we are nearing the solution of this problem. In some way, this engine decomposes light. He paused to make some calculations. Yes, the result is exactly the same as if the light were made to move in a curved path through some hyperspace. I had no idea what he meant, nor did I care. After the first hundred explanations, each new one decreased in interest. I gave myself again to gazing into the machine, and so completely did I lose all sense of time that it might have been five minutes or five hours until Sarantov spoke again. He had been pecking the internal workings of the machine. "'Jackson! I have found it! I have found it!' he shouted, like a modern Archimedes. The devil engine gave a slight flutter. "'Hold it down!' The vibrations of the myriad wheels thrilled me. I was afraid. I desired to let go, but some strange fascination held me fixed, like a boy that holds a lighted firecracker in his hand until it is too late. Santa shouted something at me, but his words were lost in the roar that came from the machine's interior. Heavens! Was the world being turned inside out? Was it an earthquake which shook the walls of the building so strongly that the roof seemed about to fly into space? My body was growing numb with the continued vibration. My heart was frozen with the chill of death. Before I entirely lost consciousness, I had the sensation of floating away on a sea of clouds, at first slowly, and then more rapidly until my senses gave way under the strain. "'Jackson! Jackson!' I heard a voice calling out of the darkness which was so intense as almost to smother me. All was silent now. So this was death. But yet I felt as substantial as the solid rock that now supported me. If only I could see. As if an answer to my desire, a flame appeared at my side. It was Sarntov. My God, what has happened? I cried. I don't know. Where are we? That also I don't know. Look at the sky. The stars, for the most part, were very faint. The Milky Way was plainly visible, but where were the constellations? The old familiar figures. Not one could be recognized. Where could we be? Somewhat unsteadily, I gained my feet. Can't we find some way to make a light? Sarantov struck another match, which shed a dim radiance about us. As far as we could tell, no trees existed on the side of the rocky hill that sheltered us. In lieu of wood, we set fire to a handful of dry grass, which burned with a red flame, casting a lurid glare on the surrounding scene. The rim of darkness showed no break in the monotony. We fell into an odd silence, for we were aware that something unusual had occurred, though what we could not comprehend. Suddenly I thought of the cursed machine that was responsible for our plight. Reversing it might carry us back. I sought for it with the aid of a match. When I found it, a cry of dismay escaped from my lips. The devil engine lay broken upon the ground, its silvery stays torn out as though to release the demon that seemed to govern it. Without new metal, repair was out of the question. The days that clouded my brain began to vanish, and my fears, dulled for an instant by a sense of the unusual, stabbed again at my heart. Nothing but death could be the outcome, and such a death. Slow starvation in this utter darkness. My God, Sarntoff, what can we do? Wait, was his philosophical reply. I was on the verge of insanity, but a sudden purple radiance that glowed on the horizon filled me with a new hope. Dawn! Silently, we watched the sun rise. The purple aureole gave place to a vivid rose, which rapidly covered the entire sky. If the world were to have caught on fire in one moment, the color could have been no more ruddy. No blue in this atmosphere. The sun was a brilliant white, too dazzling for conception. I noticed that it did not appear exactly round and Presently, the reason for this became apparent. It was extended by the attraction of a second sun, which suddenly launched itself into the sky. Impossible as it may seem, only one explanation was admissible. We were cast away without hope of escape on a planet revolving 
about a double star. Sarntoff was so wildly excited that he stuttered when he addressed me. At first, I thought the devil engine might have carried us through time, and that we might still be on Earth some centuries removed, but now I see that we have been carried through space as well. You see, Jackson, that we're a long way from where we started. Through time? Through space? What are you talking about? I demanded, struggling to understand. Well, very evidently, this machine has carried us over trillions of miles. In that short space of time? Impossible. Don't be foolish, Jackson. We have done it. But don't try to imagine us flying up that distance. We surely didn't do that. How did we get here, then? If I'm right, it's rather complicated to put into simple language. It means only that the world has four instead of three dimensions. That sounds like Einstein. Yes, he and other eminent investigators have shown us that our conceptions of space and distance are not always what they seem to be. On Earth, we know of but three directions, forward, up, and to the side. We gauge our distance from a body by the space we must cover in going there in the three recognized dimensions, but it may be infinitely nearer in a fourth dimension if one exists. I confess that I don't understand. Let me reason by analogy, he replied. If a man were constrained to live in a sewer pipe, he would know only of the forward and back direction, and if, perchance, the pipe were curved into a second dimension, he might, by crawling for miles, reach a point adjacent to some place he had previously been. If at that moment some force could have opened a trapdoor, he could have made as unbelievable a jump as we ourselves have experienced. The devil engine let us in the back way, so to speak, I questioned. Exactly, answered Sarntoff, somewhat impatiently. Here we are, thrown by fate into a new land, and you stand there asking foolish questions. I want to see what sort of a place this is. Our ardor quickly withered at the sight which confronted us. The lurid glare of the sky was reflected in the features of the planet's surface. Red soil, red rock, red everything. But after all, why should not red be the dominating color somewhere? It is only a question of the size of the dust particles in the atmosphere, explained Sarnatov. On the earth, they scatter the blue light, here the red. Simple enough, but why had not nature wielded a more restful brush when painting the landscape, a delicate green or blue here and there to relieve the monotony of the scarlet splashes? Even the grass, the single form of vegetation that covered the bare earth, was crimson. Sarntoff and I chewed it, finding therein small relief for our hunger as it was very bitter. We quenched our subsequent thirst at a small spring whose water, God help me, was the color of blood. So stained, I realized, by the fine dust from the red rocks. No breeze, no air stirred in this land of death. Could there possibly be inhabitants, and if so, would they be hostile? We longed for, yet dreaded, discovery. The silence of a graveyard at midnight persisted, even when he had roused enough courage to send a loud halloo echoing from the massive cliffs in the distance. We set out for the highest of these, hoping that from its summit the view of the surrounding country would solve a problem. Perhaps the high-walled canyons might shelter the elusive inhabitants of this strange sphere. For days we wandered over the face of the planet, chewing bitter weeds and drinking vile water. The rocky crags suddenly refused to give up their secret, though they seemed to hover menacingly above us, peering over our heads as if they alone could see that for which we were seeking. The sky remained forever cloudless, though a slight purple haze at dawn was customary, but quickly dispelled by the powerful rays of the two suns. Time had been drawing them apart, so that now the dreadful nights were much shorter, a condition that was not distasteful to us, for their absolute darkness was appalling. It hung over us like a visible curse, sucking the breath from our bodies 
as we tried to sleep. I would have given years for my life to have had some natural noise break that eternal silence. A shrieking wind, falling water, anything. As we progressed, we noted every landmark, carefully filing them in our memories against the hour of our return. Each day had been a repetition, and this was no exception. Slowly and laboriously, Sarntoff and I scaled the highest cliff, and, of life, found, as usual, nothing. In one direction, a plain of fire stretched endlessly into the blazing sky, with nothing more than a thin purple line of separation. In the other lay the sea, an ocean of blood, whose calm surface, reflecting the heavens, was unruffled by wind or tide, as though it had suddenly congealed in fear and horror. I shut my eyes to obliterate the view, feeling as if I had been thrust into the heart of a blazing furnace, but when I opened them, the naked world appeared the same. No sound, no motion. The descent was even more difficult than the ascent had been, and night had thrown its black shroud over us long before we reached the level. We elected to remain in a small cave that offered, if not shelter, at least a foothold that would keep us from dashing to the ground thousands of feet below. Making ourselves as comfortable as possible, we tried to gain some much-needed rest. Sarntoff, the imperturbable, dropped easily to sleep. To me, sleep was impossible. Silence, solitude, an indescribable terror took sudden possession of me. Above Sarntoff's muffled breathing, a slight noise, a warning hiss, seemed to float like a vapor from the canyon below. I listened tensely. It was repeated, increasing in volume, slowly rising to a shrill scream, wailing loudly like a human being in great agony. The cry echoed from cliff to cliff and continued to re-echo in my consciousness sometime after it had died away. Again it came moaning like the wind in the pines, increasing to a gale until the rocks were shaken by its force. As though at a signal, a thousand wisps of luminous mist dashed from as many crevices in the canyon walls. One rushed from our own shelter, nearly precipitating me into the depths from fear from its suddenness. I could not speak, nor, I suppose, could Sarntoff. My tongue was swollen with horror. A colony of ghosts in a land of blood and fire. A master's touch to an inferno. For hours, with wildest confusion, they danced in the canyon. An occasional laugh, like that of a maniac, floated upward. The display of colors was wonderful. All shades of the rainbow, no two exactly alike. At times the phantoms were round, huge iridescent soap bubbles, and again, shapeless, like phosphorescent mist rising from a dead swamp. Ages passed, time in which my consciousness recognized nothing but the myriad clouds of light as they sported in the valley. The weird cry was again repeated. The lights as suddenly vanished, and I felt a chill wind strike me as the thing, whatever it was, returned to shelter. A moment later, dawn splashed the scene with blood. Sarntoff and I gazed at each other questioningly. Neither spoke of the terror that had gripped our hearts. It was too vague, yet too real to be aught but a part of this dream planet. Seemingly hours passed before we essayed to move. Sarntoff was the first to speak. Look, look at the roof of our cave, Jackson. Weakly, yet fearfully, I complied. Hanging from it in long shreds was a huge supply of that spun-glass metal from which the devil engine was constructed. With this, perhaps, we can repair it? I did not dare mention what, for fear that the phantom might hear us and try to thwart our plans for leaving. Perhaps, replied Sarntoff, but not before I solve this unspeakable mystery. The farther I get from it, the better, I replied, and the sooner. I have no desire to spend another night in such a horrible place. Sarntoff yielded to my wishes, but after we had gathered a supply of the metal and were moving down the slope, I noticed a queer light in his eyes. Has it occurred to you, Jackson, that we might have been sent for? 
Sent for, I echoed. Yes. Is it not possible that the machine was given us so that we might visit this unexplored land? If so, it seems a shame to leave it. Don't let your scientific ardor carry you away, Sarntoff. We'll be lucky if we ever leave. It's going to be no easy task to repair that engine. I'm not the least bit hopeful that I'm equal to it, confessed the scientist. But I am quite sure that it would be no disappointment to me if I were obliged to spend my life here. The study of this wonderful geology alone would be enough to attract me. It is only for your sake that I am even considering returning. But the hardships, man, and these queer creatures, what assurance have you of their harmlessness? It's a ghastly place, a fit abode for lost souls, and we'll be well rid of it. The days passed. As our eyes were more accustomed to the darkness, we traveled much during the night and indeed gained comfort by doing so. For then, only under the faint cold light of the distant stars, was the distasteful ruddy glare invisible. How I enjoyed looking upward! The faint glitter of the Milky Way warmed my heart with its companionable ring, the only link to our former life, that past which seemed so like a dream. And which of those thousand orbs that sparkled in the black velvet depths of heaven was our sun, with its eight attendant planets? I marvel that I should feel such a patriotic thrill when I thought of our Earth. Here, I thought philosophically, is one solution for universal peace. Let those who are so unsatisfied with their own world glimpse it from without, and if they will then only say, Our Earth with half the enthusiasm they now say, our country. They will bring in the millennium. Sarantoff interrupted my wandering thoughts. Here we are, Jackson. And following his finger through the darkness, I recognized the spot as our landing place. The devil engine is gone! I rushed to his side. The ghosts have stolen it! At least this proves that they are substantial. Ghosts could not move material objects. I stood aghast, helpless. We are too accustomed to think of life as enclosed in a solid form, though even on our earth there are many gelatinous or semi-liquid creatures, from the jellyfish to the amoeba. I do not consider it a big stretch of the imagination to think that beings can be gaseous in form and yet have intelligence. I was about to argue the point when I saw a dark shadow against a neighboring rock. It proved to be the devil engine. And restored to perfect order, cried Sarntoff. By the ghosts. By these people, yes. It goes to prove my point, Jackson, that they have a wonderful civilization. If I only knew how to communicate with them, I would remain. There must be some way. No, no, I interposed hurriedly, fearful that he might change his mind. Since that memorable event of the canyon, we had seen nothing of the weird creatures that inhabited this strange world, but the moment I touched the devil engine, a faint light appeared. Turning quickly, I found hundreds of the creatures slowly encircling us, gradually filling in the ever-narrowing rim of darkness. Hurry, Sarntoff, I shouted. They'll stop us. Sarntoff did not reply as he touched the lever that would reverse the engine, sending it back along the path through which it had come. I grasped the engine with a new confidence in spite of the dancing bubbles, feeling its vibrations tingling in my brain. A strange glow suddenly seemed to come from the machine's interior. Whether it was reflected light or not, I could not say. But in my horror, I fancied that one of the creatures was concealed therein. I cried my conclusion to Sarntoff. Nonsense! Nevertheless, the idea of a machine with a soul, a true devil engine, sported through my consciousness, filling me with a terror as deep as infinity. The machine quivered as though anxious to be off. That weird cry that drove the spirits to oblivion resounded as Dawn's bloody dagger cut through the darkness. Sarantoff suddenly stood erect, the light of a new resolution burning in his eyes. Goodbye, Jackson. Some day I may return. Not come with me? But it was too late. 
The words trail into the vacant ether. My last vision of him will remain painted forever upon my memory and in one color, a stalwart figure silhouetted against a blood-red sky. For an eternity I floated away as in a dream. Crash! I had struck something hard, and a slight explosion followed. I was lying on the floor in Sarntov's laboratory, with a red flame licking at my feet. I fainted. The next day at the hospital the intern acquainted me with the details. A fire at Sarntov's, he explained. You were rescued from the midst of the flames. And Sarntov, I questioned. It's queer. His body has not yet been found. It never was. End of The Machine from Outside by Don Howard Time Fuse by Randall Garrett This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Dale Grothman the ultra drive had just one slight drawback it set up a shock wave that made suns explode which made the problems of getting back home a delicate one indeed time fuse by randall garrett commander benedict kept his eyes on the rear plate as he activated the intercom all right cut the power we ought to be safe enough here as he released the intercom, Dr. Lesher of the astronomical staff stepped up to his side. Perfectly safe, he nodded, although even at this distance a star-going nova ought to be quite a display. Benedict didn't shift his gaze from the plate. Do you have your instrument set up? Not quite, but we have plenty of time. The light won't reach us for several hours yet. Remember, we were out racing it at ten lights. The commander finally turned slowly, letting his breath out in a soft sigh. Dr. Lesher, I would say that this is just about the foulest coincidence that could happen to the first interstellar vessel ever to leave the solar system. Lesher shrugged. In one way of thinking, yes. It is certainly true that we will never know now whether Alpha Centauri A ever had any planets. But, in another way, it is extremely fortunate that we should be so near a stellar explosion because of the wealth of scientific information we can obtain. As you said, it is a coincidence, and probably one that happens only once in a billion years. The chances of any particular star going nova are small that we should be so close when it happens is of a vanishingly small order of probability commander benedict took off his cap and looked at the damp stain in the sweatband nevertheless doctor it is damned unnerving to come out of ultra drive a couple of hundred million miles from the first star ever visited by man and have to turn tail and run because the damn thing practically blows up in your face Lesher could see that Benedict was upset. He rarely used the same profanity twice in one sentence. They had been downright lucky at that. If Lesher hadn't seen the star beginning to swell and brighten, if he hadn't known what that meant, or if Commander Benedict hadn't been quick enough in shifting the ship back into ultra-drive, Lesher had a vision of an incandescent cloud of gaseous metal that had once been a spaceship. The intercom buzzed. The commander answered. Yes? Sir, would you tell Dr. Lesher that we have everything set up now? Lesher nodded and turned to leave. I guess we have nothing to do now but wait. When the light from the Nova did come, Commander Benedict was back at the plate again, the forward one this time, since the ship had been turned around in order to align the astronomy lab in the nose with the star. Alpha Centauri A began to brighten and spread. 
it made Benedict think of a light bulb connected through a rheostat, with someone turning that rheostat, turning it until the circuit was well overloaded. The light began to hurt Benedict's eyes even at that distance, and he had to cut down the receptivity in order to watch. After a while, he turned away from the plate, not because the show was over, but simply because it had slowed to a point beyond which no change seemed to take place to the human eye. Five weeks later, much to Lesher's chagrin, Commander Benedict announced that they had to leave the vicinity. The ship had only been provisioned to go to Alpha Centauri, scout the system without landing on any of the planets, and return. At ten lights, top speed for the ultra-drive, it would take better than three months to get back. I know you'd like to watch it through the complete cycle, Benedict said, but we can't go back home as a bunch of starving skeletons. Lesher resigned himself to leaving much of his work unfinished, and, although he knew it was a case of sour grapes, consoled himself with the thought that he could at least get most of the remaining information from the 500-inch telescope on Luna four years from then. As the ship slipped into the not-quite space through which the ultra-drive propelled it, Lesher began to consolidate the material he had already gathered. Commander Benedict wrote in the log, Fifty-four days out from Seoul, Alpha Centauri has long since faded back into its pre-blow-up state, since we have far outdistanced the light from its explosion. It now looks as it did two years ago. It... Pardon me, Commander, Lesher interrupted, but I have something interesting to show you. Benedict took his fingers off the keys and turned around in his chair. What is it, Doctor? Lesher frowned at the papers in his hand. I've been doing some work on the probability of that explosion happening, just as it did, and I've come up with some rather frightening figures. As I said before, the probability was small. A little calculation has given us some information which makes it even smaller. For instance, with a possible error of plus or minus two seconds, Alpha Centauri A began to explode the instant we came out of ultradrive. Now, the probability of that occurring comes out so small that it should happen only once in 10 to the 467 seconds. It was Commander Benedict's turn to frown. So? Commander, the entire universe is only about 10 to the 17th seconds old. But to give you an idea, let's say that the chances of its happening are once in millions of trillions of years. Benedict blinked. The number, he realized, was totally beyond his comprehension, or anyone else's. Well? So what? Now it has happened that one time. That simply means that it will almost certainly never happen again. True, but Commander, when you buck odds like that, and win, the thing to do is look for some factor that was cheating in your favor. If you took a pair of dice and started throwing sevens, one right after another, for a couple of thousand years, you'd begin to suspect that they were loaded. Benedict said nothing. He just waited expectantly. There is only one thing that could have done it. Our ship, Lesher said quietly without emphasis. What we know about hyperspace or superspace or whatever it is we move through in ultra-drive is almost nothing. Coming out of it so near a star might set up some sort of shock wave in normal space which could completely disrupt the star's internal balance, resulting in the liberation of unimaginably vast amounts of energy, causing that star to go nova. We can only assume that we ourselves were the fuse that set off that nova. Benedict stood up slowly. When he spoke, his voice was a choking whisper. You mean the sun, soul, might, Lesher nodded. I didn't say that it definitely would. 
but the probability is that we were the cause of the destruction of Alpha Centauri A, and therefore might cause the destruction of Sol in the same way. Benedict's voice was steady again. That means that we can't go back again, doesn't it? Even if we're not positive, we can't take the chance. Not necessarily. We can get fairly close before we cut out the drive and come in the rest of the way at sublight speed. It'll take longer, and we'll have to go in on half or one-third rations. But we can do it. How far away? I don't know what the minimum distance is, but I do know how we can gauge the distance. Remember, neither Alpha Centauri B or C were detonated. We'll have to cut our drive at least as far away from Sol as they were from A. I see. The commander was silent for a moment, then. Very well, Dr. Lesher. If that's the safest way, that's the only way. Benedict issued the orders, while Lesher figured out the exact point at which they must cut out the drive, and how long the trip would take. The rations would have to be cut down accordingly. Commander Benedict's mind whirled around the monstrousness of the whole thing, like some dizzy bee around a flower. What if there had been planets around Centauri A? What if they were inhabited? Had he, all unwittingly, killed entire races of living, intelligent beings? But how could he have known? The drive had never been tested before. It couldn't be tested inside the Sol system. It was too fast. He and his crew had been volunteers, knowing that they might die when the drive went on. Suddenly, Benedict gasped and slammed his fist down on the desk before him. Lesher looked up. What's the matter, Commander? Suppose, came the answer, just suppose that we have the same effect on a star when we go into Ultra Drive that we do when we come out of it. Lesher was silent for a moment, stunned by the possibility. There was nothing to say, anyway. They could only wait. A little more than half a light year from Seoul, when the ship reached the point where its occupants could see the light that had left their home sun more than seven months before, they watched it become suddenly horribly bright a hundred thousand times brighter. The End of Time Fuse by Randall Garrett The Poniatowski Ray by George Frederick Stratton This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Krista Zaleski the Poniatowski Ray by George Frederick Stratton By the San Yelata waterhole on the parched Apparachi Desert, the small party of United States troopers were cramped, the coatless, some shirtless men, sprawling and gasping, while the picketed horses stamped and grunted miserably. Mojave Desert is some refrigerator to this, grunted Dial Harkin. All the same, if it wasn't so cussed hot, there'd sure be a picnic in this campaign. Four hundred U.S. troopers meandering a couple of hundred miles into the midst of these thousands of little Japs and Chinese and Mexicans, and never hearing a yelp. They yelped enough up there on the Rio Grande to carry over little old Mexico, chuckled Richards. That's when that nullifier got over em and set em floating real aimless and disregardful. They sure smeared all over the horizon. And they sure yelled, broke in Luke Summers. I was in the old whiskey slide mining camp in its toughest days and heard language all right. But what you'd heard there was Sunday school talk against the saints and devils these Mexicans hollered for when they were bucking each other forty or fifty feet above the sagebrush. It was simply scandalous, whatever that might be. I reckon they haven't got over it yet, grinned Harkin. They don't seem to be... They don't seem to be dead anxious to get where we can invite them in for a smoke or a poker hand. This is more like a moving picture stunt than a campaign. Look at them guns, big enough to scare the gal out of a million of men. And yet, well, you know what they are. 
He waved his cigarette over toward the battery of six guns, appalling in their monstrous length and diameter. As large as 16-inch turret guns, they were mounted on ordinary wagon gears, and although on the march a dozen mules were hitched to each, it was to emphasize the size. Four would have been ample, even on bad grades, for they were but wooden counterfeits, all except one. A laugh broke from the party. Bob-tailed flushes, every one of them, grunted Summers. But they've sure got the enemy guessing if their aero scouts have sized them up. There's one of them will do something to him besides guessing, grunted Rickards. That aluminum gun there looks like the others, only it's different. Four men can dismount that easy and carry it up any trail that a mule could scramble over. That fellow Cawthorn's had a hand in that. Well, say, who's this Cawthorn, anyway? asked Stull. He's the son of his father, grunted Rickards. Stull glared, spat viciously at a cactus and growled. You've got me. I pass. Now who's his father? Dunno. He's dead. But he was the high monkey monk of the biggest electric factory in our old United States, and his son's following in his footsteps, more or less. Ugh. An inventor, eh? Nix. He's not an inventor himself, but he anties up for him. He built those submarines that put all the Jap Chinese battleships to sleep up San Francisco way. Likewise, and also, he got up those gravitation nullifiers we've been telling you about. And when you hear that he's got a hand in one of those big four-flush guns, you can look for some play. From out of the rosy glare of the setting sun, a scout airplane came over the camp and circled slowly round. Signaling the colonel, exclaimed Harkin, and a moment later a bugle sounded. It was not a regulation army call. The men recognized it as the special call for Captain Cawthorn's squad, and instantly every man in the camp was on his feet, gazing at the group of men who rushed to one of the big guns. Captain Cawthorn and Lieutenant Sandhurst strode over to the great aluminum tube. A command was given, and the muzzle of the gun went up in the air until it pointed to the zenith. Then it was lowered and pointed at the horizon. Circle it, commanded Cawthorn. The great tube swept swiftly round in a complete circle, and Cawthorn murmured, In fine control, Lieutenant, and just in time. Here they come. Southward was the buzz as of the steady hum of many factory wheels, but nothing could be seen. The connections with the producer. Are all right, Kilroth? All right, Captain. I've turned on the radio selenite plates and the accumulator. Then in the south appeared a blur, like nebulae of a gray cloud. The burr increased, and in less than a minute the enemy reported by the scout arrow became clearly visible, a great scattered mass of airplanes. They're planning to clean us up, grinned Cawthorn. I suppose every one of them carries bombs, but they little dream who's going to give the order to fire them. They're three or four miles off yet, muttered the lieutenant. His binoculars were at his eyes, and after a steady look he said, There must be three or four score of them, Captain. Put that rapid-fire gun into action, commanded Cawthorn. Never mind the aim, just make noise. Then he sprang to the sighting instrument of the projecting tube and pointed it at the approaching arrows. Switch in, Kilroth, he exclaimed. Instantly a tiny ray of light, so nearly as blue as the sky as to be barely discernible, shot from the tube, and from the arrow fleet, a mile away and nearly a mile above the earth, came lightning flashes of flame with terrific crashes, drowning out the continuous rattle of the rapid-fire gun. Carthorne swung the tube across the sky, with some little deviation in the elevation, and that ray, the marvellous Poniatowski ray, fired every bomb, every gun, and every holstered revolver among them. The gasoline tanks went as instantly, wrecking the airplanes. Even the few which had not been caught in the first sweep of the ray and had circled round to one side were caught by the swift, well-judged movement of the projector. Within one minute that fleet of over eighty airplanes had come to the earth, most of them smashed to splinters by their own explosions, the others crippled by the nearby concussions or collisions. "'Good work!' exclaimed the lieutenant. "'We've put every one of them out of commission in less than half a minute. Hello! What's that mean?' A shrill bugle call rang out. "'Saddle up!' and all the men of the command were instantly on the jump. Colonel Rutherford, who was in general command of the expedition, strode up to Cawthorn. "'That's simply miraculous work, Captain. But it breaks up this night's camp. 
We're 40 miles yet from the coast, and we must cover that before the enemy has time to figure out how to meet this astounding attack. One plane got away and will report it all. I think they'll lay it all to that rapid-fire gun, Colonel. That ray was scarcely visible to anyone not looking especially for it. And of course they don't know of the existence of such a thing. Possibly so, sir, but I wish it hadn't been necessary to use it at all until we could open up on their vessels. Well, we'll advance now, so as to make our main attack tomorrow night. An hour later, as the officers were butting their armored cars through the sagebrush and talking over the instantaneous demolition of the air fleet, Lieutenant Baxter asked, Who is this man Poniatowski, who discovered or invented that ray, Captain? Discovery is right, smiled Cawthorne, although I'm sure from what he told me that he used up as much time in intense thought and studying in reaching that discovery as if it had been the most intricate invention. He's a Pole, and was a man of property over there, and very scientific attainments, but after he had discovered that extraordinary arc, and in spite of his efforts to keep it secret, his government with its spies at every man's elbow heard about it and demanded a full description of its principles and application. They had even ordered his arrest when a friend gave him a pointer. He smashed his apparatus in his home workshop, secured the gram of radium in which all his wealth, nearly a hundred thousand dollars, was tied up, and fled inside of an hour. He had thrilling adventures and hairbreadth escapes, but reached a port and got passage to this country. But in that struggle for freedom, for life, he lost that radium and landed in New York in poverty. He got a job as a laborer in our shops, and I heard of him through one of the foremen, and got in touch with him. When he found that I was surely a friend, he told me about the Ark. That's how it is. And you went ahead and developed it. I helped in the only way I can help with such things. By money. I sent him to my experimental shop at my country home, bought another gram of radium, and put everything at his disposal. And this is the first time the ray has been ever put to use? Absolutely. Poniatowski is no lover of warfare. The fearful calamities of it in his own country made him determined to put no fresh weapon in the oppressor's hands. But, all the same, he sees plainly that used for defense or repression, it will stop warfare with one quarter or one tenth of the sacrifices of life and property of the most deadly up-to-date implements now in use, for it puts the fighting all on one side. It puts the enemy's forces, land or naval, absolutely under the control of our officers, as you will see tomorrow. I've seen it tonight, muttered the lieutenant grimly, then, after a pause, I presume then, Captain, that the projector we have with us is the only one in existence? No, there's another. I built this one at my own expense and offered it to the government. When they decided on this expedition, they planned to have another for a relief machine. Then a dispute came up as to which branch of the service the projectors properly belonged to, the Army or the Navy. And they discussed that for three weeks, and settled it by ordering one projector to be placed on a cruiser and sent round to the Gulf of California to Admiral Roberts' fleet and the other one to be sent overland to attack the Allies' headquarters at Zapata. You see, Admiral Roberts cannot take his ships into the bay because those Japs have mined and netted the entrance thoroughly, and their submarines prevent all efforts to clear the channel. But if they put that projector in action, it will explode every mine and every submarine within reach of the ray. And we've tested that up to six miles. What? That marvelous ray can operate underwater? can find and explode the hidden mines. The tests have shown that thoroughly, Lieutenant. The end of that forced night march took them within sixteen miles of Zapata, on the shore of the Cisneros Bay in the Gulf of California. Here was the supply base of the Allied Mexicans, Japs, and Chinese, the latter two furnishing from their great fleet of transports and supply vessels the munitions which the Mexicans were deficient in, their supply from the United States being, of course, shut off. A scout arrow came in and reported that the enemy had cut a trench five miles from where Rutherford's command was, and had an immense body of men excavating a second trench between the first and Zapata. As that report was made, firing from the first trench commenced, and shells began to drop, although the range and the aim were inaccurate. "'We've got them guessing pretty bad, if you're not scared,' laughed Cawthorn. "'Digging trenches to protect twenty thousand men from four hundred. Those gravitation nullifiers aren't forgotten yet, and the mysterious explosions of their air fleet haven't quieted their nerves any. Send an order back to our airplanes to advance immediately with the two gravitation nullifiers, commanded the colonel. 
The crews of the arrows were bivouacking five miles in the rear, but in ten minutes they were flying swiftly over the command, one of them coming to the ground to pick up Cawthorn. From the first trench came volleys of shot and shell, but the arrows had risen 3,500 feet and no missile reached them. Then the little bullet-like metallic attractors were scattered from the escort arrows upon the trench below, and the gravitation nullifiers numbers three and four went into action. The gravitation of everything below them instantly disappeared. Heavy guns, being fired as the nullifier influence reached them, recoiled as if they had themselves been struck by a ten times larger shot than they had fired. Japs and Chinese floated out of the trench, clutching frantically at each other, or at the wafting cannon or small arms with which they were now mixed. So on to the second trench, where men with picks and shovels found their weight gone, where boulders which two men with difficulty tossed out of the trench suddenly lost the earth's attraction and drifted away in utter aimlessness. Mules hitched to ammunition and supply wagons, frenzied by the astounding conglomerate of men, weapons and rocks which floated against them, pranced into the air and failed to regain any footing. The demoralization was complete. But from a relief trench guard which was approaching from Zapata came a chance shell among Rutherford's men, and exploding, wrecked the projector, put Captain Cawthorn to the ground, and killed three others. Kilroth sprang to his captain, slipped his arm under his head, and asked, Where are you hurt, Captain? Legs smashed again, grinned Cawthorn. Get me the other if you can, Kilroth. Kilroth glanced at the debris of the shattered poplar and steel wire which had been his captain's false leg, and with a muttered thank God, dashed away to the supply auto where a substitute had been carried. As he came back, Cawthorn was sitting up, gazing ruefully at the wrecked projector. It all depends on the Admiral now, Kilroth. We're out of the game, except for the nullifiers. They can probably protect us in our retreat to the Rio Grande. Hard luck, grunted Kilroth. They should have let us have both projectors. Four hundred troopers with only one effective weapon set out against twenty thousand of the enemy, not counting their fleet. The colonel came up, glanced at Cawthorn adjusting the fastenings of his false leg, and exclaimed, I didn't expect to see you able to move. It's fortunate for all of us that you were not injured. Cawthorn shrugged his shoulders. The only possible use I have been to your command, colonel, is smashed out of commission, almost out of recognition. He pointed to the wrecked projector and added, I suppose that means that we draw out of the game now. Only as far as that can, and asserted the colonel grimly. We must have cover from the battleship's guns. They're getting into action now, and when they get our range, we must be behind rocks. He gave the command, Leave those big guns and retreat instantly to that canyon. Signal nullifier number three to draw back here. We must not risk both those machines at the same time. Order nullifier number four to continue operating over the enemy's trenches. Then to the wireless operator he ordered, Call up Admiral Robert's flagship and report that our projector is wrecked. Tell him that we will hold our position here, and if he succeeds in exploding the mines and coming up into the bay to engage the enemy's fleet, we'll keep our nullifiers in action on the land enemy at Zapata. And a rapid command to Cawthorn followed. Captain, have those muzzles of the big guns elevated so as to draw any enemy's fire. Also, leave that rapid-fire gun among them. Attach the wireless firing mechanism to it, and then draw off every man into the canyon. The retreat, or perhaps sidestep, was quickly made, and, with the rugged, hoary Chapaderas range between them and the coast, the command with horses and supply autos were safe from the fleet guns, the shells from which, however, were directed at the five great wooden counterfeits and the smoke from the rapid fire, which were clearly visible from the bay across the open mesa. That deceives them all right, laughed the colonel, and if we keep quiet here for a while, they'll believe that they've wiped us out completely. There go the guns, as a shell exploded and scattered the images over the plain. A scout arrow was signaled to come down, and as it reached level ground at the mouth of the canyon, the wireless officer reported an answer from Admiral Roberts. Our projector has destroyed apparently every mine and several submarines. Am advancing up the bay to engage the enemy's fleet, and shall then proceed to Zapata to take the land forces. Hold your position until I arrive. It will be safer than retreat. The colonel scowled grimly as he handed the paper to Cawthorn. The admiral assumes that he gets not only the surrender of the fleet, but the entire land force, and we are to sit here and wait till he comes in to protect us. Fortunately, we are not under his orders. 
Cawthorn stepped his way for a few moments. Ten minutes later, the two officers grasped hands, their faces beaming, and Cawthorn strode over to the scout arrow, climbed into the seat, and went into the air, heading across the great Cisneros Bay. With him were the operator and a wireless man. They passed directly over the Japo Chinese fleet, sixteen battleships, seven of which were the most modern and powerful dreadnoughts ever designed. Every vessel was under steam, and while two had run up close to the Zapata shore in order to meet any further attack from Rutherford's command, the other great ships were speeding down the bay toward the point around which Robert's fleet would have to come. The arrow flew swiftly, and the eighteen miles to the point were quickly covered. Beyond it, they saw the stars and stripes floating from the fleet, which was moving very slowly. One vessel only, a light cruiser, was pushing ahead, and through his glasses Cawthorn saw the big projector tube at the bow. Almost at that moment, the cruiser slowed down as her nose poked round the great perpendicular Vaquera rock, which had obstructed any view of the enemy, and as she reached that position, the projector tube was swung over to port, pointing at the approaching Jap battleships four miles up the bay. With a gasp of delight, Cawthorn saw the puffs of smoke from every turret of those vessels, and the next instant the crash of the detonations reached them. Firing down the bay with not an enemy in sight except that cruiser, ejaculated Cawthorn, and they haven't had time to aim at her. Roberts gave the order for that firing, and the ray, the wonderful Poniatowski ray, did it. At the rear of the enemy's battleships were several light-armored cruisers, which, as the ray reached them, exploded their magazines. Absolutely unnecessary, growled Cawthorn. He's using too heavy penetration. I was afraid of that, and warned them against it. If they concentrate much more than they're doing, they'll get through the heaviest armor to the magazines, and blow up those dreadnoughts, and our good old country will lose them all. But the Admiral must have ordered less penetration, for no more magazine explosions took place. For a few moments, the battleships were maneuvered to bring their turret guns to bear upon the one mysterious cruiser in the shadow of the great Vaquera rock. But before any gun could be aimed or elevated or depressed, the ray struck the charge and discharged it. In less than three minutes, the firing ceased, and the United States battleships were under forced draft, dashing round the point. Cawthorn howled delightedly to the wireless officer. Send word to the colonel that Roberts is steaming up the bay. All firing ceased. Then to the operator. Work up the bay and over Zapata. As they glided over the great horde of tents, supplies, munitions, and men, Cawthorn waved a white flag until an answering flag showed that he would be received. They glided to the ground and the captain was escorted to the Allies' headquarters and received by Ito, the Japanese general who understood English perfectly. Cawthorn stated his mission concisely and very determinately. Your fleet is silenced, General, by the marvelous ray projector which Admiral Roberts has, a duplicate of which destroyed your aero fleet today. The power of that ray has not been fully demonstrated to you yet, for if the penetration was increased to capacity, it would explode every magazine behind the heaviest armor on the greatest dreadnought out there. And if we put our land projector into action against your camp here, not one grain of explosive will escape. Your entire force will be annihilated. I am ordered by my commanding officer to demand your unconditional surrender. An hour later, two wireless reports were sent to Washington. One from Admiral Roberts was, The enemy's fleet has surrendered with every battleship intact and little loss of life. Three of their cruisers destroyed. No loss on our side. Ed S. Roberts Admiral of the Fleet, in Cisneros Bay. That from Colonel Rutherford was, The entire land force of the enemy at Zapata surrendered to this command at 445. Our projector destroyed early in the operations, but the nullifiers completed the attack. M. J. Rutherford, Colonel of the Cisneros Expeditionary Force at Zapata. End of the Poniatowski Ray by George Frederick Stratton The Timeless Ones by Frank Belknap Long. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dan Gerzinski. 
The Timeless Ones, by Frank Belknap Long. There will be a great many changes, Ned, Cynthia Jackson said. She stared out the viewport at the little green world which the contact rocket Star Mist was swiftly approaching on warp drive. Her husband, co-pilot, nodded, remembering Clifton and Helen Sweeney and the Sweeney youngsters, remembering with a smile Tommy Sweeney's kite-flying antics, his freckles and mischievous eyes, a toe-headed kid of ten with an Irish sense of humor, sturdily planted in a field of alien corn five thousand light-years from Earth, sowing and reaping and bringing in the sheaves in the blue light of a great double sun his dreams as vibrant with promise as the interstellar warp drive, which, a century ago, had brought the first prospect ship from Earth to the stars. He'd be a man grown now, as sturdy as his dad. You could almost take that for granted. And his sister would be a willowy girl with clear blue eyes, and she'd come out of a white plastic cottage with the buoyancy of twenty summers in her carriage and a smile. They'd be farmers still. You couldn't change the Sweeney's in a million years. Couldn't wean them away from the good earth. It was funny, but he couldn't even visualize the Sweeney's without thinking of a little sleepy town, the kind of town he'd left himself as a kid to strike out across the great curve of the universe. Dry dust of Kansas and the Dakotas that would still be blowing after a thousand years. They've had time to build a town, Ned, Cynthia said, a really fine town with broad streets and modern dust-proof buildings. Ned Jackson awoke from his reverie with a wry start. He nodded again, remembering the many other colonists and the equipment which had been shipped to the little green world across the years. Plastic materials to build houses and schools and roadways. Educational materials to build eager young minds. Every ten years, a contact rocket went out from Earth by interstellar warp drive to make a routine check. The trip was a long one, eight months. But the Central Colonization Bureau had to make sure that anarchy did not take the place of law on worlds where teeming jungles encouraged the free exercise of man's best qualities and his worst. From end to end of the galaxy, on large planets and small... Progress had to be measured in terms of the greatest good for the greatest number. There could be no other yardstick, for when man ceased to be a social animal, his star-conquering genius shriveled to the vanishing point. The friends we made here were very special, Ned, Cynthia said. I guess people who dare greatly have to be a bit keener than the stay-at-homes, a bit more eager and alive. But the Sweeney's had such a tremendous zest for living. I know, Ned said. They were wonderful, generous, and kind. It will be good to see them again. Good to... Cynthia laughed. I don't know why, but I was about to say good to be home. Ned thought he knew why. They made their first flight for the Bureau exactly ten years before. It had been a combined official business and honeymoon flight, and almost the whole of it had been spent on the little green world. Did not the queen bee and her consort, flying high above the hive on a night of perfumed darkness, remember best what was bliss to recall, the shifting lights and shadows and honey-scented murmurings of their nuptial trance? Would not the brightest, furthest star be home to the star beguiled? The rocket ship was out of subspace now and traveling on its murmuring overdrive. It was well within sight of green valleys and purple-rimmed hills. The planet had grown from a tiny dot to a shining silver sphere swimming in misty radiance. For a moment, it had wavered against the brightly burning stars caught in a web of darkness. Then swiftly it exploded into a close, familiar world as beautiful as a flower opening snowy petals to the dawn. It was a simple matter to bring the rocket down. The valley seemed to sweep up toward them, and gravity jets took over an automatic sequence. There was a gentle hiss of air as the star mist settled to rest on hard-packed soil, a scant fifty yards from a blue and vermilion flower garden. Through a dancing blue haze a dwelling loomed, white and serene in the rosy flush of evening. 
Cynthia looked at her husband, her eyes wide with surprise. "'Just shows how close you can come when you follow dial readings,' Ned said. "'The first lean-to shack stood just about here. I remember the slope of the soil.' Cynthia's eyes grew warm and eager. "'Ned, I'm glad. It's no fun searching for old friends with your heart in your throat. We'll step right up and surprise them.' When they emerged from the ship, the perfume of flowers mingled with the richer scent of freshly turned earth, bringing back memories of their earlier visit. There had been no flower garden then, but the soil had possessed the same April shower freshness. "'I must look like a fright,' Cynthia said. "'You didn't give me time to powder my nose.' They were within five yards of the dwelling when a door opened and a child of ten or twelve emerged. She was blue-eyed, golden-haired, and she stood for a moment, blinking in the evening light, her hair whipped by the wind. "'Mary Sweeney!' Cynthia exclaimed, catching hold of Ned's arm. Then, in a stunned whisper, "'Oh, but it can't be! She'd be a grown woman!' The child straightened at the sound of the voice, looking about. She saw Ned and Cynthia, and blank amazement came into her eyes. Then she gave a little glad cry and ran toward them, her arms reaching out in welcome. "'You've come back!' she exclaimed. "'Mom and Dad thought it would be a long time, but I knew you'd come soon. I knew. I was sure.' Nowhere any sign that this was not the child they had known ten years before. Her voice, the peaches and cream color that flooded her cheeks, the way her hair clung and little ringlets to her temples— all struck memory chords from long ago. And now she was beckoning them into the dwelling, having moved a little away from them. She was balancing herself in elfin lightness on one toe and smiling in warm gratefulness, the sun all blue and gold behind her. She had always seemed an elfin and mischievous child. What can it mean, Ned? White-lipped, Ned shook his head. I... I don't know. We'd better go inside. Helen Sweeney, her white streaked auburn hair damp with steam vapor, sent a frying pan crashing to the floor as she turned from the stove with a startled cry. Ned! Cynthia! Why, land sakes, it seems only yesterday! Ned had a good look at her face. The eyes were the same, good-humored and kindly and wise, and if she had been forty a decade before, she seemed now to be forcing herself back into an earlier instant of time, the very evening of that last well-remembered birthday party, with the candles all bright and gleaming, and the children refusing to admit that she could ever be middle-aged. Old Clifton came in from his workshop out and back. He'd been whittling away at a rocket ship model, and he held it firmly in the crook of his arm, his eyes puckered in dust bowl grief. Like most men of the soil, Clifton had difficulty with his whittling when he turned his skill to rocket ships. The grief vanished when he saw Ned and Cynthia. Pure delight took hold of him, bringing a quick smile of welcome to his lips. Back so soon? Seems only yesterday you folks went away. It was ten years ago, Ned said, his throat strangely dry. Clifton looked at him and shook his head. Ten years, Ned. "'Surely you're joking.' "'It was a good many years, Clifton,' Helen Sweeney said quickly. "'You must forgive us, Ned, Cynthia. "'Time just doesn't seem to matter when you're busy building for the future. "'Time goes fast, like a great ship at sea, "'its sails ballooning out with a wind "'that keeps carrying it faster and faster into the sunrise.' "'There are no ships here,' Clifton said, chuckling. "'Helen's fancy wedded to earth.' but she's forgetting the last sailing ship rotted away a hundred years before she was born. It's a good thought, though. Don't know what put a sailing ship in Helen's head, but I guess folks who were born on Earth have a right to hark back a bit. It'll be different with Tom and Mary. Where's Tommy? Ned asked. Out shucking corn. Clifton's voice was vibrant with sudden pride. He's still the same reckless young lad, He'd risk his neck to bring in a full harvest. I keep warning him, but he goes right on worrying his mother. Fact is, he hasn't changed at all, no more than we have. So they knew. Cynthia looked at Ned, an unspoken question in her eyes. 
How could they accept the tremendousness of not changing without realizing that any arrest of the aging process must alter their daily lives in a thousand intangible ways? How could they build for the future when their children would never grow up? It was Ned who discovered the mind block. Not only had the Sweeney's ceased to age physically, they lacked a normal time sense. If you reminded them of the passing years, their minds cleared momentarily, and they could think back. But that link with the past had no staying power. It was like punching pillows to get them to remember. They lived in the present, well content to accept the world about them on a day-to-day -day basis, warmed by the bright flame of their children growing up. But their children weren't growing up. They had only the illusion of change, the illusion of planning for their future, and that illusion was terribly real to them, unless jolted by a question. How's Tommy? Why, Tommy hasn't changed at all. A puzzled frown, a moment's honest facing of the truth, an old memory stirring into life, then the mind block closing in, clamping down. Ned, Cynthia, you'll stay for dinner. It was late and growing cold, and the stars had appeared in the sky. In the rocket ship, Ned sat facing his wife. That house was never built by human hands, he said, a cold prickling at the base of his scalp. He had suffered from the same prickling off and on for a full hour. He could still taste the strong coffee he'd downed at a gulp before rising in haste at the end of an uneasy meal. He was sorry now they returned to the ship without waiting to say hello to Tommy, fresh from his harvesting chores. Tommy was the brightest member of the family. Perhaps Tommy knew more than the others, or could remember better. Not built by human hands, but that's insane, Ned. Cynthia's face, shadowed from below by the cold light of the instrument board, was harsh with concern. The materials came from Earth. They did. Ned acknowledged. Grade A plastics, the best. And a good engineer can build almost anything with malleable plastics. But not a house without seams. Without seams? Joints, connections, little rough places, Ned elaborated. Inside and out, that house was smooth, all of a piece. Like a burst of frozen energy. Like, oh, you know what I mean. Surely you must have noticed it. There were other colonists, Cynthia said. Some of them were engineers. They've had time to work out new constructive techniques. They've had time to disappear. Why did the Sweeneys act so funny when I asked them about the other colonists? Why did Clifton refuse to look at me? Why did I have to drag the answer out of him? Oh, we spread out. Enough land here for all of us. Does that ring true to you? They didn't want us to stay together, Tommy Sweeney said. Ned leapt up with a startled cry. Cynthia swayed, her eyes widening in stark disbelief. Tommy Sweeney walked smiling into the compartment, his shoulders squared. He came through the pilot room wall in a blaze of light and stood between Ned and Helen, his lips quivering in boyish earnestness. Take any school, Tommy said. Some of the pupils are bright, some are just good students who work hard at their homework, some are stupid and dull. If you let them stay together, the bright ones, the really bright ones, get held back. Tommy seemed suddenly to realize he was seeing Ned and Cynthia for the first time in ten years, his good friends, Ned and Cynthia. A Cynthia who was as beautiful as ever, though deathly pale now, and a Ned who was just a little older and grayer. A broad grin overspread his face. I knew you'd come back, he said. You, you came through a solid metal wall, Ned said, feeling as though an earthquake had taken place inside of him. It's easy when you know how, Tommy said. Who taught you how? Cynthia asked. In a voice so emotional, Ned forgot his own horror and concern for her sanity. Who taught you, Tommy? The green people, Tommy said. The green people? They live in the forest, Tommy said. They come out at night and dance around the house. They hold hands and dance and sing. 
Then they talked to us, to mom, dad, and sis, but mostly to me. They taught me how to play, to really have fun. Do they teach you how to change the atoms of your body so that you could pass through a solid metal wall? Ned asked, framing the question very carefully. Shucks, it was nothing like that, Tommy said. They just told me that if I forgot about walls, I could go anywhere. And you believe them? Suddenly, Cynthia was laughing. Her laughter rang out wild and uncontrollable in the pilot room. He believed them, Ned. He believed them. Ned went up to her and took her by the shoulders and shook her. Tommy looked shamefaced. He shuffled his feet, ill at ease in the presence of adult hysteria. I've got to go now, he stammered. Mom will be awful mad if I'm late for dinner again. You are late, Tommy, Cynthia said. The joke's on you. We just had dinner with your parents in a house Ned claims wasn't built by human hands. She laughed wildly. Your parents are sensible people, though. They didn't even try to walk through the kitchen wall. They could if they tried hard enough, Tommy said. Someday they will. Tommy looked almost apologetic. I can't stay any longer. I saw your ship and wanted to see if you really had come back. I thought it might be someone else. I'm sure glad it's you. Tommy turned abruptly and walked straight out of the pilot room, his small body lighting up the wall until he vanished. Cynthia stared at her husband her eyes dark with a questioning horror. The green people, Ned said. Think, Cynthia. Does the name mean anything to you? Cynthia shook her head, her lips shaping a soundless, no. Ned sat down slowly, rubbing his jaw. I just thought you might know something about druidism and what the strange rites of that mysterious cult meant to the ancient inhabitants of Gaul and the British Isles. According to the Roman historian Pliny, the Druids built stone houses for their pupils and called themselves the Green People. Starlight from the viewport illuminated Ned's pale face. He paused, then said, The Druids were soothsayers and sorcerers who disappeared from history at the time of the Roman conquest. It was widely believed they had the power of conferring eternal youth. They taught that time was an illusion, space the shadow of a dream. His eyes were grim with speculation. The Druids were teachers almost in the modern sense. Pliny records that they had a passion for teaching and thought of their worshippers as pupils, as children with much to learn. Instruction in physical science formed the cornerstone of the druidic cult. Cynthia leaned forward, her face strained and intense as he went on. The Romans hated and feared them. There was a terrible bloody battle, and the druids no longer danced in their groves of oak in slow procession to a weird dirge-like chanting. They vanished from earth and almost from the memory of man. Ned took a deep breath. Man fears the unknown, and knowledge is a source of danger. Maybe the druids were never really native to Earth. What if this were their home planet? Ned, you can't really believe. Listen, Ned said. The sound was clearly audible through the thin walls of the rocket ship. It was a steady, dull droning, an eerie, terrifying sound. Ned got up and walked to the viewport. He stared out. He could see the Sweeney's dwelling clearly. It was bathed in an unearthly green light, and around it, in a circle, robed figures moved through shadows the color of blood. Around and around in ever-widening circles, their tall, gaunt bodies strangely bent. For a full minute he stared out. When his wife joined him, he stretched out a hand and let it rest lightly on her shoulder. Perhaps we wouldn't be far wrong if we thought of the Sweeneys as catalysts, he said. Cynthia stood very straight and quiet, a great fear growing in her. Catalysts, Ned? It's just a wild guess, of course. I can't even tell you what made me think of it. But it does have a certain relevancy. In chemistry, as you know, 
A catalytic agent is a substance which promotes chemical action, but is in itself unchanged. Well, why do men and women who surrender themselves to sorcery remain in legend eternally young? Young, unchanging. It's a belief as old as prehistory and all the ages since. Only in the Middle Ages were witches pictured as shrunk and hideous old women. The ancient world pictured witches as eternally youthful, unaging. A long pause, and then Ned said, as unaging as the forests of oak where they served as human catalysts for the druids before the druids left earth forever. He suddenly seemed to be thinking aloud rather than addressing his wife. Well, and why not? The druids must change, for change is the first law of life. But perhaps they can only find complete fulfillment, can only grow in wisdom and strength by using human beings as little hard grains of chemical substance, which must remain forever bright and shining. Human catalysts, imprisoned in a horrible little test tube of a house. If human beings aged and changed, they would cease to be catalysts. They would become valueless to the druids. And when the Romans discovered the truth... Agreement was clearly in Cynthia's eyes. She moved closer to the viewport, her face pale. Fear and a merciless hatred, Ned said, pursuing the druids, driving them from Earth, and dim, fearful legends remaining of a dark magic older than the human race. Ned, they've stopped dancing, Cynthia's voice rang out sharply in the silence. They're coming toward the ship. I know, Ned said. But we don't know what they're planning to do, Cynthia's voice rose. We've got to get out. Steady, Ned said, turning. If we take off at peak acceleration, I just can't picture them stopping us. Ned, the Sweeneys may be happier than we know, Cynthia said hours later. They were deep in subspace, a hundred light years from the little green world. And in the warm security of the pilot room, its menacing shadows seemed immeasurably remote. Happy? Ned laughed harshly. Kids who'll never grow up? Adults cut off from all further growth? The same today, tomorrow, and forever? Their minds may change, Cynthia said. Their minds may grow, Ned. Tommy said that bright pupils could go far. As catalysts caught in a ghastly trap... How can you be so sure, Ned? A wild guess, you called it. How do you know the Druids and the Sweeneys don't learn from one another? Perhaps they grow wise together, in a wonderful bright sharing of knowledge and happiness that's like nothing we can imagine. Ned looked at his wife. Why say a thing like that? Why even think of it? Pandora, I guess. What do you mean? I'm a woman, and the Pandora complex is pretty basic, darling. I'd be tempted to go back and throw open the box. Something pretty black and horrible would come out, Ned said sharply. You can take my word for that. I hope you're not forgetting that Pandora was the first woman chosen by Zeus to bring complete ruin on the human race. She didn't quite succeed. And how can we know for sure, Ned? If what you say is true, if the druids were really driven from Earth, we haven't done so well since. Wars and madness for two thousand years, destruction and cruelty and death. All you have to do is prove we'd be better off if the druids had stayed, Ned said. Darling, think, if people grew wiser all the time, if they never aged, would they want to murder one another? Now see here. Cynthia smiled. Think of having our own beautiful little home forever, in a fragrant woody patch, with shining kitchen utensils on the wall. Think of being spared all the miseries of old age and poverty and sickness and death. Think of having neighbors like the Sweeneys to grow young with, to grow wise and young with, day by splendid day until the end of time. There was a long silence, and then Cynthia said, I'd trust them, Ned. The druids, I mean. I'd take the chance. What have we to lose that's really great? 
that can hold a candle to what the Sweeney's have. You can go anywhere if you just remember how close you are to where you want to be, Tommy Sweeney said, coming through the pilot room wall in a blaze of light. He grinned. I asked Mom and Dad to try real hard this time, and here they are. All of the Sweeney's came into the pilot room as Tommy spoke, their faces incredibly radiant. I never really believed Tommy until this minute, Clifton Sweeney said. If you just forget about walls, you're where you want to be. Sure you are, Tommy said. It's as easy as skinning a chipmunk. Ned, Cynthia, Helen Sweeney said, come back. Tommy's sister simply smiled, a mischievous elfin smile which seemed to mock the vast loneliness of space. It was as if some wizard game, played by laughing children and wise forest creatures through long golden afternoons, had become a universe-spanning web, embracing everything in its path in a warm and radiant way. Cynthia looked at Ned. Well, darling? Yes, Ned said with a quick decision. We'll go back. And at that moment, in the forest deep and dark, the druids built another house. It was designed to appeal to a man and a woman who had traveled far and grown weary of human cruelty and death. It was designed for gracious living, but whether the druids in their inscrutable wisdom wished mankind well or ill, who could say? End of the Timeless Ones by Frank Belknap Long Signal Red by Henry Guth This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Recording by Kevin Crody Signal Red by Henry Guth They tried to stop him. Earth Flight 21 was a suicide run, a coffin ship. They told him, Uranian death lay athwart the space lanes. But Shano already knew this was his last ride. Mercurian night settled black and thick over the Q-City spaceport. Tentative fingers of light flicked and probed the sky and winked out. Here she comes, somebody in the line ahead said. Shano coughed, his whole skeletal body jerking. Arthritic joints sent flashes of pain along his limbs. Here she comes, he thought, feeling neither glad nor sad. He coughed and slipped polarized goggles over his eyes. The spaceport emerged bathed in infrared. Hangars, cradles, freighter catapults, and long runways stood out in sharp, diamond-clear detail. High up, beyond the cone of illumination, a detached triple row of bright specks, portals of the liner Stardust, sank slowly down. There was no eagerness in him, only a tiredness, a relief. Relief from a lifetime of beating around the planets, a life of digging, lifting, lugging, and pounding. Like a work-worn Martian camel, he was going home to die. As though on oiled pistons, the ship sank into the light, its long, shark-like hull glowing soft and silvery and settled with a feathery snuggle into the cradle's ribs. The passenger line quivered as a loudspeaker boomed. Stardust now arrived at Cradle 6. Stardust, Cradle 6. All passengers for Venus and Earth prepare to board in ten minutes. Shano coughed and wiped phlegm from his thin lips, his hand following around the bony contours of his face, feeling the hollows and the beard stubble and loose skin of his neck. He coughed and thought of the vanium mines of Pluto and his gum-clogged lungs. A vague, pressing desire for home overwhelmed him. It had been so long. 
Attention, attention, Stardust passengers, the signal is red. The signal is red. Refunds now being made. Refunds now. Take off in five minutes. The man ahead swore and flicked up an arm. Red, he groaned. By the infinite galaxies, this is the last straw. He charged away, knocking Shano aside as he passed. Red signal. In bewildered anxiety, Shano lifted the goggles from his eyes and stared into the sudden blackness. The red signal. Danger out there. Passengers advised to ground themselves or travel at their own risk. He felt the passengers bump and fumble past him, grumbling vexatiously. A hot dread assailed him, and he coughed, plucking at his chest, plucking at an urgency there. Dropping the goggles to his roomy eyes, he saw that the passenger line had dissolved. He moved, shuffling to the gate, thrust his ticket into the scanner slot, and pushed through the turnstile when it clicked. Flight 21, now arriving from Venus, the loudspeaker said monotonously. Shano glanced briefly upward and saw the gleaming belly of 21 sinking into the spaceport cone of light. He clawed his way up the gangway and thrust out his ticket to the lieutenant standing alone at the airlock. The lieutenant, a sullen, chunky man with a queer nick in his jawbone, refused the ticket. Haven't you heard, mister? Red signal. Go on back. Shano coughed and peered through the lenses of his goggles. Please, he said. Want to go home. I've a right. The nicked jaw stirred faint memories within his glazed mind. The lieutenant punched his ticket. It's your funeral, old man. The loudspeaker blared. Stardust, taking off in 30 seconds. The signal is red. Stardust, taking. With the words dinning in his ears, Shano stepped into the airlock. The officer followed, spun wheels, and the lock closed. The outside was shut off. Lifting goggles, they entered the hole through a series of two more locks, closing each behind them. We're afloat, the officer said. We've taken off. A fleck of light danced far back in his eye. Shano felt the pressure of acceleration gradually increasing, increasing, and hurried in. Captain Mentholo, the silver-mustached Jupiterian, broad, huge, yet crushable as a beetle, talked while his hands manipulated a panel of studs in the control room. The pilot, his back encased in leather, sat in a bucket seat before him, listening into earphones. Surprised to learn of a passenger aboard, the captain said, glancing briefly sideways. You're entitled to know of the danger ahead. He flicked the final stud, spoke to the pilot, and, at last, turned a serious, squared face to Shano. Old man, he said, there is a Uranian fleet out there. We don't know how many ships in this sector. Flight 21, which just landed, had a skirmish with one and got away. We may not be so lucky. You know how these Uranian devils are. Shano coughed and wiped his mouth. Dirty devils, he said. I was driven off the planet once, before this war started. I know things about them Uranian devils. Heard them in the mines around. Here's things a laborer does. The captain seemed for the first time to realize the social status of his lone passenger, and he became a little gruff. Want you to sign this waiver, saying you're traveling at your own risk. We'll expect you to keep to your cabin as much as possible. When the trouble comes, we can't bother with a passenger. In a few hours, we'll shut down the ship entirely and every mechanical device aboard to try to avoid detection. His mustaches rose like two spears from each side of his squared nose as his face changed to an alert watchfulness. Going home, eh? he said. You've knocked around some, by the looks of you. Pluto, from the sound of that cough. Shano scrawled his signature on the waiver. Yeah, he said. Pluto, where a man's lungs fights gas. He blinked watery eyes. Captain, what's a notched jaw mean to you? Well, old man, the captain grasped Shano's shoulder and turned him around. 
It means somebody cut himself shaving. You stick tight to your cabin, he nodded curtly and indicated the door. Descending the companionway to the next deck, Shano observed the dick-jawed lieutenant staring out the viewport, apparently idling. The man turned and gripped Shano's thin arm. A light, he said, tapping a cigarette. Shano produced a lighter disc, and the chunky man puffed. He was an earthman, and his jaw seemed cut with a knife, notched like a piece of wood. Across the breast of his tunic was a purple band with the name Rourke. Why are you so anxious to get aboard, old man? He searched Shano's face. There's trouble ahead, you know. Shano coughed, racking his body as forgotten memories stirred sluggishly in his mind. Yup, he said, and jerked free and stumbled down the steel deck. In his cabin, he lay on the bunk, lighted a cigarette and smoked, coughing and staring at the rivet-studded bulkhead. The slow movement of his mind resolved into a struggle, one idea groping for the other. What were the things he had heard about dicked jaws? And where had he heard them? Digging ore on Pluto? Talk in the pits? Secretive suspicions voiced in smoke-laden saloons of Mars? In the labor gangs of Uranus? Where? Shano smoked and didn't know. But he knew there was a rumor and that it was the talk of ignorant men. The captain had evaded it. Shano smoked and coughed and stared at the steel bulkhead and waited. The ship's alarm clanged. Shano jerked from his bunk like a broken watch spring. He crouched, trembling on arthritic joints as a loudspeaker blared throughout the ship. All hands! We now maintain dead silence. Close down and stop all machinery. Power off and lights out. An enemy fleet is out there, listening and watching for mechanical and electronic disturbance. Atmosphere will be maintained from emergency oxygen cylinders. Stop pumps. Shano crouched and listened as the ship's steady drone ceased and the vibrations ceased. The pumps stopped. The lights went out. Pressing the cold steel bulkhead, Shano heard oxygen hiss through the pipes. Hiss and hiss, and then flow soundlessly, filling the cabin and his lungs. He choked. The cabin was like a mine shaft, dark and cold. Feet pounded on the deck outside. Shano clawed open the door. He peered out anxiously. Cold blobs of light. Phosphorescent bulbs held in the fists of men glimmered by. Phosphorescent bulbs because the power was off. Shano blinked. He saw officers and men, their faces tight and pinched, hurrying in all directions, hurrying to shut down the ship. He acted impulsively. A young ensign strode by, drawn blaster in hand. Shano followed him followed the bluish glow of his bulb through the Lamberthine passages and down a companionway, coughing and leering against the pain in his joints. The blue light winked out in the distance, and Shano stopped. He was suddenly alarmed. The captain had warned him to stay in his cabin. He looked back and forth, wondering how to return. A bell clanged. Shano saw a cold bulb glowing down the passageway and he shuffled hopefully toward it. The bulb moved away. He saw an indistinct figure disappear through a door marked engine room. Shano paused uncertainly at the end of the passageway. A thick cluster of vertical pipes filled the corner. He peered at the pipes and saw a gray box snuggled behind them. It had two toggle switches and a radium dial that quivered delicately. Shano scratched his scalp as boots pounded on the decks above and below. He listened attentively to the ship's familiar noises, diminishing one by one. And finally, even the pounding of feet died out. Everything became still. The silence shrieked in his ears. The ship coasted. Shano could sense it coasting. He couldn't feel it or hear it. But he knew it was sliding, ghost-like, through space, 
like a submarine dead underwater, slipping quietly past a listening enemy. The ship's speakers rasped softly, Emergency! Battle posts! The captain's voice, calm, brief, it sent a tremor through Shano's body. He heard a quick scuffle of feet again, running feet, directly overhead, and the captain's voice, more urgently, Power on! They've heard us! The words carried no accusation, but Shano realized what they meant. A slip-up. Something left running. Vibrations picked up quickly by detectors of the Uranian space fleet. Shano coughed and heard the ship come to life around him. He pulled himself out of the spasm, cursing Pluto, cursing his diseased, gum-clogged lungs, cursing the Uranium fleet that was trying to prevent his going home, even to die. This was a strange battle. Strange indeed. It was mostly silence. Occasionally, as though from another world, came a brief, curt order. Port guns alert! Then, hush and tension. The deck lurched, and the ship swung this way and that. Maybe dodging, maybe maneuvering, Shano didn't know. He felt the deck lurch. That was all. Fire number seven! He heard the weird scream of a ray gun and felt a constricting tear that seemed to belt the ship like an iron band. This was a battle in space, and out there were Uranian cruisers trying to blast the stardust out of the sky, trying and trying, while the captain dodged and fired back, pitted his skill and knowledge against an enemy Shano couldn't see. He wanted desperately to help the captain break through and get to Earth but he could only cling to the plastic pipes and cough. The ship jounced and slid beneath his feet and was filled with sound. It rocked and rolled. Shano caroomed off the bulkhead. Hold fire! He crawled to his knees on the slippery deck, grabbed the pipes, and pulled himself erect, hand over hand. His eyes came level with the gray metal box behind the pipes. He squinted fascinated at the quivering dial needle. Hey, he said. Stand by. Shano puzzled it out, his mind groping. He wasn't used to thinking, only working with his hands. This box, this needle that had quivered when the ship was closed down. It's over. Chase them off. Ready guns before laying to. Third watch on duty. Shano sighed at the sudden release of tension throughout the space liner Stardust. Smoke spewed from his nostrils. His forehead wrinkled with concentration. Those rumors. Man sells out to Uranus. Gets a nick cut in his jaw. Ever see a man with a nick in his jaw? Watch him. He's up to something. The talk of ignorant men, Shano remembered. He poked behind the pipes and angrily slapped the toggle switches on the box. The captain would only scoff. He had never believed there was a traitor aboard who had planted an electronic signal box, giving away the ship's position. He turned and saw Shano standing smoking. He walked over and nudged Shano, his face dark. Shano blew smoke into the dark face. Old man, said Rourke, what are you doing down here? Shano blinked. Rourke fingered the nick in his jaw, eyes glinting. You're supposed to be in your cabin, he said. Didn't I warn you we'd run into trouble? Shano smoked and contemplated the chunky man, estimated his strength and youth, and felt the anger and frustration mount in him. Devil, he said. He lunged then, clawing. He dug the cigarette into Rourke's flushed face and clung to his body. Rourke howled. He fell backward to the deck, slapping at his blistered face. He thrashed around, and Shano clung to him, battered, pressing the cigarette relentlessly, coughing, cursing the pain in his joints. Shano grasped Rourke's neck with his hands. He twisted the neck with his gnarled hands, strong hands that had worked. He got up when Rourke stopped thrashing. The face was purple and he was dead. Shano shivered. 
he crouched in the passageway, shivering and coughing. A tremendous grinding sounded amidships, loud rending noises of protesting metal. The ship bucked like a hooked fish. Then it was still. An empty clank echoed through the hole. The captain's voice came, almost yelling, Emergency! Emergency! Back to your posts! Engine room! Report! Engine room! Shanel picked himself off the deck, his mind muddled. He coughed and put a cigarette to his lips, flicking a lighter disc jerkily from his pocket. He blew smoke from his nostrils and heard the renewed pounding of feet. What was going on now? Engine room! Your screen is dead! Switch on to loudspeaker system! Engine room! A rasping, grating sound ensued from a grill above Shano's head. Then, a disconnected voice. Get the men out of there. It's useless. Hurry it up. A series of clicks and the heavy voice of the chief engineer. Captain, somebody's smashed the selector chamber. Engine room's full of toxia gas. Shano jumped. He prodded the body on the deck with his toe. The stardust's mechanical voice bellowed. Engine room. It reproduced the captain's heavy breathing and his tired voice. We're about midway to Venus, it said. There were two ships, and we drove them off, but there may be others. They'll be coming back. They know we've been hit. We have to get away, fast. Shano could see the captain in his mind, worried, squared face slick with moisture, shouting into a control room mic, trying to find out what the matter was with his spaceship. The engineer's answer came from the grill. Impossible, sir. Engine room full of toxia gas. Not a suit aboard prepared to withstand it. And we have to keep it in there. Selector filaments won't function without the gas. Our only chance was to put a man in the engine room to repair the broken selector valve rods or keep them running by hand. Blast it, roared the captain. No way of getting in there? Can't you bypass the selector? No. It's the heart of the new cosmic drive, sir. The fuels must pass through the selector valves before entering the tube chambers. Filaments will operate so long as toxia gas is there to burn, and will keep trying to open the valves and compensate for fluctuating engine temperature. But the rod pins have melted down, sir. They're common tungsten steel, and when the rod pulls a valve open, they slip off and drop down useless. It's a mess. If we could only get a man in there, he might lift up the dropped end of the rod and slip it into place each time it fell, and keep the valves working and feeding fuel. The speaker sputtered, and Shano smoked thoughtfully, listening to the talk back and forth between the captain and the engineer. He didn't understand it, but knew that everything was ended. They were broken down in space and would never make Earth. Those Uranian devils would come streaking back, catch them floating helpless, and blast them to bits. And he would never get home to die. Shano coughed and cursed his lungs. Time was when these gum-clogged lungs had saved his life. In the plutonian mines, gas explosions in the tunnels, toxia gas seeping in, burning the men's insides. But with gum-clogged lungs, he had been able to work himself clear, just getting sick where other men would have died, their insides burned out. Shano smoked and thought. They wouldn't even know, he told himself, squirming through the emergency exit into the engine room and sealing it after him. And they wouldn't understand if they did. Pink mist swirled about him. Toxia gas. Shano coughed. He squinted around at the massive, incomprehensible machinery, the guts of the spaceship. Then he saw the shattered, gold-gleaming cylinder, gas hissing from a fine nozzle, and filaments glowing bluish inside it, still working away. He saw five heavy car steel rods hanging useless on melted-down pins, and the slots their pronged ends hooked into. He looked at his hands and shook his head. One try, he said to himself. One try, Shano. One important thing in your life. Here's your opportunity. The toxia gas will get you. It'll kill you at this concentration. 
but you'll last for maybe 12 hours. Another man wouldn't last a minute. Another man's lungs aren't clogged with Juno gum. He grasped a rod and lifted it, sweating under the weight, and slipped the forked end into its slot. Going home to die, he thought. Well, maybe not going home. Couldn't remember what Earth looked like anyway. What was that again? Oh, yeah, just lift them up, and when they drop off, lift them up again. Shano coughed and lifted the heavy rods into position. One jerked back suddenly and smoothly, and something went pop, pop behind him. And machinery whirred. He lifted the rod and slipped it back on. Another jerked, pulled open a large valve, and dropped off. Shano bent and lifted, coughing and coughing. He forgot what he was doing. Mind blank, the way it went when he worked, just rhythmically fell into the job the way a laborer does. He waited for a rod to slip and fall, then lifted it up and slipped it into place, skin sweating, joints shooting pain along his limbs. He heard the machinery working. He heard the high, howling whine of cosmic jets. He, Shano, was making the machinery go. He was running the cosmic drive. A bell clanged somewhere. Engine room! Engine room! We're underway! What happened? Silence. While Shano coughed and made the machinery go, thinking about the Earth he hadn't seen for many years. Captain, the speaker bawled, there's a man in there, working the valve rods. Somebody is in the engine room and the gas isn't, Shano grinned, feeling good, feeling happy. Lifting the heavy steel rods, driving the ship, keeping the jets screaming, and hurtling the liner Stardust toward Venus. He wondered if they'd found Rourke yet. If they could keep going for twelve hours, they would get to Venus. After that, home, he coughed. Hell, who wants to go home? He plucked at his agitated chest, thinking of a whole damn Uranian fleet swooping down on a spot in space, expecting to find a crippled ship there with a spy inside it, and finding nothing because of Shano, a useless old man. Coughing came out all mixed up with laughing. End of Signal Red by Henry Guth Recording by Kevin Crody, Houston, Texas Compensation by C.V. Tench This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Yoganam. Compensation by C. V. Tench. Professor Roxton had disappeared, but in the bottom of the mysterious crystal cage lay the diamond from his ring. Why, John? Involuntarily, I halted at the entrance of my snug bachelor quarters as a flood of light my turning of the switch produced revealed a huddled figure slumped in an easy chair. Aye, sir, it's me. The man got to his feet, gnawed hands rubbing at his eyes. And tis all day that I've been waiting for you, sir. The caretaker said you'd be back soon, so let me in. I must have fell asleep, and no wonder what with the strain and no sleep or rest all last night. Strain? No rest? I stared my bewilderment trying at the same time to conceal the vague apprehension occasioned by the fact that the trusted servitor of my friend Professor Roxton should wait all day for me. Hastily shedding my outer things, I bade him again be seated, sat down facing him and asked him to explain. The old chap peered at me with anxious, wrinkled eyes. "'Tis common enough for him to send me here on messages, sir, but today I've come on my own, because, sir, answering the question in my eyes, I haven't seen sight of him since last night. Why, I began. That's just it, sir. John took the words out of my mouth. For twenty years my wife and me have looked after the professor at the Grange. In all that time he has never been away at night. Whenever he had to come to town, he'd tell us. Most times I would drive him myself in the old car. 
but that was very seldom sir for professor roxton had few interests outside but john i protested is there no other reason for your agitation he might have had an urgent call or gone out for a walk or drive by himself no sir if you'll pardon me sir you're wrong the professor was fixed in his habits he would not go away without telling me think back sir you know the professor as well as me better because you are his friend and i'm only a servant although sir this proudly he always treated me as a friend go on i urged seeing he was not finished well sir a few minutes back you asked me if there was no other reason for my being upset like there is sir you know sir that for more than 20 years the professor has led a retired sort of life the life of a uh, a uh, recluse i suggested that's it sir he only left the grange when he had to he was all wrapped up in some weird like thing he was inventing in all those years sir you were the only visitor who ever went into his laboratory or stayed at the grange for a night and more that is sir until 3 days ago go on i again urged some of his perturbation communicating itself to me the grange sir lying as it does 15 miles from town and back in its own grounds away from the road is in noted by many when strangers do get into the grounds i usually get them out again in short order 3 days ago sir a stranger drew up to the door in a fine car he told me he was wanting to purchase a country home i told him the grange was not for sale and turned him away he was turning his car to leave when my master came out to my surprise sir he invited the stranger in and i'm sure sir because he looked so taken aback like that the stranger had never seen the professor before and after that i asked no feeling decidedly uneasy the stranger sir a mr laytham he called himself stayed on he was in the study with the master last night this morning there was no trace of either of them but good god john i jerked to my feet a fresh dread clutching at my heart what are you trying to get at the professor and mr laytham might possibly have driven away somewhere last night both cars sir the servant answered or in the garage i bolt all the doors in the house myself every night they were still fastened this morning my wife and me searched the house from cellar to garret and hunted all over the grounds we couldn't find a trace of the master or his guest you mean to suggest then i shot at him that two full grown men have completely vanished it's absurd john absurd i paced the floor thinking desperately for a few minutes conscious of the ancient's anxious eyes i half smiled the thing was too ridiculous for anything old john had grown morbid from living away from the outer world also i had to admit that the atmosphere of the grange impregnated as it was with the lethal scientific dabblings of my friend was exactly suited to the conjuring up of unhealthy forebodings in uneducated minds i drove out to the home of my friend at once no doubt i'd find him fit and well he had refused to install a phone so drive it had to be john i stopped my pacing and patted him on the shoulder i'm coming out to the grange at once his face showed his thankfulness i'm sure i went on as i struggled into my coat that we shall find the professor and his guest awaiting us anyway it's time you got back to your wife and had some food i hope to heaven sir that you are right with that we left the building and entered my car although i tried to dispel my fears although i tried to bant to john out of his dread i drove that evening as i had never driven before or since barely 15 minutes later i halted my roadster at the short flight of steps leading to the main door of the grange even as we stepped from the machine the door flung open and an agitated woman hurried towards us she was mary john's wife sir she gripped my arm and stared anxiously into my face tis glad i'm that you have come the grange is a house of death in spite of myself a chill shook my whole body gently handing her to john i strode up the steps at the open doorway i halted the aged couple crowding on my heels the woman still babbling about death i couldn't blame her all day she had been alone in that gloomy rambling old building wondering no doubt why john and i had not returned sooner and gloomy the house was always even when staying there at the professor's request i had found it to be somber and depressing as if there lurked within its walls the shadowy wings of the years old tragedy that had caused my friend to retire to such a godforsaken place and there become absorbed in his scientific experiments even now as i gazed into the dimly lighted hallway 
The air seemed charged with the same malignant something I cannot describe. Pulling myself together, I strode quickly along the corridor and flung open the study door. The lights being full on, one glance sufficed to show me that my friend was not there. Swinging on my heel, the horror I saw in the eyes of the servants, honest, healthy folks, not easily frightened, conveyed itself to me. Somehow, the sight of that room, lights on, chairs drawn up to the burnt-out fire, brought home to me the fact that something serious was amiss. I chided myself for thinking John had been unduly agitated. For a moment, I stood trying to conceal the chill coursing through my veins, puzzling what to do next. I decided to search the house thoroughly. If I found no sign of the professor or his guest, I would call in the police. Fearfully, yet willingly, the aged couple led me from room to room, from attic to basement, until but one place remained, the laboratory. I hesitated for several seconds at the closed door of my friend's workroom. Not that I had never entered the, to a layman's eyes, a weirdly appointed place. I had been in many times with the professor, but this time I dreaded what I might find. Pulling myself together, I gently tried the door. To my horror, it yielded to my touch. Alive, the professor always kept it locked. A new dread assailed me, as flinging the door wide open, I blinked in the sudden glare of powerful globes. Someone had left the lights full on. Horrified, I stood and stared, knowing by their heavy breathing that the aged couple were also staring with fright-widened eyes. Afraid of what? I did not know. I only knew that the atmosphere had become even more sinister. I knew that something dreadful had taken place in that room. Trembling with consternation, I forced myself to take a few steps forward. Then I again stared about me. At one end of the large room, something shone brightly in the glow of the lights. Slowly, I walked across to examine it. It appeared to be a glass case, almost like a showcase, about eight feet square and seven feet in height. With the mechanical actions of mentally distraught, I walked all around it. Not the slightest sign of an entrance could I see. The fact intrigued me. I tapped lightly on the highly polished surface with my fingers. It rang to my touch like a cut glass. Through the transparent surface, I could see John and his wife. They were watching me furtively, wondering, no doubt, why I lingered. As I looked at them, John suddenly lumbered up to the case on the opposite side. Dropping to his knees, he stared. Turning an imploring gaze to me, he pointed. His lips moved soundlessly. I followed the pointing finger with my eyes, gasped at what I saw. Near the center of the cage, on the floor constructed of the same crystalline substance, something glittered, its brilliance almost dazzling, as the light rays struck it. My face pressed close to the cold outer surface of the structure. My shocked intelligence gradually realized what that small sparkling object was. It was a magnificent diamond, and the professor had always worn a diamond ring. In a sudden frenzy of horror, I powered my way around the cage to where John still knelt. As I reached him, he jerked his head in a numb way as he croaked. It's a diamond, sir. The professor's. But how? I implored. How can it be? There's no way into this thing. Perhaps he was working here and the stone came loose from its setting. He couldn't have dropped it after the cage was completed. It's just a diamond, sir, intoned the old man dully. I know it is. Then a sudden, unreasoning terror filled me. I shrank away from that shining box. It seemed to be mocking me, gloatingly, malevolently. Quickly, I threw out the aged couple. Let us get out of here. Now, at once. They needed no second urging. I knew that they felt as I felt. The laboratory was a sepulchre. Five minutes later, I was guiding my car over the narrow road to town. I did not pause until I drew up at a police headquarters. I suppose my appearance was distraught, for I was ushered into the presence of the chief without delay. In a few moments, I had poured out my story. He listened with a polite calmness. I found almost maddening. Leaning back in his chair, he reviewed audibly the facts. Some twenty-odd years ago, your friend, Professor Roxton, married. He was so absorbed in the pursuit of some weird invention that he neglected his bride. She ran away with another man. This man deserted her and disappeared. The professor found her many months later in desperate health. Shortly afterwards, she died. Your friend tried to trail the man but failed. Shocked and saddened beyond measure, he retired to a place known as a grunge. He suddenly straightened up in his seat and pointed at me a thick forefinger. How long have you known Professor Roxton? About ten years, I answered. What was he trying to invent? I don't know, I replied. And yet you had his confidence in other matters? 
But what has all this to do with finding out what has become of my friend? I blurted out, perhaps every moment counts. A lot. The chief eyed me in a way I did not like. Solely because your friend has not been seen by his servants for nearly 24 hours, merely because you saw what you believed to be his diamond in some kind of a glass compartment in his laboratory, you come here as distraught as a man who has something terrible on his mind. Why? I can't say. I shifted uneasily under the direct stare. Somehow, I feel that something dreadful has happened to my friend. We do not go by feelings. The chief got to his feet. But you have told me enough to warrant action. I want you to guide me and a couple of men to this house. Please wait here until I return. He left the room. Sitting there, awaiting his return, I tried to ponder the matter reasonably. After all, perhaps the chief was right. Merely because the professor had been absent for a few hours and I had seen what I thought to be his diamond in the laboratory, I had worked myself into perfect fever of anxiety. I almost smiled to myself. In that business-like office, the whole affair did seem absurd. After all, the professor did not have to answer to his servants for his actions. Heavy footsteps announcing the chief's return caused me to rise to my feet. A few minutes later, in company with the three officers, I was driving again towards the Grange. We made the return journey in almost complete silence. Occasionally, the chief would shoot a question at me, but the night air cooling my fevered brain, my replies were guarded. He realized that fact, for I felt his eyes upon me all the way. What was going on behind that broad forehead, I wondered. Then we reached the Grange. As we mounted the steps, John, his wife, herding behind him, flung wide the door. He answered the question in my eyes with a negative shake of his head and the words, Nothing fresh, sir. The chief eyed him keenly, then curtly bade him lead the way to the laboratory. John hung back, his face blanched. I can't, sir, he faltered. The chief turned to me, and although I wanted to follow John's example, although the atmosphere of the house had again filled me with an unshakable dread, I led the way, standing back at the door to allow the officers to enter first. With calculating gaze, the chief slowly took in every detail of the stone apartment. He turned to me. What is there here to be afraid of? I pointed hesitatingly towards the crystalline cage. The chief and his men strode across to it. You don't know how to open this? The chief shot at me after a brief examination. No, I replied. It was not here on my last visit. When was that? Some two or three months ago, I answered. My work occasions much travelling on my part. The chief and his men turned again to the cage, talking in undertones. He turned again to me. You notice that this thing is built in sections. One of them must be movable. Perhaps... He paused as his eyes fell upon some wires and tubes that trailed across the floor from underneath the cage to a switchboard fastened to the wall. Perhaps, he repeated, it's worked from that board. He crossed over, stared thoughtfully at the shining levers for some seconds and moved one slightly. The result was astounding. All four of us stared with unbelieving eyes as slowly, without the faintest sound, a section of one wall slid inwards, as if guided by invisible tracks on floor and ceiling. Guess that's enough for now. With the words, the chief backed away, almost timidly, I thought, from the switchboard and walked to the cage. For a moment, he hesitated, but he entered and emerged with a sparkling object in his hand. It is the professor's, I choked, crowding close to him. How do you know? He shot back. All unset stones look pretty much alike. I just know, was all I could falter. You just know? The chief sat down on a stool and regarded me searchingly. Mr. Thornton, when I started out with you, I thought I was on a wild goose chase or the trail of a confession. You looked exactly like a man who had either committed a serious crime or was getting over a bad drunk. I feel sure now, he again regarded the diamond, that your story was not the product of an alcohol-crazed brain. Come on, he lurched to his feet and grasped me by the shoulder. Come through. Without answering, I wrenched myself free. Over my shoulder, I saw one of the policemen at the door. In the hand of the other, a revolver suddenly appeared. Good God! I glared in bewilderment from one to another. Was I going mad? Surely this was some awful nightmare. What had I said to make them suspect me of having committed a revolting crime? Sit down. The command came from the chief. Mechanically, I found a stool and obeyed him. Hold your stations, boys, and listen carefully, he ordered his men. 
Then he turned to me. Professor Broxton was a wealthy man without kith or kin? Yes. Do you know the nature of his will? Yes. Chilled to the heart, I felt the circumstantial net tightening. What is its nature? This house and an annuity to John and his wife, I explained, the residue of his wealth to me. Hmm. The chief stared at me piercingly. And how has business been with you lately? Damn the man. What right had he to put me through the third degree? I felt my state of dazed horror slowly giving way to anger. I glanced around. The pistol still menaced. The man at the door had not moved. It was useless to try and evade the questions. For the past year, I replied, business has been very poor. In fact, the professor advanced me some money. Hmm. Again that irritating non-committal grunt. The chief turned in his seat and stared thoughtfully at his crystalline cage. And you don't know what the professor was trying to invent? Only its nature, I began. Ha! Huh, that's better. Why didn't you tell me that before? The chief leaned forward. Well, I explained. The whole thing seems absurd. When the professor told me how his married life had been broken up, he told me that at that time he reached the utmost depths of human suffering. Absolute zero, he called it. Ha! Huh. The experiments he indulged in, I continued, trying to hide the shiver pimpling my flesh were to produce an actual state of absolute zero. It is years since he told me this. I had almost forgotten it. And exactly what is an absolute zero? The chief's eyes never left mine. Well, I protested. Please understand that I also am a layman in these matters. According to my friend, an absolute zero has been the dream of scientists for ages. Once upon a time it was attained, but the secret became lost. And exactly what is an absolute zero? Curse the man. I could have struck him down for the chilling level of his tone. I forced myself to go on, realizing that I was damning myself at every step. An absolute zero is a cold so intense it will destroy flesh, bone and tissue. Remove them, my voice goes in spite of myself, leaving absolutely no trace. No trace. Something attracted my eyes. The chief had opened his hand. The diamond there flashed and sparkled as if mocking me. I pulled myself together and went on. It all comes back to me now. One day I came out here and found the professor terribly distraught. He told me that with the aid of electric currents, he had been able to invent the absolute zero, but he could not invent a container. Why? Those eyes continued to bore into mine. Because, remember it is years since he told me this, there was difficulty in controlling the power. Besides destroying living things, it would destroy bricks and mortar, stone and iron. Only one substance it could not wipe out, Crystalline of diamond hardness. I know now. I jumped to my feet and grabbed the chief's arm. I know now what he meant. Fool! Fool! Why did I not think of it before? This, I swung towards the cage, is compensation. Almost panting in my eagerness, I went on. My friend told me that the law of compensation would atone to him for the tragedy of his youth. Absolute zero in suffering would be atoned for by a real state of absolute zero. Chief, I whirled on him. Don't you understand? This is the perfected dream of my friend. It is the absolute zero. Hmm. Plausible, but not convincing. I slumped back at the officer's words. That does not explain the professor's disappearance. Even if it did, what about Mr. Latham? And don't forget this contrivance is worked from outside. We found the diamond inside. Of course, he might have placed it there himself to test the machine, he concluded. Of course, that's it, I commenced, but I regretted the words when I saw suspicion flicker again in the chief's eyes. Lamely I finished, and he has probably rushed off in an ecstasy of triumph to acquaint professional colleagues. Without unlocking any doors or taking a car, eh? Mr. Thornton, the chief stood up and regarded me sternly. As a sensible man, don't you think yourself that your story is a bit thin? The professor has disappeared. Here is a strange-looking case which you say is an absolute zero container. Whether you know or are just jumping at conclusions remains to be proved. But even if it is, do you think that, after perfecting such a tremendous invention, the professor would commit suicide? On the contrary, I gasped. My friend was a man of gentle, kindly disposition, but strong purpose. I should think his first action on attaining his life's ambition would be to notify me, his closest friend. 
and he didn't. Every word condemned me and roused me to retaliate. Chief, I know enough of the law to know that before you can try a man for murder, you must prove that murder has been committed. I grinned savagely. You must have the corpus delicti. Go ahead, find my friend or his remains, or else withdraw your charges. I grinned again with shocked mirthlessness. Then I buried my head in my hands. I had called in the police to help find the professor and they had only blundered around and asked a lot of stupid questions. The chief had practically accused me of murder, something I knew he could not prove, yet feared he might. Because I had told the chief of the locked doors and unused cards, he had confined his investigations to the house itself. He interrupted my thoughts. Mr. Thornton, I am going back to town. You will remain here with my men. I advise you to get some sleep, as I shall not be able to carry out certain investigations until the morning. One of my men will spend his time searching the house and patrolling the grounds. The other one will stay here with you. He turned away, whispered some instructions to his men, and followed by one of them, silently left the laboratory. I started to protest, tried to follow him. The man at the door stopped me. Silently, almost grimly, he indicated a narrow cot at one end of the room. For a moment, I hesitated, feeling the man's eyes upon me. Sleep on my dead. I felt sure he was dead. Friends caught. Sleep in that fearful place. My whole being crawled with horror. I turned again to the man. His features were unyielding. Perhaps this was more third degree. Limp with weakness and weariness, I dragged my lagging feet towards the cot. As long as I live, I shall never forget my awakening. A uniformed figure, the chief, shaking me by the shoulder. Two other uniformed men silently watching. I sat up and gazed about me dazedly. Bright sunlight streamed through the windows. A stray gleam struck the cage. I shrank back trembling and yet I had slept soundly. Mr. Thornton, the chief said, I have serious news for you. I have positive proof your friend is dead. Dear God, the exclamation was wrung from me as recollection returned with a rush. Where? You can't have... Here, he thrust a bundle of letters into my hands. You acted so strangely last night, you caused me to suspect you of a serious crime. Also, you overlooked several important points. You got back from a trip only last night. Last night? Surely, it was years. You had left instructions to have your mail forwarded. The level voice went on. These letters were evidently one day behind you. I picked them up at your rooms this morning. I took the liberty of opening them. Read this one. He selected it. With trembling fingers, I extracted from the envelope a single written page. I recognized the handwriting as the professor's. I read with feverish intensity, each single word burning itself into my consciousness. Dear Thornton, I am writing this in anticipation. I will see that it is mailed when my plans are completed. Too late, dear friend, for you to attempt with the best intentions in the world to frustrate them. You will perhaps recall that many years ago, when I gave you my full confidence, I told you that I felt sure that the law of compensation would atone in some measure for my loss. Thornton, old friend, I believe that in more ways than one, my hour has arrived. Two days ago, I completed the absolute zero. But even better. A man called here today. Although he did not recognize me, I saw through the veneer of added years with ease. Fate, call it what you will, my visitor is the man who wrecked my happiness. Under pretext, I shall detain him. I shall induce him to enter the crystalline cage. I have already arranged a dual control, which the power will destroy when I apply it from the inside of the cage. Please destroy the cage. It will have brought compensation to me before you read this. Goodbye, dear friend. Roxton I apologize, Mr. Thornton. The chief offered a hand, which I clutched in mingled sorrow and relief. The world had lost a genius. I had lost a dear friend. But he was right. It was compensation. The End of Compensation by C. V. Tench Service with a Smile by Charles L. Fortenay this is a LibriVox recording. 
All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Dale Grothman. Herbert was truly a gentleman robot. The lady's slightest wish was his command. Service with a Smile by Charles L. Fortenay. Herbert bowed with a mute clank, indicating he probably needed oiling somewhere, and presented Alice with a perfect martini on a silver tray. He stood holding the tray a while, a white, permanent porcelain smile on his smooth metal face, as Alice sipped the drink and grimaced. "'It's a good martini, Herbert,' she said. "'Thank you. But, damn it, I wish you didn't have that everlasting smile.' I am very sorry, Miss Alice, but I am unable to alter myself in any way," replied Herbert in his polite, hollow voice. He retired to a corner and stood impassively, still holding the tray. Herbert had found a silver deposit and made the tray. Herbert had found sand and made the cocktail glass. Herbert had combined God knew what atmospheric and earth chemicals to make what tasted like gin and vermouth, and Herbert had frozen the ice to chill it. Sometimes, said Terra wistfully, it occurs to me it would be better to live in a mud hut with a real man than in a mansion with Herbert. The four women lolled comfortably in the living room of their spacious house, as luxurious as anything any of them would have known on distant earth. The rugs were thick, the furniture was overstuffed, the paintings on the walls were aesthetic and inspiring, the shelves were filled with book tapes and music tapes. Herbert had done it all, except the book tapes and music tapes, which had been salvaged from the wrecked spaceship. "'Do you suppose we'll ever escape from this best of all possible manless worlds?' said Betsy, fluffing her thick black hair with her fingers and inspecting herself with a Herbert-made mirror. "'I don't see how,' answered Alice, glumly. "'That atmospheric track would wreck any other ship just as it wrecked ours. And the same magnetic layer prevents any radio message from getting out. No, I'm afraid we're a colony. A colony perpetuates itself,' reminded sharp-faced Marguerite acidly. We aren't a colony without men. They were not the prettiest four women in the universe, nor the youngest. The prettiest women, and the youngest, did not go to space. But they were young enough and healthy enough, or they could not have gone to space. It had been a year and a half now, an Earth year and a half, on a nice little planet revolving around a nice little yellow sun. Herbert, the robot, was obedient and versatile, and had provided them with a house, food, clothing, anything they wished created out of the raw elements of earth and air and water. But the bones of the men who had been a space with these four ladies lay moldering in the wreckage of their spaceship, and Herbert could not create a man. Herbert did not have to have direct orders, and he tried once to create a man when he overheard them wishing for one. They had buried the corpse, perfect in every detail, except that it had never been alive. "'It's been a hot day,' said Alice, fanning her brow. "'I wish it would rain.' Silently, Herbert moved from his corner and went out the door. Marguerite gestured after him with a bitter little laugh. "'It'll rain this afternoon,' she said. I don't know how Herbert does it, maybe with silver iodide, but it'll rain. Wouldn't it have been simpler to get him to air-condition the house, Alice? That's a good idea, said Alice thoughtfully. We should have had him do it before. Herbert had not quite completed the task of air-conditioning the house when the other spaceship crashed. They all rushed out to the smoking site the four women, and Herbert. It was a tiny scout ship, and its single occupant was alive. 
He was unconscious, but he was alive, and he was a man. They carted him back to the house, tenderly, and put him to bed. They hovered over him like four hands over a single chick, waiting and watching for him to come out of his coma, while Herbert scurried about creating and administering the necessary medicines. "'He'll live,' said Therma happily. Therma had been a space nurse. "'He'll be on his feet and walking around in a few weeks.' "'A man!' murmured Betsy with something like awe in her voice. "'I could almost believe Herbert brought him here in answer to our prayers.' "'Oh, girls!' said Alice. "'We have to realize that a man brings problems, as well as possibilities.' There was a matter-of-fact hardness in her tone, which almost masked the quiver behind it. There was a definite note of competition there, which had not been heard on this planet before. "'What do you mean?' asked Thera. "'I know what she means,' said Marguerite, and the new hardness came naturally to her. "'She means which one of us gets him.' Betsy, the youngest, gasped and her mouth rounded in a startled O. Thera blinked, as though she had come out of a daze. "'That's right,' said Alice. "'Do we draw straws, or do we let him choose?' "'Couldn't we wait?' suggested Betsy timidly. "'Couldn't we wait until he gets well?' Herbert came in with a new thermometer and poked it into the unconscious man's mouth. He stood by the bed, waiting patiently. "'No, I don't think we can,' said Alice. "'I think we ought to have it all worked out and agreed on, so there won't be any dispute about it.' "'I say, let's draw straws,' said Marguerite. Marguerite's face was thin, and she had a skinny figure. Betsy, the youngest, opened her mouth, but Thea forestalled her. "'We are not on earth.' she said firmly in her soft mellow voice we don't have to follow terrestrial customs and we shouldn't there's only one solution that will keep everybody happy all of us and the man and what is that asked marguerite dryly polygamy of course he must belong to us all betsy shuddered but surprisingly she nodded that's well and good agreed marguerite but we have to agree that no one of us will be favored above the others he has to understand that from the start that's fair said alice pursing her lips yes that's fair but i agree with marguerite he must be divided equally among the four of us chattering over the details the hard competitiveness vanished from their tones the four left the sick room to prepare supper. After supper they went back in. Herbert stood by the bed, the eternal smile of service on his metal face. As always, Herbert had not required a direct command to accede to their wishes. The man was divided into four quarters, one for each of them. It was a very neat surgical job. The End of Service with a Smile by Charles L. Fortenay The Man Who Was Dead by Thomas H. Knight This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Read by Yoganan The Man Who Was Dead by Thomas H. Knight I was dead. It was a wicked night, the night I met the man who had died. A bitter, heart-numbing night of weird, shrieking wind and flying snow. A few black hours I will never forget. Well, Jerry, lad, my mother said to me as I pushed back from the table and started for my sheepskin coat and the lantern in the corner of the room. Surely you're not going out a night like this? Goodness gracious, Jerry, it's not fit. Can't help it, mother, I replied. Got to go. You've never seen me miss a Saturday night yet, have you now? No. But then, I've never seen a night like this for years either. 
Jerry, I am really afraid. You may freeze before you even get as far as... Ah, come on, mother, I argued. They'd guy me to death if I didn't sit in with the gang tonight. They'd chaff me because it was too cold for me to get out. But I'm no pampered sissy, you know, and I want to see... Yes, she retorted bitingly. I know, you want to go and bask in the elegant company. Our store is just as good as the one down at the dirty old store, continued my persistent and anxious parent. And it's certainly not very flattering to think that you leave us on a night like this too. Who'll be there anyway? Oh, the usual five or six, I suppose. I answered as I adjusted the wick of my lantern, hearing as I did the snarl and cut of the wind through the evergreens in the yard. That black-whiskered sphinx hammersly, will he be there? Yes, he'll be there, I'm pretty sure. Hmm, she exclaimed, her expression now carrying all the contempt for my judgment and taste she intended it should. Button your coat up good around your neck then, if you must go to see your precious Hammersley and the rest of them. Have you ever heard that man say anything yet? Does he speak at all, Jerry? Then a gentle mind, not at all accustomed to hard thoughts or contemptuous remarks, quickly changed. Funny thing about that fellow, she mused. He's got something on his mind. Don't you think so, Jerry? Yes, yes I do. And I've often wondered what it could be. He certainly is a queer stick. Got to admit that. Always brooding. Good fellow, all right. And for a sphinx, as you call him, likeable. But I wonder what is eating him. What do you suppose it could be, Jerry boy? Questioned mother, following me to the door. The woman of her now completely forgetting her recent criticisms and perhaps a rough night her son was about to step into. Do you suppose the poor chap has uh, a broken heart or something like that? A girl somewhere who jilted him? Or maybe he loves someone he has no right to, she finished excitedly, the plates in her hand rattling. Maybe it's worse than that, I venture. Perhaps I have no right to say it, but perhaps, and I've often thought, there's a killing he wants to forget and can't. I heard my mother's sharp little, oh, as I shut the door behind me and the warmth and comfort of the room away. Outside, it was worse than the whistle of the wind through the trees had led me to expect. Black as pitch it was and cold as blazes. For the first moment or two, though, I liked the feel of the challenge of the night and the racing elements, was even a little glad I had added to the dare of the blackness the thought of Hammersley and his killing. But I had not gone far before I was wishing I did not have to save my face by putting in an appearance at the store that night. Every Saturday night, with the cows comfortable in their warm barn and my own supper over, I was in the habit of taking my place on the keg or box behind the red hot stove in Pruett's store. Tonight, all the snow was being hurled clear of the fields to block the roads full between the old zigzag fences. The wind met me in great pushing gusts, and while it flung itself at me, I would hang against it, snow to my knees, until the blow had gone along, when I could plunge forward again. I was glad when I saw the lights of the store, glad when I was inside. They met me with mock applause for my pluck in facing the night, but for all their sham flattery, I was pleased I had come, proud, I must admit, that I had been able to plough my heavy way through the drifts to reach them. I saw at a glance that my friends were all there, and I saw too that there was a strange man present. A very tall man he was, gaunt and awkward, as he leaned into the angle of the two counters, his back to a dusty showcase. He attracted my attention at once. Not merely because he appeared so long and pointed and skinny, but because of all ridiculous things in that frozen country, he wore a hard derby hat. If he had not been such a queer character, it would have been laughable, but as it was, it was creepy. For the man beneath that hard hat was about as queer a looking character as I've ever seen. I, I supposed he was a visitor at the store or a friend of one of my friends and that in a little while I would be introduced. But I was not. I took my place in behind the stove, feeling at once, though I am far from being unsociable usually, that the man was an intruder and would spoil the evening. But despite his cold, dampening presence, we were soon at it, hammer and tongs, discussing the things that were discussed behind hospitable stores in country stores on bad nights. But I could never lose sight of the fact that the stranger standing there, silent as the grave, was to say the least, a queer one. 
Before long, I was sure he was no friend or guest of anyone there, and that he not only cast a pall over me, but over all of us. I did not like it, nor did I like him. Perhaps it would have just been as well after all I thought I had heeded my mother and stayed home. Jet Council was the one who, innocently enough, started the thing that changed the evening that had begun so badly into a nightmare. Cherry, he said, leaning across to me, thinking of you this afternoon, reading an article about reincarnation. Remember, we were arguing it last week? Well, this guy, whoever he was, I forgot, believes in it. Says it so. That people do come back. With this opening shot, Jed sat back to await my answer. I like these arguments and I'd like to bear my share in them, but now, instead of immediately answering the challenge, I looked around to see if any other of our circle were going to answer Jed. Then, deciding it was up to me, I shrugged off the strange feeling the man in the corner had cast over me and prepared to view my opinions. That's just that fellow's belief, Jed, I said. And just as he's got his, so have I mine. And on this subject at least, I claim my opinion is as good as anybody's. I was just getting nicely started and a little forgetting my distaste for the man in the corner when the fellow himself interrupted. He left his leaning place and came creaking across the floor to a circle around the store. I say he came creaking, for as he came, he did creak. Shoes, I naturally, almost unconsciously decided, though the crazy notion was in my mind that the cracking I heard did sound like bones and joints and sinews badly in need of oil. The stranger sat his groaning self down among us on a board lying across a nail keg and an old chair. Only from the corner of my eye did I see his movement, being friendly enough, despite my dislike, not to allow too marked notice of his attempt to be sociable seem inhospitable on my part. I was about to start again with my argument when Sage Pierce, sitting closest to the newcomer, deliberately got up from the bench and went to the counter, telling Pruett as he went that he had to have some sugar. It was all a farce, a pretext I knew. I have known Sage for years and had never known him before to take upon himself the buying of his wife's kitchen. Sage simply would not sit beside the man. At that, I could keep my eyes from the stranger no longer, and the next moment, I felt my heart turn over within me. Then, lie still. I've seen walking skeletons in circuses, but never such a man as the one who was then sitting at my right hand. Those sideshow men were just lean in comparison to the fellow who had invaded a Saturday night club. His thighs and his legs and his knees sticking sharply into his trousers looked like pieces of inchboard. His shoulders and his chest seemed as flat and as sharp as his legs. The sight of the man shocked me. I sprang to my feet, thoroughly frightened. I could not see much of his face, sitting there in the dark as he was, with his back to the yellow light, but I could make out enough of it to know that it was in keeping with the rest of him. In a moment or two, realizing my childishness, I had fought down my fear and pretending that a scorching of my leg had caused my hurried movement, I sat down again. None of the others said a word, each waiting for me to continue and to break the embarrassing silence. Hammersley, black whiskered, a sphinx, as my mother had called him, watched me closely. Hating myself not a little bit for actually being the sissy I had boasted I was not, I spoke hurriedly, loudly, to cover my confusion. No, Sir Jed, I said, taking up my argument. When a man's dead, he's dead. There's no bringing him back, like that I broke claim. The old art may be only hitting about once in every hundred times, and if they catch it right at the last stroke, they may bring it back then. But once she is stopped, Jed, she is stopped for good. Once the pulse is gone and life has flickered out, it's out. And it doesn't come back in any form at all, not in this world. I was glad when I had said it, thereby asserting myself and drowning my foolish fear of the man whose eyes I felt burning into me. I did not turn to look at him, but all the while I felt his gimlety eyes digging into my brain. Then he spoke. And though he sat right next to me, his voice sounded like a moan from afar off. It was the first time we had heard this thing that once may have been a voice and that now sounded like a groan from a closely nailed coffin. He reached a hand toward my knee to enforce his words, but I jerked away. So you don't believe a man can come back from the grave, hey? He grated. 
believe that once a man's heart is still it's stopped for good hey well you're all wrong sunny all wrong you believe these things i know them his interference his condescension his whole hatefulness angered me i could now no longer control my feeling oh you know do you i sneered on such a subject as this you are entitled to know are you don't make me laugh i finished insultingly i was aroused and i'm a big fellow with no reason to fear ordinary men yes i know came back his echoing scratching voice how do you know maybe you have been yes i have he answered his voice breaking to a squeak take a good look at me gentlemen a good look he knew now that he held the center of the stage that the moment was his slowly he raised an arm to remove that ridiculous hat again i jumped to my feet for as his coat sleeve slipped from his forearm i saw nothing but bone supporting his hand and the hand that then bared his head was a skeleton hand slowly the hat was lifted but as quickly as light six able bodied men were on their feet and half way to the door before we realized the cowardliness of it we forced ourselves back inside the store very slowly all of us rather ashamed of a ridiculous and childlike fear but it was all enough to make the blood curdle with that live dead thing sitting there by our fire his face and skull were nothing but bone and the eyes deeply sunk into their sockets the dull brown skin like parchment in its tautness drawn and shriveled down onto the nose and jaw there were no cheeks just hollows the mouth was a sharp slit between the flat nose he was hideous come back and i'll tell you my yarn he mocked the slit that was his mouth opening a little to show us the empty blackened gums i've been dead once he went on getting a lot of satisfaction from the weirdness of the lie and from a fear and i came back come and sit down and i'll explain why i'm this living skeleton we came back slowly and as i did i slipped my hand into my outside pocket where i had a revolver i put my finger in on the trigger and got ready to use the vicious little thing i was on edge and torn to pieces completely by the sight of the man and i doubt not that had he made a move towards me my frayed nerves would have plugged him full of lead i eyed my friends they were in no better way than i was fright and horror stood on each face hamersley was burst his hands were twitching his eyes were like bright glass his face bleached and drawn i've quite a yarn to tell went on the skeleton in his awful voice i've had quite a life a full life i've taken my fun and my pleasure wherever i could maybe you'll call me selfish and greedy but i always used to believe that a man only passed this way once just like you believe he nodded to me his neck muscles and jaws creaking Six years ago, I came up into this country and got a job on a farm. He went on, settling into his story. Just an ordinary job, but I liked it because the farmer had a pretty little daughter of about 16 or 17 and as easy as could be. You may not believe it, but you can still find dames green enough to fall for the right story. This one did. I told her I was only out there for a time for my health, that I was rich back in the city with a fine home and everything. she believed me little fool he chuckled as he said it and my anger mounting with his every devilish word made the finger on the trigger in my pocket take a tighter crook to itself i asked her to skip with me the droning went on made her a lot of great promises and she fell for it his dry jaw bones clanked and chattered as if he enjoyed the beastly recital of his achievement while we sat gaping at him believing either that the man must be mad or that we were the mad ones or dreaming we slipped away one night continued the beast went to the city to a punk hotel for three weeks we stayed there then one morning i told her i was going out for a shave i was i got the shave but i didn't thought it worthwhile to tell her i wouldn't be back well she got back to the farm some way though i don't know what i shouted springing before him what you mean you left her there after you had taken her you left her and here you sit crowing over it 
gloating, boasting. Why you? I lived in a rough country, associated with rough men, heard their vicious language, but seldom used a strong word myself. But as I stood over that monster, utterly hating the beastly thing, all the wild oaths and prickly language of the countryside, no doubt buried in some unused cell in my brain, spilled from my tongue upon him. When I had lashed him as fiercely as I was able, I cried, "Why don't you come at me? Didn't you hear what I called you, you beast? I'd like to riddle you!" I shouted, drawing my gun. "Oh, sit down!" he jeered, waving his rattling hand at me. "You ain't heard a thing yet. Let me finish." Well, she got back to the farm some way or another, and something over a year later, I wandered into this country again too. I never could explain just why I came back. It was not altogether to see the girl. My father was a little bit of a man, and I began to remember what a meek and weak sheep he was. I got into my head that it would be fun to go back to his farm and rub it in. So I came. My father was trying out a new corn planter right at the back door when I rounded the house and walked towards him. Then I saw at once that I had made a mistake. When he put his eyes on me, his face went white and hard. He came down from the seat of that machine like a flash, and took hurried steps in the direction of a double-barrelled gun leaning against the woodshed. They always were troubled with hawks and kept a gun handy. But there was an axe nearer to me than the gun was to him. I had to work fast, but I made it all right. I grabbed the axe, jumped at him as he reached for the gun, and swung once. His wife and the girl too saw it. Then I turned and ran. The gaunt brute before us slowly crossed one groaning knee above the other. We were all sitting again now. The perspiration rolled down my face. I held my gun trained upon him, and though I now believed he was totally mad because of a certain ring of truth in that empty voice, I sat fascinated. I looked at Seth. His jaw was hanging loose, his eyes bulging. Hamersley's mouth was set in a tight, clenched line. His eyes like a fire in his blue, drawn face. I could not see the others. The telephone caught me, continued a ghastly storyteller, and in no time at all I was convicted and the date set for hanging. When my time was pretty close, a doctor, a scientist fellow, came to see me who said, Blaggett, you are slated to die. How much will you sell me your body for? If he didn't say it that way, he meant just that. And I said, Nothing. I have no one to leave money to. What do you want with my body? And he told me, I believe I can bring you back to life and health. Provided they don't snap your neck when they drop you. Oh, you're one of those guys, are you? I said then. All right, hop to it. If you can do it, I'll be much obliged. Then I can go back on that farm and do a little more axe swinging. Again came his horrible chuckle. Again I mopped my brow. So we made our plans. He went on, pleased with our discomfiture and our despising of him. Next day, some chap came to see me, pretending he was my brother, and I carried out my part of it by cursing him at first and then begging him to give me a decent burial. So he went away, and I suppose received permission to get me right after I was cut down. And there was a fence built around the scaffold they had ready for me and the party I was about to fling, and they had some militia there too. The crowd seemed quiet enough till they led me out. Then their buzzing sounded like a hive of bees getting all stirred up. Then a few loud voices, then shouts. Some rocks came flying at me after that, and it looked to me as though the hanging would not be so gentle a party after all. I tell you, I was afraid. I wished it was over. The mob pushed against the fence and flattened it out, coming over it like waves over a beach. The soldiers fired into the air, but still they came, and I, I ran up, onto the scaffold. It was safer. As he said this, he chuckled loudly. I'll bet he laughed. That's the first time a guy ever ran into the noose for the safety of it. The mob came only to the foot of the scaffold, though, from where they seemed satisfied to see the law take its course. The sheriff was nervous, so cut up that he only made a fling at tying my ankles, just dropped a rope around my wrists. He was like me; he wanted to get it over, and the crowd on its way. Then he put the rope around my neck, stepped back, and shot the trap. Zam. No time for a prayer, or for me to laugh at the offer, or a last word or anything. I felt the floor give, 
felt myself shoot through. Smack! My weight on the end of the rope hit me behind the ears like a mallet. Everything went black. Of course, it would have been just my luck to get a broken neck out of it and give the scientists no chance to revive me. But after a second or two, or a minute, or it could have been an hour, the blackness went away enough to allow me to know I was hanging on the end of the rope, kicking, fighting, choking to death. My tongue swelled. My face and head and heart and body seemed ready to burst. Slowly, I went to a deep mist that I knew then was the mist. Then, then I was off floating in the air over the heads of the crowd, watching my own hanging. I saw them give that slowly swinging carcass on the end of its rope, time enough to thoroughly die. Then, from my aerial unseen watching place, I saw them cut it, me, down. They tried the pulse of the body that had been mine. They examined my staring eyes. Then I heard them pronounce me dead. The fools. I had known I was dead for a minute or two by that time. Else, how could my spirit have been gone from the shell and be out floating around over their heads? He paused here as he asked his question, his head turning on its dry and creaking neck to include us all in his query. But none of us spoke. We were dreaming it all, of course. Over mad, we thought. In just a short while went on the skeleton. My brother came, driving slowly in for my body. With no special hurry, he loaded me onto his little truck and drove easily away. But once clear of the crowd, he pushed his foot down on the gas and in five more minutes, with me hovering all the while alongside of him, mind you, floating along as though I had been a bird all my life, we turned into the driveway of a summer home. The scientific guy met him. They carried me into the house into a fine fetid laboratory. My dead body was placed on a table. A huge knife ripped my clothes from me. Quickly, the loads from ten or a dozen hypodermic syringes were shot into different parts of my naked body. Then it was carried across a room to what looked like a large glass bottle, a vase with an opening in the top. Through this door, I was lowered, my body being held upright by straps in there for that purpose. The door to the opening was then placed in position and by means of an acetylene torch and some easily melting glass, the door was sealed tight. So there stood my poor old body, ready for the experiment to bring it back to life. And as my new self floated around above the scientist and his helper, I smiled to myself, for I was sure the experiment would prove a failure, even though I now knew that the sheriff's haste had kept him from placing a rope tight at my throat and had saved me a broken neck. I was dead. All that was left of me now was my spirit or soul, and that was swimming and floating about above their heads with not an inclination in the world to have a thing to do with the husk of the man I could clearly see through the glass of the bell. They turned on a huge battery of ultraviolet rays then, continued the hollow droning of the man who had been hanged, which, as a scientist had explained to me well in prison, acting upon the contents of the syringes, by that time scattered through my whole body, was to renew the spark of life within the dead thing hanging there. Through a tube, and by means of a valve entering the glass vase in the top, the scientist then admitted a dense white gas. So thick was it that in a moment or two, my body's transparent coffin appeared to be full of a liquid as white as milk. Electricity then revolved my cage around so that my body was ensured a complete and even exposure to the rays of the green and violet lamps. And while all this silly stuff was going on, around and around the laboratory I floated, confident of the complete failure of the whole thing, yet determined to see it through, if for no other reason than to see the discomfiture and disappointment that this mere man was bound to experience. You see, I was already looking back upon earthly mortals as being inferior, and now as I waited for this proof, I was all the while fighting off a new urge to be going elsewhere. Something was calling me, beckoning me to be coming into the full spirit world. But I wanted to see this wise earth guy fail. For a little while, conditions stayed the same within that glass. So thick was the liquid gas in there at first that I could see nothing. Then it began to clear and I saw to my surprise that the milky gas was disappearing because it was being forced in by the rays from the lights in through the ports into the body itself. As though my form was sucking it in like a sponge. The scientist and his helper were tense and taut with excitement. And suddenly my comfortable feeling left me. Until then it had seemed so smooth and velvety and peaceful drifting around over their heads 
as though lying on a soft fleecy cloud but now i felt a sudden squeezing of my spirit body then i was in an agony before i knew what i was doing my spirit was clinging to the outside of the twisting glass bell clawing to get into the body that was coming back to life the glass was now perfectly clear of the gas though as yet there was no sign of life in the body inside to hint to the scientist that he was to be successful but i knew it for i fought desperately to break in through the glass to get back into my discarded shell of a body again knowing i must get in or die a worse death than i had before then my sharp eyes noted a slight shiver passing over the white thing before me and the scientist must have seen it in the next second for he sprang forward with a choking cry of delight then the lolling head inside lifted a bit i still desperately clinging with my spirit hands to the outside and all the time growing weaker and weaker i saw the breast of my body rise and fall the assistant picked up a heavy steel hammer and stood ready to crash open the glass at the right moment then my once dead eyes opened in there to look around while i clinging and gasping outside just as i had on the scaffold went into a deeper darker blackness than ever just before my spirit life died utterly i saw the eyes of my body realize completely what was going on then from the inside now i saw the scientist give the signal that caused the assistant to crash away the glass shell with one blow of his hammer they reached in for me then and i fainted when i came back to consciousness i was being carefully slowly revived and nursed back to life by oxygen and a pulmota the terrible creature telling us the tale paused again to look around my knees were weak my clothes wet with sweat is that all i asked in a piping strange voice half sarcastic half unbelieving and wholly spellbound just about he answered but what do you expect i left my friend the scientist at once even though he did aid to see me go it had been all right while he was so keen on the experiment himself and while he only half believed his ability to bring me back but now that he had done it it kind of worried him to think what sort of a man he was turning loose of the world again i could see how he was figuring and because i had no idea of letting him try another experiment on me perhaps of putting me away again i beat it in a hurry that was 5 years ago for 5 years i've lived with only just part of me here whatever it was trying to get back into that glass just before my body came to life my spirit i've been calling it i've been without it never did get back you see the scientist brought me back inside a shell that kept my spirit out that's why i am the skeleton you see i am something vital is missing he stood up cracking and creaking before us buttoning his loose coat about his angular body well boys he asked lightly what do you think of that i think you are a liar a damn liar i cried and now if you don't want me to fill you full of lead get out of here and get out now if i have to do it to you there's no scientist this time to bring you back when you go out you will stay out don't worry he grimaced back to me waving a mass of bones that should have been a hand contemptuously at me i'm going i'm headed for shelton he stalked the length of the floor and shut the door behind him the beast had gone the dirty liar i cried i wish yes i wish i had an excuse to kill him just think of that being loose will you a brute would think up such a yarn of course it's all absurd all crazy all a lie no it's not a lie i turned to see who had spoken hamsley's voice was so unfamiliar and now so torn in addition that i could not have thought he had spoken had he not been looking right at me his glittering eyes challenging my assertion would wonders never cease i asked myself first this outrageous yarn now hamsley the sphinx expressing an opinion looking for an argument of course it must be that his susceptible and brooding brain had been turned a bit by the evening we had just experienced why hamsley you don't believe it i asked i not only believe it jerry but now it's my turn to say as he did i know it jerry old friend he went on that devil told the truth he was hanged he was brought back to life and jerry i was a scientist phew i fell back to a box again my knees seemed to forsake me then i heard hamsley talking to himself five years it's been he muttered 
Five years since I turned him loose again. Five years of agony for me, wondering what new devilish crimes he was perpetrating, wondering when he would return to that little form to swing his axe again. Five years. Five years. He came over to me and without a word of explanation or to ask my permission, he reached his hand into my pocket and drew out my revolver and I did not protest. He said he was headed for Shelton, went on Hammersley's spoken thoughts. If I slip across the ice, I can intercept him at Blackwoods. Buttoning his coat closely, he followed the stranger out into the night. I was glad the moon had come up for my walk home, glad too when I had the door locked and propped with a chair behind me. I undressed in the dark, not wanting any grisly sunken eyed monster to be looking in through the window at me. For maybe, so I thought, maybe he was after all not headed for Shelton, but perhaps planning on another of his ghastly tricks. But in the morning, we knew he had been going toward Shelton. Scientists, doctors and learned men of all descriptions came out to a village to see the thing that papers said seawaters had stumbled upon when on his way to the creamery that next morning. It was a skeleton, they said, only that it had a dry skin all over it. A mummy. Could not have been considered capable of containing life, only that the snow around it was slightly blotched with a pale smear that proved to be blood that had oozed out from the six bullet holes in the horrid chest. They never did solve it. There were five of us in the store that night. Five of us who know. Hammersley did what we all wanted to do. Of course, his name is not really Hammersley, but it has done here as well as another. He is black-whiskered though, and he is still very much of a sphinx, but he'll never have to answer for having killed the man he once brought back to life. Hammersley's secret will go into five other graves besides his own. The End of the Man Who Was Dead by Thomas H. Knight All Cats Are Gray by Andre Norton. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dan Gerzinski. All Cats Are Gray by Andre Norton. Under normal conditions, a whole person has a decided advantage over a handicapped one. But out in deep space, the normal may be reversed, for humans at any rate. Stina of the Spaceways. That sounds just like a corny title for one of the stellar Veto spreads. I ought to know. I've tried my hand at writing enough of them. Only this Stina was no glamour babe. She was as colorless as a lunar plant. Even the hair netted down to her skull had a sort of grayish cast. And I never saw her but once draped in anything but a shapeless and baggy gray space all. Stina was strictly background stuff, and that is where she mostly spent her free hours, in the smelly, smoky background corners of any stellar port dive frequented by free spacers. If you really looked for her, you could spot her, just sitting there, listening to the talk, listening and remembering. She didn't open her own mouth often. But when she did, spacers had learned to listen. And the lucky few who heard her rare spoken words, these will never forget Stina. She drifted from port to port. Being an expert operator on the big calculator, she found jobs wherever she cared to stay for a time. And she came to be something like the master-minded machines she tended. Smooth, gray, without much personality of her own. But it was Stina who told Bub Nelson about the Jovan moon rites, and her warning saved Bub's life six months later. It was Stina who identified the piece of stone Keen Clark was passing around a table one night, rightly calling it unworked slightite. That started a rush which made ten fortunes overnight for men who were down to their last jets. And last of all, she cracked the case of the Empress of Mars. All the boys who had profited by her queer store of knowledge and her photographic memory tried at one time or another to balance the scales, but she wouldn't take so much as a cup of canal water at their expense, let alone the credits they tried to push on her. Bub Nelson was the only one who got around her refusal. It was he who brought her bat. 
About a year after the Jovan affair, he walked into the free fall one night and dumped a bat down on her table. Bat looked at Stina and growled. She looked calmly back at him and nodded once. From then on, they traveled together, the thin gray woman and the big gray tomcat. Bat learned to know the inside of more stellar bars than even most spacers visit in their lifetimes. He developed a liking for vernal juice, drank it neat and quick right out of a glass. And he was always at home at any table where Stina elected to drop him. This is really the story of Stina, Bat, Cliff Moran, and the Empress of Mars, a story which is already a legend of the spaceways. And it's a damn good story, too. I ought to know having framed the first version of it myself. For I was there, right in the Rigel Royal, when it all began on the night that Cliff Moran blew in, looking lower than an ant-man's belly and twice as nasty. He'd had a spell of luck foul enough to twist a man into a slug snake, and we all knew that there was an attachment out for his ship. Cliff had fought his way up from the back courts of Venaport, lose his ship, and he'd slip back there to rot. He was at the snarling stage that night when he picked out a table for himself and set out to drink away his troubles. However, just as the first bottle arrived, so did a visitor. Stina came out of her corner, bat curled around her shoulders, stolewise, his favorite mode of travel. She crossed over and dropped down without invitation at Cliff's side. That shook him out of his sulks, because Stina never chose company when she could be alone. If one of the manstones on Ganymede had come stumping in, it wouldn't have made more of us look out of the corners of her eyes. She stretched out one long-fingered hand and set aside the bottle he had ordered and said only one thing. It's about time for the Empress of Mars to appear again. Cliff scowled and bit his lip. He was tough. Tough as jet lining. You have to be granite inside and out to struggle up from Venaport to a ship command but we could guess what was running through his mind at that moment. The Empress of Mars was just about the biggest prize a spacer could aim for, but in the fifty years she had been following her queer, derelict orbit through space, many men had tried to bring her in, and none had succeeded. A pleasure ship, carrying untold wealth, she had been mysteriously abandoned in space by passengers and crew, none of whom had ever been seen or heard of again. At intervals thereafter, she had been sighted, even boarded. Those who ventured into her either vanished or returned swiftly without any believable explanation of what they had seen, wanting only to get away from her as quickly as possible. But the man who could bring her in, or even strip her clean in space, that man would win the jackpot. All right, Cliff slammed his fist down on the table. I'll try even that. Stina looked at him, much as she must have looked at Bat the day Bub Nelson brought him to her, and nodded. That was all I saw. The rest of the story came to me in pieces months later and in another port, half the system away. Cliff took off that night. He was afraid to risk waiting, with a writ out that could pull the ship out from under him. And it wasn't until he was in space that he discovered his passengers, Stina and Bat. We'll never know what happened then. I'm betting that Stina made no explanation at all. She wouldn't. It was the first time she had decided to cash in on her own tip, and she was there. That was all. Maybe that point weighed with Cliff. Maybe he just didn't care. Anyway, the three were together when they sighted the Empress riding, her dead lights gleaming, a ghost ship in night space. She must have been an eerie sight, because her other lights were on, too, in addition to the red warnings at her nose. She seemed alive, a flying Dutchman of space. Cliff worked his ship skillfully alongside and had no trouble in snapping magnetic lines to her lock. Some minutes later, the three of them passed into her. There was still air in her cabins and corridors, air that bore a faint corrupt taint which sent Bat to sniffing greedily and could be picked up even by the less sensitive human nostrils. Cliff headed straight for the control cabin, but Stina and Bat went prowling. Closed doors were a challenge to both of them, and Stina opened each as she passed, taking a quick look at what lay within. 
The fifth door opened on a room which no woman could leave without further investigation. I don't know who had been housed there when the Empress left port on her last lengthy cruise. Anyone really curious can check back on the old photo reg cards. But there was a lavish display of silks trailing out of the two travel kits on the floor, a dressing table crowded with crystal and jeweled containers, along with other lures for the female, which drew Stina in. She was standing in front of the dressing table when she glanced into the mirror, glanced into it, and froze. Over her right shoulder, she could see the spider silk cover on the bed. Right in the middle of that sheer gossamer expanse was a sparkling heap of gems, the dumped contents of some jewel case. Bat had jumped to the foot of the bed and flattened out as cats will, watching those gems, watching them, and something else. Stina put out her hand blindly and caught up the nearest bottle. As she unstoppered it, she watched the mirrored bed. A gemmed bracelet rose from the pile, rose in the air, and tinkled its siren song. It was as if an idle hand played. Bat spat almost noiselessly, but he did not retreat. Bat had not yet decided his course. She put down the bottle. Then she did something which perhaps few of the men she had listened to through the years could have done. She moved, without hurry or sign of disturbance, on a tour about the room, and although she approached the bed, she did not touch the jewels. She could not force herself to that. It took her five minutes to play out her innocence and unconcern. Then it was Bat who decided the issue. He leapt from the bed and escorted something to the door remaining a careful distance behind. Then he mewed loudly twice. Stina followed him and opened the door wider. Bat went straight on down the corridor, as intent as a hound on the warmest of scents. Stina strolled behind him, holding her pace to the unhurried gait of an explorer. What sped before them both was invisible to her, but Bat was never baffled by it. They must have gone into the control cabin almost on the heels of the Unseen. If the Unseen had heels, which there was good reason to doubt, for Bat crouched just within the doorway and refused to move on. Stina looked down the length of the instrument panels and officers' station seats to where Cliff Moran worked. On the heavy carpet, her boots made no sound, and he did not glance up but sat humming through set teeth as he tested the tardy and reluctant responses to buttons which had not been pushed in years. To human eyes, they were alone in the cabin, but Bat still followed a moving something with his gaze, and it was something which he had at last made up his mind to distrust and dislike. For now he took a step or two forward and spat his loathing made plain by every raised hair along his spine. And in that same moment, Stina saw a flicker, a flicker of vague outline against Cliff's hunched shoulders, as if the invisible one had crossed the space between them. But why had it been revealed against Cliff and not against the back of one of the seats or against the panels, the walls of the corridor, or the cover of the bed where it had reclined and played with its loot? What could Bat see? The storehouse memory that had served Stina so well through the years clicked open a half-forgotten door. With one swift motion, she tore loose her space all and flung the baggy garment across the back of the nearest seat. Bat was snarling now, emitting the throaty, rising cry that was his hunting song. But he was edging back, back towards Stina's feet, shrinking from something he could not fight, but which he faced defiantly. If he could draw it after him, past that dangling space all, he had to. It was their only chance. What the? Cliff had come out of his seat and was staring at them. What he saw must have been weird enough. Stina, bare-armed and shouldered, her usually stiffly netted hair falling wildly down her back. Stina watching empty space, with narrowed eyes and set mouth, calculating a single wild chance. Bat, crouched on his belly, retreating from thin air, step by step and wailing like a demon. "'Toss me your blaster!' Stina gave the order calmly, as if they still sat at their table in the Rigel Royal. And as quietly Cliff obeyed, 
She caught the small weapon out of the air with a steady hand, caught it, and leveled it. "'Stay just where you are,' she warned. "'Back, back. Bring it back.' With a last throat-splitting screech of rage and hate, Bat twisted to safety between her boots. She pressed with thumb and forefinger, firing at the space halls. The material turned to powdery flakes of ash, except for certain bits which still flapped from the scorched seat, as if something had protected them from the force of the blast. Bat sprang straight up in the air with a scream that tore their ears. What? began Cliff again. Steena made a warning motion with her left hand. Wait. She was still tense, still watching Bat. The cat dashed madly around the cabin twice, running crazily with white-ringed eyes and flicks of foam on his muzzle. Then he stopped abruptly in the doorway, stopped and looked back over his shoulder for a long, silent moment. He sniffed delicately. Steen and Cliff could smell it, too, now. A thick, oily stench which was not the usual odor left by an exploding blaster shell. Bat came back, treading daintily across the carpet, almost on the tips of his paws. He raised his head as he passed Stina, and then he went confidently beyond to sniff, to sniff, and spit twice at the unburned strips of the space hall. Having thus paid his respects to the late enemy, he sat down calmly and set to washing his fur with deliberation. Steen aside once and dropped into the navigator's seat. Maybe now you'll tell me what in the hell's happened, Cliff exploded as he took the blaster out of her hand. Gray, she said dazedly. It must have been gray or I couldn't have seen it like that. I'm colorblind, you see. I can only see shades of gray. My whole world is gray. Like bats. His world is gray, too, all gray. But he's been compensated for. He can see above and below our range of color vibrations, and apparently so can I. Her voice quavered as she raised her chin with a new air Cliff had never seen before, a sort of proud acceptance. She pushed back her wandering hair, but she made no move to imprison it under the heavy net again. That is why I saw the thing when it crossed between us. Against your space all, it was another shade of gray an outline. So I put out mine and waited for it to show against that. It was her only chance, Cliff. It was curious at first, I think, and it knew we couldn't see it, which is why it waited to attack. But when Bat's actions gave it away, it moved. So I waited to see that flicker against the space hall, and then I let him have it. It's really very simple. Cliff laughed a bit shakily. But what was this gray thing? I don't get it. I think it was what made the Empress a derelict. Something out of space, maybe, or from another world somewhere. She waved her hands. It's invisible because its color is beyond our range of sight. It must have stayed in here all these years. And it kills, it must, when its curiosity is satisfied. Swiftly, she described the scene in the cabin and the strange behavior of the gem pile which had betrayed the creature to her. Cliff did not return his blaster to its holder. Any more of them on board, do you think? He didn't look pleased at the prospect. Steena turned to bat. He was paying particular attention to the space between two front toes in the process of a complete bath. I don't think so, but bat will tell us if there are. He can see them clearly, I believe. But there weren't any more, and two weeks later, Cliff, Steena, and Bat brought the Empress into the lunar quarantine station. And that is the end of Steena's story, because, as we have been told, happy marriages need no chronicles. And Steena had found someone who knew of her gray world and did not find it too hard to share with her. Someone besides Bat. It turned out to be a real love match. The last time I saw her, she was wrapped in a flame-red cloak from the looms of Rigel and wore a fortune in Jove and rubies blazing on her wrists. Cliff was flipping a three-figure credit bill to a waiter, and Bat had a row of vernal juice glasses set up before him. Just a little family party out on the town. End of All Cats Are Grey 
by Andre Norton. Delayed Action by Charles V. DeVette This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Delayed Action by Charles V. DeVette It was just a hunch. Johnson knew that, but his hunches had often paid off in the past and now he waited with a big man's patience. For five hours he sat in the wooden stands, under the rumpled canvas the concessionaires had put up to protect the tourists from Marlock's yellow sun. The sun was hot, and soon Johnson's clothing was marked with large soiled patches of sweat. Now and then a light breeze blew across the stands from the native section, and at each breath his nostrils crinkled in protest at the acrid smell. Marlock wasn't much of a planet. Its one claim to fame was its widely advertised Nature's Mobius Strip. For 18 months of the year, nine months of sub-zero cold and nine months of sultry, sand-driven summer, the only outsiders to visit the planet came to buy its one export, the fur of the desert ox. But during the two months of fall and two months of spring, the tourists poured in to gape at the strip. Idly, for the hundredth time, Johnson let his gaze run over the tourists lining up for their thrill journey out onto the strip. Most of them wouldn't go far. They only wanted to be able to say they'd been on it. They would build up some pretty exciting stories about it by the time they returned home. There was no sign of Johnson's man. The party started out onto the strip. At the first sensation of giddiness, women squealed, and most of them turned back. Their men came with them, secretly relieved at the excuse. Johnson watched disinterestedly until only two remained, the young couple he had designated in his mind as honeymooners. The girl had grit, perhaps more than the young fellow with her. He was affecting bored bravado laughing loudly as the girl hesitated. But white streaks had appeared along his jawline and across his temples as he waited his turn. The young couple had gone far enough out now that they were in the first bend of the strip's twisting dip. Already their bodies were leaning sharply as the mysterious gravity of the strip held them perpendicular with their pathway. From where he sat, Johnson could read nausea on their faces. When they had followed the strip around until they were leaning at a 35-degree angle, the girl seemed to lose her nerve. She stopped and stood gripping the guide rope with both hands. The boy said something to her, but she shook her head. He'd have to show his superiority now by going on. But it wouldn't be for much farther, Johnson was willing to wager. The boy took three more steps and paused. Then his body bent in the middle and he was sick. He'd had enough. Both turned and hurried back. The crowd of tourists, watching or waiting their turn, cheered. In a few minutes, Johnson knew, the kid would be thinking of himself as a hero. Suddenly, Johnson straightened up, having spotted a new arrival, who gripped a tan briefcase tightly under one arm, buying a ticket. He had bulky shoulders, and a black beard. Johnson's man had come. When he saw the bearded man go out with the next bunch to brave the strip, Johnson rose and walked rapidly to the entrance. Elbowing his way through, with a murmured apology, he joined the waiting group. A thin-faced, odd-job man opened the rope gate and they shuffled through. The group must have walked fifty paces, with the bearded man well up in front, and Johnson somewhere in the middle, before Johnson's stomach sent him its first warning of unrest. Most of those ahead had stopped, and Johnson threaded his way carefully past them. Another twenty-five steps, and he left the others behind, all except the bearded man. He neither paused nor looked back. 
Johnson's stomach had drawn up into a tight knot now, and his head was beginning to feel light. There was a faint ringing in his ears. By the time he had reached the end of the guide rope, nausea was creeping up from his stomach and into his throat. This was as far as it was supposed to be safe to go. The advertising literature had it that here was the point of no return. Up ahead, his quarry was walking half doubled over, weaving back and forth, as though he were intoxicated, but he did not pause. Johnson turned to look back and felt his breakfast fighting to come up. From his perspective, the ground and the spectators watching him had swung to a position almost perpendicular to him. He felt that he was about to slide off into space. A wave of vertigo swept over him. His legs folded, and he fell to the ground, sicker than he'd ever been before in his life. Now he knew why the man ahead never looked back. For a moment, Johnson wondered whether he should give up. But even as he debated, tenacity pulled him to his feet and forced him on. And now something new was added to his vast discomfort. Tiny twinges of pain, like small electric shocks, began shooting up his legs, increasing in intensity with each step he took. The pain built up until the rusty taste of blood in his mouth told him that he had bitten into the flesh of his lower lip. Johnson's only consolation now was the thought that the man ahead of him must be suffering worse than he. At each step, the pain increased its tempo, and the sound within his head grew to a battering roar. Although he felt himself at the last frayed ends of his vitality, he managed to stagger on. Abruptly, he realized that he had very nearly overtaken the man ahead. Through eyes glazed with pain, he saw the other, still standing, but swaying with agony and sickness. The man seemed to be gathering his resources for some supreme effort. He tottered ahead two more steps, threw himself forward, and disappeared. If he paused now, Johnson knew that he would never be able to move again. Only willpower and momentum carried him on. He stumbled and pitched forward. A searing pain traced a path through his head, and he felt himself falling. He was certain that he had never lost consciousness. The ground came up to meet him, and with a last effort, he twisted his right shoulder inward. His cheek slid along the dirt, and he lay on his side without strength. His legs pushed forward in a steady, jerking movement as he fought to quiet his quivering muscles. Gradually, a soothing lethargy bathed Johnson's body. His pains vanished, and the sickness left his stomach. But something was wrong, terribly wrong. Slowly, he climbed to his feet and stood looking about him, he was still on the narrow arm of the strip. On either side of him, banks of white clouds with a consistency of thick smoke billowed and curled about the strip, but somehow they left its pathway clear. Johnson shook his head. The wrongness, he guessed, was in his own mind, but he was unable to determine what it was. Desperately, he marshaled his scattered thoughts. Nothing. He took one groping step in the direction from which he had come and staggered back from a wall of pain as tangible as a concrete structure. He had no choice except to go forward. There was something he must do, he realized. But what was it? With the question came the answer to what was troubling him. His memory was gone. Or, at least, a great, gap had been torn through it as though carved out by a giant blade. Briefly, despair threatened to overwhelm him. Hold it, Johnson spoke aloud, and the words sobered him. All fears become worse when not looked at. He had to bring this disaster out into the open where he could face it, where he could assay the damage. He had always taken pride in having a logical mind, 
with thought processes as clear and orderly as a bookkeeper's ledger. Closing his eyes, he went swiftly over his recollections, placing each in its appropriate column. When he finished, he found the balance extremely unfavorable, but not hopeless. On the asset side, he remembered his name, Donald Johnson. Right now, he was on nature's Mobius trip on the planet Marlock. There was some man he had been following. The rest was on the liability side of his balance sheet. His name remained. All other memory of his own identity was gone. There was no recollection of his reason for being on Marlock, or whom he had been following, or why. That left him little with which to work. On the other hand, he mused, he might never be able to get off the strip, so that didn't matter much. He doubted his ability to stand the stress of penetrating that electric curtain again. His body had been able to take the punishment the first time because the force had built up gradually. Going back would be something else again. Still, he planned his next actions methodically. Only in that way could he retain his sanity. He would go forward for one hour, he decided. He checked his wristwatch and discovered it had run down. And if he found nothing, he would return and take his chances on getting through the curtain. At the end of ten minutes, he sighted land ahead of him. When he stepped off the strip, he stopped in amazement. Somehow, the strip had doubled back on itself, and he had returned to his starting place. To his right was the rough wooden viewing platform with its green umbrella gone. The stands were empty, and not a person, tourist or concessionaire, was in sight. As Johnson stood perplexed, he became aware of numbness spreading over his body. He brought up his hands and watched them slowly turn blue with cold. He realized then, in a burst of wonder, that winter had come to Marlock. Yet it had been spring when he had gone out on the strip. Good God, man, the clerk exclaimed. Have you been out in that cold without a coat and hat? It must be thirty below. Johnson was unable to answer. He had run from the strip. Luckily, he remembered its location in relation to the town. But it must have been over a mile to the hotel. Now... As he stamped his feet and beat at his sides with numbed hands, he breathed heavily, gasping great gulps of air into his tortured lungs. Come and warm yourself, the clerk said, leaning him over to a hot water radiator. Johnson made no protest. He let the heat penetrate until it scorched the skin on his back. Only after the coldness left his body, and was replaced by a drowsy inertia did his attention return to the clerk. Did you ever see me before? Johnson asked. The clerk shook his head. Not that I know of. Any further investigation would have to wait until the next day, Johnson decided. He was dead tired, and he had to have some sleep. Sign me up for a room, will you? He asked. Once up in his room... Johnson counted his money, 154 credits, enough to buy winter clothing and pay his room and board for a week, maybe two. What would he do if he could learn nothing about himself before then? The next day, Johnson left the hotel to buy warm clothes. The town's only store was a half block down the street. As he remembered it, one of the big interplanet company stores. Johnson waited until the storekeeper finished with two of the hairy-eared natives before giving his order. As he paid for the purchase, he asked, Have you ever seen me before? The storekeeper glanced at him uneasily and shifted his feet before answering. Am I supposed to have? Johnson ignored the question. Where can I find the manager? He asked, slipping into the heavy coat the clerk held for him. Go up that stairway by the door, the clerk said. You'll find him in his office. The manager was an old man, old and black. 
with the deep blackness only an earth-born negro possesses, but his eyes retain their youthful alertness. Come in and sit down, he told Johnson as he looked up and saw him standing in the doorway. Johnson walked over and took the chair at the manager's left. I've had an accident, he said without preliminary, and I seem to have lost my memory. Do you, by any chance, know who I am? Never saw you before in my life, the manager answered. What's your name? Don Johnson. Well, at least you remember something, the old man said shrewdly. You didn't come during the last six months, if that'll help any. There have only been two ships in that time, both the companies. I meet all company ships. If you came in during the tourist season, I wouldn't know. Where else can I make inquiries? Son, the old man said kindly, there's three Earthmen on Marlock that I know of, besides yourself, of course, the clerk at the hotel, my storekeeper, and myself. If you started asking questions at the hotel, you're at the end of the line now. Something in Johnson's expression caused the old man to go on. How you fix for money, son? Johnson drew a deep breath. I've got enough to last me about two weeks. The manager hesitated and carefully surveyed the ceiling with his eyes before he spoke again. I've always felt we Earthmen should stick together, he said. If you want a job, I'll find something for you to do and put you on the payroll. Twenty minutes later, Johnson took the job, and twenty years later, he was still working for the company. He worked for them until... Johnson was glad when the first twinge of fear came that it brought no panic. Instead, it washed through his body, sharpening his reflexes and alerting his muscles for action. He never ceased to wonder about this faculty he had acquired for sensing the presence of danger. There was no doubt in his mind that it had come into active function through the influence of his environment but it must have been an intrinsic part of him even before that, waiting to be activated. A moment before he had localized the source of his uneasiness, an earthman, following perhaps fifty paces behind him, the one quick glance Johnson had allowed himself told him his follower was above average in height and lean, with the wiry, muscular command of himself that marked him as a man capable of well-coordinated action. He fought the rising force of the next sandblaster boiling in from the desert until he was unable to take a step against it. Then he moved behind a mud-packed arm projecting from the native dwelling at his right. Every building had one of these protecting arms added on. Even the concrete buildings in the newer, earth-built section of the city conformed to the custom. The sandstorms ranged intermittently on Marlock through the entire nine-month summer season and could not be ignored, either by visitors or natives. Johnson huddled against the projection, but the sand whipped around the corner and pounded at his back. Fine grain sifted through his clothing and mingled with the clammy sweat of his body. He resisted the frantic urge to scratch his itching, tormented skin, for he knew that the flesh would be rubbed raw in a minute and increase the irritation to maddening proportions. As the sandblaster lost its intensity, he came out from his shelter and walked away as rapidly as the diminishing force of the wind would permit. If he could reach his office before his stalker closed in, he would be safe. Suddenly, a second earthman, a short length of pipe in his right hand, came out of a doorway across the street and ran toward him. Johnson realized that here was the source of the warning his intuition had sent not the man behind him. For a brief instant, he weighed the situation. The man was equipped for assault, but the chances were he was interested only in robbery. Johnson could probably save himself a beating by surrendering his money without resistance. He rejected the thought. A man had to live with his pride and his self-respect. They were more necessary than physical well-being. Setting his shoulders firmly against the wall, he waited. 
the man slowed to a walk when he saw his intended victim on guard. Johnson had the chance to observe him closely. He was a short and dark man, heavy of bone, with the lower half of his face thickly bearded and sweat making a thin, glistening film on his high cheekbones. Abruptly, a voice said, I wouldn't touch him if I were you. Johnson followed the gaze of his near attacker to his left, where the lean man he had noted before stood with a flat blue pistol pointed in their direction. He held the pistol like a man who knew how to use it. A gun? The man in the street gasped. Are you crazy? Better put it away, fast, Johnson warned his ally. If the native police catch you with that gun, you're in bad trouble. The lean man hesitated a moment, then shrugged and pocketed the gun. But he kept his hand in the pocket. I can still use it, he said to no one in particular. Look, chum, the bearded thug grated. You're evidently a stranger here. Let me give you a tip. If you get caught using a gun, or even having one on you, the police will slap you in jail with an automatic sentence of ten years. An Earthman couldn't stay alive in one of their so-called jails for a year. Now, I've got a little business to attend to with Mr. Johnson, and I don't want any interference. So be smart and run along. The smile never left the stranger's face. Right now, he said, I am interested in seeing that Mr. Johnson remains in good health. If you take another step toward him, I'll shoot. And if I'm not successful in evading the police afterwards, you won't be alive to know it. You're bluffing, the bearded man said. I... Let me point out something, Johnson interrupted. Suppose he is bluffing and doesn't use the gun. The odds are still two to one against you. Are you sure you could handle both of us, even with the help of that pipe? The man wasn't sure. He stood undecided, then his face showed black frustration. He mouthed a few choice phrases through his beard, turned, and walked away. The lean man extended his hand. My name's Alton Hawks. The rising whine of the next sandblaster drowned out Johnson's answer. He drew his new acquaintance into the shelter of a sand arm. As they hugged the corner, they felt a third body press against them. The musky order, combined with the taint of old leather, told Johnson that their companion was a native. The storm eased its force, and the two Earthmen raised their heads to regard the corner's other occupant. He was a mahogany brown, almost the exact color of the ankle-length leather skirt he wore. Man, he stinks, Hawks said. Their visitor spread his harried, wide-nostril nose into the native equivalent of a smile. His hairy ears twitched with pleasure, and he swelled his chest. Lee strung all over, he said. Want him guard? Why not? Johnson answered, glancing inquiringly at Hawks. He slipped a coin into the extended brown palm. Guard us until we get to the big house section. Pale smells be very safe, the native said. They left their shelter as the wind died down and started toward the taller buildings of the foreign section. I must have said the right thing when I said he stinks, Hawks remarked. Telling a native that is the same thing to him as calling him strong and virile, Johnson answered. They admit, reluctantly, that we foreigners have some good fighting qualities, but we're still regarded as unmanly because of our weak odor. Their females wouldn't look twice at either of us. When they reached one of the few three-story structures in the city, Johnson dismissed their guard. They entered the building and walked down a short corridor and through a door lettered, Donald H. Johnson, District Manager, Interplanets Trade Company. To be frank with you, Hawks said, as he eased his lank body into the chair Johnson offered, I had planned to learn more about your local activities before I introduced myself. However, I found in the past that my first judgment of a man is usually right so I think I'll get down to business immediately. He drew a set of papers from an inside pocket and tossed them on the desk in front of Johnson. I'm a company secret service man, he said. Johnson raised his eyebrows, 
but looked at the papers without comment. He glanced up at Hawks. Do you recognize either of the men in the pictures? Hawks asked, when he saw that Johnson had no intention of speaking. Unhurriedly, Johnson picked up the papers and removed a rubber binder. He pulled out two photos and laid them on the desk in front of him. The bearded one is the man who waylaid me, he said. Of course. Look at both a little closer, Hawks suggested, and see if you don't notice something else. Johnson studied the pictures. There's no doubt about the first, he murmured. Evidently, I'm supposed to recognize the other also. Abruptly, he sat erect. They're both the same man, he exclaimed. Only in the second picture, he's clean-shaven. Hawks nodded. There's a story about those two pictures, he said. But first, let me fill you in on some background. You know that Inner Planets has branches on more than a thousand worlds. Because of this widespread operation, it's particularly vulnerable to robbery but it would cost more than the company's earnings to post adequate guards on every station, and it would be impractical to depend on the protection of the local governments, many of which are extremely primitive. On the other hand, allowing themselves to be robbed with impunity would be financial suicide. Johnson nodded. Of course. That, Hawks continued, is where the company's secret service comes in. It never lets up on the effort it will make to solve a robbery and bring the perpetrators to justice. And it never quits once it begins an investigation. That policy has proven very effective in discouraging thievery. During the company's entire tenure, there have been less than a dozen unsolved thefts. And two of them occurred right here on Marlock. I was a clerk with the company at the time of the second, Johnson said reminiscently. Been with them about three years then. That must have been over 20 years ago. I... He paused and looked down. I remember. The picture without the beard. That's the thief. The photo was taken by one of the automatic cameras set up for just that purpose. We still use them. But they never found the man. That's right, Hawks agreed. That robbery occurred a little over 20 years ago and the other picture you have was taken at the time of the first robbery, approximately 25 years before that. But it isn't possible, Johnson protested. These pictures are of the same man, and there's obviously no 25-year spread in age between them unless... unless one is the other's father or a relative that resembles him very closely? Hawks finished. Look at the pictures again. There's the same scar on both foreheads, the same pockmark on the right cheek. Our special section has even made measurements of the comparative sizes of the nose, ears, and other features. There's no possible doubt that the pictures are of the same man. How do you explain it? Johnson asked. I don't, Hawks replied quietly. That's one of the things I'm here to learn. But did you notice this? The man we encountered this afternoon was not only the same as the one on these pictures, he still looks the same. We might, for the sake of argument, grant that a man's appearance would change only slightly in 25 years, but when you add another 23 on top of that, and he's still unchanged, if you're certain that he's the man, why don't you arrest him? Johnson asked. Can we arrest a man apparently about 30 years old and accuse him of a crime committed 48 years ago? Or even 23 years ago? I suppose not, Johnson agreed. What do you intend to do? I haven't decided yet. First, I'll have to learn more about the situation here. You can help me with that. Right now, I'd like to know something about the native customs, especially in regard to legal matters. Their laws are fairly simple, Johnson began. There's no law against stealing or taking by force anything you can get away with. That sounds absurd by Earth standards. It prevents the amassing of more goods than an individual needs and makes for fairly equitable distribution. If a native somehow acquires a sudden amount of wealth, goods in their case, 
He must hire guards to protect it. Guarding is a major occupation. They do an especially big business during the tourist seasons. In time, the pay of the guards will eat up any native surplus. Either way, by loss or guard pay, the wealth is soon redistributed. Can they even kill one another with impunity? No. Their laws are rigid in that respect. In the process of relieving another of his property, they must neither break a major bone nor inflict permanent damage. If they disobey, they are tortured to death in the public square. Hawks asked, who enforces their law? One of the clans. Its members are supported in their duties by all the others, and there's a permanent open season on murderers. Anyone, police or civilian, may revenge a victim. How about the law against carrying firearms? With them, intent is tantamount to commission, Johnson replied. Only foreigners are ever foolish enough to be caught armed. However, all native laws apply to them also. The only concession the company has been able to force is that a foreign offender isn't tortured. He's put in jail for ten years. None ever lived to come out. I see, Hawks said. Interesting. However, the immediate situation is this. I've been sent here because the service received reports that our bearded friend had made another appearance, and we believe it's safe to assume that he's here to attempt a third robbery. Right now, we'll have to pass over his trick of longevity. Our problem is to catch him in the act. When do you think he'll make his play? It'll have to be some time before tomorrow noon, Johnson answered. Under our setup, we accept furs from the natives whenever they're brought in but we only pay off once a year. That way, I'm not burdened with garden money the whole year round. I have well over 50,000 credits in the safe now, and tomorrow I begin paying off. Then we'll have to be ready for him, Hawks said, though I don't expect him until tonight. Probably just about the time you're ready to close. He'll need you to open the safe. I can count on your help? Johnson nodded. That night, as they waited in his office, Johnson turned to Hawks. I've been giving some thought to what you told me this afternoon about the robberies. I have a theory that might account for some of the things we don't understand. Yes, Hawks looked closely at Johnson. You've probably heard of our tourist attraction called Nature's Mobius Strip. As far as we know, no one has ever gone beyond a certain point and returned. Suppose there's a time flaw at that point and the bearded man has somehow learned about it. Suppose anyone completing the Mobius Circle and returning finds, say, 20 years have elapsed, while to him, only a few minutes have passed. Go on, Hawks leaned forward intently. He makes his first holdup, Johnson continued, and goes around the strip. When he comes out 20 years later, they're no longer looking for him. He leaves Marlock, and during the next five years he goes through the money he stole. He returns and repeats the process. This time, the money only lasts three years. Now he's back to try it again. Do you see how that would tie everything up in a neat little package? Hawk smiled as he relaxed and sat back. A bit too neat, he said. Also, you don't have an ounce of concrete evidence to back up your theory. That's right, I don't. Johnson agreed. Outside the door, a board creaked. Johnson glanced quickly across the room to where Hawks sat with a pistol on his lap. Hawks' eyebrows raised, but he made no sound. Suddenly, the door was kicked open, and the black-bearded stranger stood framed in the doorway. Raise him, he barked. The gun in his hand was aimed at Johnson. The man took two steps into the room, Hawks shifted slightly in his chair, and the gunman's head swiveled in his direction. The slug from Hawks's pistol made a small blue hole in the upper left corner of his forehead. The thug's face tipped up, shocked and unbelieving. He swayed slowly before he fell backward, his body rigid. His fur cap flew from his head as he struck the floor. I thought we'd better play it safe, Hawks said as he rose and walked over to the fallen man. 
He slipped his gun into his pocket before he bent and picked up the cap at his feet. He dropped it over the upturned face. For a long moment, the silence held thin as the two men looked at each other. Hawk stood, wiping his right hand on his trouser leg. Johnson toyed idly with the gun he had picked up from the desk in front of him. Finally, Hawks let his body sag into a chair at Johnson's right. This is always a dirty business, he said sourly. Johnson sat down also. Did you notice the look on his face when he saw you and you shot him? He asked, abstractedly turning the pistol in his hand. Funny thing. In that half second before he fell, an article I read somewhere flashed into my mind. It seems that during the French Revolution, a certain doctor got to wondering just how long a man's brain remained active after his head had been cut off. He persuaded some of his friends who were due to be guillotined to cooperate in a series of tests. Each man was to keep blinking his eyes as long as possible after his head left his body, as a sign that he was still conscious. The doctor counted as high as six winks. Very interesting, I'm sure. Hawks said guardedly, but a bit morbid, isn't it? I was wondering, Johnson went on, as though he had not heard the other, whether he was still conscious for that instant after you shot him, and if that brought the look of surprise to his face. Hawks turned in his chair to face Johnson fully. You're driving at something, he said sharply. Get to the point. Personally, I've wondered at a few things about you myself. Johnson said. He held the gun steadily in his hand now, no longer pretending to play with it. I told you that our second robbery occurred while I was a clerk with the company, he went on. They jerked me into the home office, and for a while I had a pretty rough time. You know, when I joined the company, I was an amnesiac. I remembered my name, but that was about all. No, I didn't know, Hawks muttered growing slightly paler. I learned then from the home office that I had been a member of their secret service some 20 years earlier. I had been sent here to investigate the first robbery, and I had disappeared. Naturally, they had suspected me. However, they had no evidence, and when I reappeared 20 years later, they played it smart by just waiting instead of arresting me. When the second robbery occurred, they closed in. The only thing that saved me was the fact that tests proved my memory was really gone and that I had told the truth as I knew it. From the few scraps of information I retained about being out on the Mobius Strip, they and I arrived at the theory I mentioned a short time ago. I was sent back here to wait. The company never gives up, remember? Are you insinuating that I was in cahoots with this fellow here? Hawks asked harshly. I'd say it was more than an insinuation, Johnson replied. You made several other slips. In the first place, secret service men are usually better informed about a situation they're investigating than you seem to be. Also, those identification papers you showed me were faked. The skin along the bridge of Hawk's nose had drawn tight, and now his lips grew narrower. In that case, why did I save you from that man this afternoon? He asked. And why would I shoot him now? Your saving me was an act to get into my confidence. You shot him so you wouldn't have to split the loot. I figure you were in with him on the second robbery also. There had to be someone because his memory would be gone when he came off the strip. But you weren't satisfied. Together, you decided to pull off another robbery while you were here and double the spoils. Then you decided you wanted it all for yourself, and you shot him. There's one big flaw in your reasoning, Hawks pointed out. How did I plan to get away? The only ships leaving here for several months belong to the company. Do you think I'd be foolish enough to expect them to let me slip out on one of their ships? No. I think you intended to go out on the strip yourself. All right, then, Hawks countered. You admitted that this was a two-man job. How could I protect myself when I returned, if I knew in advance that I wouldn't know who I was, let alone what I had done? 
I'll come back to that in a minute, Johnson said. But now I'd advise you to drop your gun on the floor and give yourself up. You've got nothing to gain by carrying on the bluff. You know I'll never let you get to the strip. And once I put you on the ship, the company will take over. Hawks's shoulders drooped. Finally, he smiled raggedly. There's no use my arguing any longer, he said. But you've made the mistake of underestimating me, my friend. I've lost my gamble, that's all. You have nothing on me. I'm not as ignorant of native law as I may have pretended. Granted, I am carrying a lethal weapon, but I'm on private property. That's legal. I shot a man but only in defense of my own life. His gun on the floor will prove he came in armed. So I'm clean as far as the natives are concerned, right? Johnson nodded. And as for the company, what will they hold me for? They can't prove any connection between me and him, Hawks indicated the man on the floor. And this robbery, it never actually came off. Earth laws don't allow prosecution for intent. Now where does that leave you? Johnson stood up. You're right, as far as you went, he said. But, returning to your earlier question about one man pulling this job, I asked myself how I would do it if it had to be done alone. And I found a way. You'll probably figure the same one. Now, I'll take that paper in your pocket. It will serve very well as a confession. Suddenly, Hawks's right hand streaked toward a side pocket. Johnson leaned forward and brought the flat of his gun across the other's temple. As Hawks sagged, Johnson ripped open his coat and took out a sealed envelope. He removed a sheet of paper and read, This has been written for my own information. My name is Alton Hawks. I have robbed the Inner Planets Company and gone out on the strip with the money. When I read this, my memory will be gone and 20 years will have elapsed. End of Delayed Action by Charles V. DeVette Read by Paul Hampton Progress Report by Mark Clifton and Alex Apostolides this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Progress Report by Mark Clifton and Alex Apostolides It seemed to Colonel Jennings that the air conditioning unit merely washed the hot air around him without lowering the temperature from that outside. He knew it was partly psychosomatic, compounded of the view of the silvery spire of the test ship through the heat waves of the Nevada landscape and the knowledge that this was the day, the hour, and the minutes. The final test was at hand. The instrument ship was to be sent out into space, controlled from this sunken concrete bunker, to find out if the flimsy bodies of men could endure there. Jennings visualized other bunkers scattered through the area, observation posts, and farther away the field headquarters with open telephone lines to the Pentagon, and beyond that, a world waiting for news of the test, and not everyone wishing it well. The monotonous buzz of the field phone pulled him away from his fascinated gaze at the periscope slit. He glanced at his two assistants, Professor Stein and Major Eddy. They were seated in front of their control boards, staring at the blank eyes of their radar screens, patiently enduring the beads of sweat on their faces and necks and hands, the odor of it arising from their bodies. They, too, were feeling the moment. He picked up the phone. Jennings, he said crisply. Zero minus one half hour, Colonel. We start alert count in 15 minutes. Right. Colonel Jennings spoke softly, showing none of the excitement he felt. He replaced the field phone on its hook and spoke to the two men in front of him. This is it. Apparently this time we'll go through with it. Major Eddie's shoulders hunched a trifle, as if he were getting set to have a load placed on them. 
Professor Stein gave no indication that he had heard. His thin body was stooped over his instrument bank, intense, alert, as if he were a runner crouched at the starting mark, as if he were young again. Colonel Jennings walked over to the periscope slit again and peered through the shimmer of heat to where the silvery ship lay arrowed in her cradle. The last few moments of waiting, with a brassy taste in his mouth, with a vision of the test ship before him, these were the worst. Everything had been done, checked and rechecked, hours and days ago. He found himself wishing there were some little thing, some desperate little error which must be corrected hurriedly. Just something to break the tension of waiting. You're all right, Sam? Prof? He asked the Major and Professor unnecessarily. A little nervous, Major Eddy answered without moving. Of course, Professor Stein said. There was a too heavy stress on the sibilant sound, as if the last traces of accent had not yet been removed. I expect everyone is nervous, not just the hundreds involved in this, but everywhere, Jennings commented. And then ruefully, except Professor Stein there, I thought surely I'd see some nerves at this point, Prof. He was attempting to make light conversation, something to break the strain of mounting buck fever. If I even let one nerve tendril slack, Colonel, I would go to pieces entirely, Stein said precisely, in the way a man speaks who has learned the language from textbooks. So I do not think of our ship at all. I think of mankind. I wonder if mankind is as ready as our ship. I wonder if man will do any better on the planets than he has done here. Well, of course, Colonel Jennings answered with sympathy in his voice. Under Hitler and all the things you went through, I don't blame you for being a little bitter. But not all mankind is like that, you know. As long as you've been in our country, Professor, you've never looked around you. You've been working on this, never lifting your head. He jerked in annoyance as a red light blinked over the emergency circuit, and a buzzing, sharp and repeated, broke into this moment when he felt he was actually reaching touching Stein as no one had before. He dragged the phone toward him and began speaking angrily into its mouthpiece before he had brought it to his lips. What the hell's the matter now? They're not going to call it off again? Three times now and... He broke off and frowned as the crackling voice came through the receiver, the vein on his temple pulsing in his stress. I beg your pardon, General, he said much more quietly. The two men turned from their radar scopes and watched him questioningly. He shrugged his shoulders, an indication to them of his helplessness. You're not going to like this, Jim, the general was saying, but it's orders from Pentagon. Are you familiar with Senator O'Noonan? Vaguely, Jennings answered. You'll be more familiar with him, Jim. He's been newly appointed chairman of the Appropriations Committee covering our work and he fought it bitterly from the beginning. He's tried every way he could to scrap the entire project. When we finish this test, Jim, we'll have used up our appropriations to date. Whether we get any more depends on him. Yes, sir? Jennings spoke questioningly. Political maneuvering was not his problem. That was between Pentagon and Congress. We must have his support, Jim, the general explained. Pentagon hasn't been able to win him over. He's stubborn and violent in his reactions. The fact it keeps him in the headlines, well, of course, that wouldn't have any bearing. So Pentagon invited him to come to the field here to watch the test, hoping that would win him over. The general hesitated, then continued. I've gone a step farther. I felt if he was actually at the center of control, your operation, he might be won over. If he could actually participate, press the activating key or something. If the headlines could show he was working with us, actually sent the test ship on its flight. General, you can't, Jennings moaned. He forgot rank, everything. I've already done it, Jim. The general chose to ignore the outburst. He's due there now. I'll look to you to handle it. He's got to be won over, Colonel. It's your project. Considering the years that he and the general had worked together, the warm accord and informality between them, 
The use of Jennings' title made it an order. Yes, sir, he said. Over, said the general formally. Out, whispered Jennings. The two men looked at him questioningly. It seems, he answered their look, we are to have an observer, Senator O'Noonan. Even in Germany, Professor Stein said quietly, they knew enough to leave us alone at a critical moment. He can't do it, Jim. Major Eddy looked at Jennings with pleading eyes. Oh, but he can, Jennings answered bitterly. Orders. And you know what orders are, don't you, Major? Yes, sir, Major Eddy said stiffly. Professor Stein smiled ruefully. Both of them turned back to their instrument boards, their radar screens, to the protective obscurity of subordinates carrying out an assignment. They were no longer three men coming close together, almost understanding one another in this moment of waiting, when the world and all in it had been shut away, and nothing real existed except the silvery spire out there in the desert and the life of it in the controls at their fingertips. Beep! Minus fifteen minutes! The first time signal sounded. Colonel Jennings, sir! The senator appeared in the low doorway and extended a fleshy hand. His voice was hearty, but there was no warmth behind his tones. He paused on the threshold, bulky, impressive, as if he were about to deliver an address. But Jennings, while shaking hands, drew him into the bunker pointedly, causing the senator to raise bushy eyebrows and stare at him speculatively. At this point, everything runs on a split-second basis, senator, he said crisply. Ceremony comes after the test. His implication was that when the work was done, the senator could have his turn in the limelight, take all the credit, turn it into political fodder to be thrown to the people. But because the man was chairman of the Appropriations Committee, he softened his abruptness. If the timing is off even a small fraction, Senator, we would have to scrap the flight and start all over. At additional expense, no doubt. The Senator could also be crisp. Surprises me that the military should think of that, however. The closing of the heavy doors behind him punctuated his remark and caused him to step to the center of the bunker. Where there had seemed adequate room before, now the feeling was one of oppressive overcrowding. Unconsciously, Major Eddy squared his elbows as if to clear the space around him for the manipulation of his controls. Professor Stein sat at his radar screen, quiet, immobile, a part of the mechanisms. He was accustomed to overbearing authority, whatever political tag it might wear at the moment. Beep! Eleven minutes. The signal sounded. Perhaps you'll be good enough to brief me on just what you're doing here, the senator asked and implied by the tone of his voice that it couldn't be very much. In layman's language, Colonel, don't try to make it impressive with technical obscurities. I want my progress report on this project to be understandable to everyone. Jennings looked at him in dismay. Was the man kidding him? Explain the zenith of science, the culmination of the dreams of man in twenty simple words or less? and about ten minutes to win over a man which the Pentagon had failed to win? Perhaps you'd like to sit here, Senator, he said courteously. When we learned you were coming, we felt yours should be the honor. At zero time, you press this key here. It will be your hand which sends the test ship out into space. Apparently, they were safe. The Senator knew so little, he did not realize the automatic switch would close with the zero time signal that no hand could be trusted to press the key at precisely the right time, that the senator's key was a dummy. Beep, ten, the signal came through. Jennings went back over to the periscope and peered through the slit. He felt strangely surprised to see the silver column of the ship still there. The calm, the scientific detachment, the warm thrill of coordinated effort, all were gone. He felt as if the test flight itself was secondary to what the senator thought about it, what he would say in his progress report. He wondered if the senator's progress report would compare in any particular with the one on the ship. 
That was a chart representing, as far as they could tell, the minimum and maximum tolerances of human life. If the multiple needles, tracing their continuous lines, went over the black boundaries of tolerances, human beings would die at that point. Such a progress report, showing the life-sustaining conditions at each point through the ship's flight, would have some meaning. He wondered what meaning the senator's progress report would have. He felt himself being pushed aside from the periscope. There was no ungentleness in the push, simply the determined pressure of an arrogant man who was accustomed to being in the center of things and thinking nothing of shoving to get there. The senator gave him the briefest of explanatory looks and placed his own eye at the periscope slit. Beep, nine, the signal sounded. So that's what represents two billion dollars, the senator said contemptuously. That little sliver of metal. The two billion dollar atomic bomb was even smaller, Jennings said quietly. The senator took his eye away from the periscope briefly and looked at Jennings speculatively. The story of where all that money went still hasn't been told, he said pointedly but the story of who got away with this two billion will be different. Colonel Jennings said nothing. The white-hot rage mounting within him made it impossible for him to speak. The senator straightened up and walked back over to his chair. He waved a hand in the direction of Major Eddy. What does that man do? He asked, as if the major were not present or was unable to comprehend. Major Eddy... Jennings found control of his voice. Operates remote control. He was trying to reduce the vast complexity of the operation to the simplest possible language. Beep, eight, the signal interrupted him. He will guide the ship throughout its entire flight, just as if he were sitting in it. Why isn't he sitting in it? The senator asked. That's what the test is for, senator. Jennings felt his voice becoming icy. We don't know if space will permit human life. We don't know what's out there. Best way to find out is for a man to go out there and see, the senator commented shortly. I want to find something out. I go look at it myself. I don't depend on charts and graphs and full or all. The major did not even hunch his broad shoulders, a characteristic gesture to show that he had heard to show that he had wished the senator was out there in untested space. What about him? He's not even in uniform. Professor Stein maintains sight contact on the scope and transmits the IFF pulse. The senator's eyes flashed again beneath heavy brows. His lips indicated what he thought of professors and projects who used them. What's IFF? he asked. The colonel looked at him incredulously. It was on the tip of his tongue to ask where the man had been during the war. He decided he'd better not ask it. He might learn. It stands for Identification Friend or Foe, Senator. It's Army jargon. Beep, seven. Seven minutes, Jennings thought. And here I am trying to explain the culmination of the entire science of all mankind to a lard brain in simple kindergarten words. Well, he wished there was something to break the tension of the last half hour, keep him occupied. He had it. You mean the army wouldn't know after the ship got up whether it was ours or the enemy's? The senator asked incredulously. There are meteors in space, Senator, Jennings said carefully. Radar contact is all we'll have out there. The IFF mechanism reconverts our beam to a predetermined pulse, and it bounces back to us in a different pattern. That's the only way we'd know if we were still on the ship or have by chance fastened onto a meteor. What has that got to do with the enemy? O'Noonan asked uncomprehendingly. Jennings sighed, almost audibly. The mechanism was developed during the war, when we didn't know which planes were ours and which the enemy's. We've simply adapted it to this use, to save money, Senator. Humph, <laughs> the Senator expressed his disbelief. Too complicated. The world has grown too complicated. 
Beep, six. The senator glanced irritably at the time speaker. It had interrupted his speech, but he chose to ignore the interruption. That was the way to handle heckling. I am a simple man. I come from simple parentage. I represent the simple people, the common people, the people with their feet on the ground. And the whole world needs to get back to the simple truths and honesties. Jennings headed off the campaign speech which might appeal to the mountaineers of the senator's home state, where a man's accomplishments were judged by how far he could spit tobacco juice. It had little application in this bunker where the final test before the flight of man to the stars was being tried. To us, Senator, he said gently, this ship represents simple truths and honesties. We are, at this moment, testing the truths of all that mankind has ever thought of, theorized about, believed at the space which surrounds the earth. A farmer may hear about new methods of growing crops, but the only way he knows whether they're practical or not is to try them on his own land. The senator looked at him impassively. Jennings didn't know whether he was going over or not, but he was trying. All that ship and all the instruments it contains, those represent the utmost honesties of the men who worked on them. Nobody tried to bluff, to get by with shoddy workmanship, cover up ignorance. A farmer does not try to bluff his land, for the crops he gets tells the final story. Scientists, too, have simple honesty. They have to, Senator, for the results will show them up if they don't. The Senator looked at him speculatively and with a growing respect. Not a bad speech, that. Not a bad speech at all. If this tomfoolery actually worked, and it might, that could be the approach in selling it to his constituents. By implication, he could take full credit, put over the impression that it was he who had stood over the scientists making sure they were as honest and simple as the mountain farmers. Many a man has gone into the White House with less. Beep, five. Five more minutes. The sudden thought occurred to Onunan. What if he refused to press the dummy key, refused to take part in this project he called tomfoolery? Perhaps they thought they were being clever in having him take part in the ship's launching and were, by that act, committing him to something. This is the final test, Senator. After this one, if it is right, man leaps to the stars. It was Jennings' plea, his final attempt to catch the senator up in the fire and the dream. And then more yapping colonists wanting statehood, the senator said dryly, upsetting the balance of power, changing things. Jennings was silent. Beep, for. More imports trying to get into our country duty-free, O'Noonan went on, upsetting our economy. His vision was of lobbyists threatening to cut off contributions if their own industries were not kept in the favorable position, of grim-jawed industrialists who could easily put a more tractable candidate up in his place to be elected by the free and thinking people of his state. All the best catchphrases, the semantically loaded promises, the advertising appropriations being used by his opponent. It was a dilemma. Should he jump on the bandwagon of advancement to the stars, hoping to catch the imagination of the voters by it? Were the voters really in favor of progress? What could this spaceflight put in the dinner pails of the Smiths, the Browns, the Johnsons? It was all very well to talk about the progress of mankind, but that was the only measure to be considered. Any politician knew that and apparently no scientist knew it. Man advances only when he sees how it will help him stuff his gut. Beep, three. For a full minute, the senator had sat lost in speculation. And what could he personally gain? A plan, full-formed, sprang into his mind. This whole deal could be taken out of the hands of the military on charges of waste and corruption. It could be brought back into the control of private industry where it belonged. He thought of vast tracts of land in his own state, tracts he could buy cheap through dummy companies, places which could be made very suitable for the giant factories necessary to manufacture spaceships. As chairman of the Appropriations Committee, it wouldn't be difficult to sway the choice of site. 
and all that extra employment for the people of his own state. The voters couldn't forget plain, simple, honest O'Noonan after that. Beep, too. Jennings felt the sweat beads increase on his forehead. His collar was already soaking wet. He had been watching the senator through two long minutes. Terrible, eon-consuming minutes. The impassive face showing only what the senator wanted it to show. He saw the face now soften into something approaching benignity, nobility. The head came up. The silvery hair tossed back. Son, he said with a ringing thrill in his voice. Mankind must reach the stars. We must allow nothing to stop that. No personal consideration, no personal belief. Nothing must stand in the way of mankind's greatest dream. His eyes were shrewdly watching the effect upon Jennings' face, measuring through him the effect such a speech would have upon the voters. He saw the relief spread over Jennings' face, the glow. Yes, it might work. Now, son he said with kindly tolerance. Tell me what you want me to do about pressing this key when the time comes. Beep, one. And then the continuous drone while the seconds were being counted off aloud. Fifty-nine, fifty-eight, fifty-seven. The droning went on while Jennings showed the senator just how to press the dummy key down, explaining it in careful detail and just when. Thirty-seven. Thirty-six? Thirty-five? Major? Jennings called questioningly. Ready, sir. Professor? Ready, sir. Three, two, one, zero. Press it, Senator, Jennings called frantically. Already the automatic firing stud had taken over. The bellowing, roaring flames reached down with giant strength, nudging the ship upward, seeming to hang suspended. Waiting. Press it! The senator's hand pressed the dummy key. He was committed. As if the ship had really been waiting, it lifted faster and faster. Major? I have it, sir. The major's hands were flying over his bank of controls, correcting the slight unbalance of thrusts, holding the ship as steady as if he were in it. Already the ship was beyond visual sight, picking up speed. But the pip on the radar screens was strong and clear. The drone of the IFF returning signal was equally strong. The senator sat and waited. He had done his job. He felt it perhaps would have been better to have had the photographers on the spot, but realized the carefully directed and rehearsed pictures to be taken later would make better vote fodder. It's already out in space now, Senator. Jennings found a second of time to call it to the Senator. The pips and the signals were bright and clear, coming through the ionosphere, the heavy side layer as they had been designed to do. Jennings wondered if the Senator could ever be made to understand the simple honesty of scientists who had worked that out so well and true, bright and strong and clear. And then there was nothing. The screens were blank. The sounds were gone. Jennings stood in stupefied silence. It shut off. It shut off. Major Eddy's voice was shrill in amazement. It cut right out, Colonel. No fade, no dying signal, just out. It was the first time Jennings had ever heard a note of excitement in Professor Stein's voice. The phone began to ring loud and shrill. That would be from the general's observation post, where he, too, must have lost the signal. The excitement penetrated the senator's rosy dream of vast acreages being sold at a huge profit, giant walls of factories going up under his remote control ownership. What's wrong? he asked. Jennings did not answer him. What was the altitude? he asked. The phone continued to ring, but he was not yet ready to answer it. 150 miles, maybe a little more, Major Eddy answered in a dull voice. And then nothing, he repeated incredulously. Nothing. The phone was one long ring now, taken off of automatic signal and rung with a hand key pressed down and held there. In a daze, Jenning picked up the phone. Yes, General, he 
he answered as if he were no more than a robot. He hardly listened to the general's questions, did not need the report that every radar scope throughout the area had lost contact at the same instant. Somehow he had known that would be true, that it wasn't just his own mechanisms failing. One question did penetrate his stunned mind. How was the senator taking it? The general asked finally. Uncomprehending as yet, Jennings answered cryptically. But even there, it will penetrate sooner or later. We'll have to face it then. Yes, the general sighed. What about safety? What if it fell on a big city, for example? It had escape velocity, Jennings answered. It would simply follow its trajectory indefinitely, which was away from Earth. What's happening now? The senator asked arrogantly. He had been out of the limelight long enough, longer than was usual or necessary. He didn't like it when people went about their business as if he were not present. Quiet during the test, Senator. Jennings took his mouth from the phone long enough to reprove the man gently. Apparently he got away with it, for the Senator put his finger to his lips knowingly and sat back again. The Senator starting to ask questions? The General asked into the phone. Yes, sir. It won't be long now. I hate to contemplate it, Jim, the General said in apprehension. There's only one way he'll translate it. Two billion dollars shot up into the air and lost. Then sharply, there must be something you've done, Colonel, some mistake you've made. The implied accusation struck at Jennings' stomach, a heavy blow. That's the way it's going to be, he stated the question, knowing its answer. For the good of the service, the general answered with a stock phrase. If it is the fault of one officer and his men, we may be given another chance. If it is the failure of science itself, we won't. I see, the colonel answered. You won't be the first soldier, colonel, to be unjustly punished to maintain public faith in the service. Yes, sir, Jennings answered as formally as if he were already facing court-martial. It's back, Major Eddy shouted in his excitement. It's back, colonel! The pip, truly, showed startlingly clear and sharp on the radar scope. The correct signals were coming in sure and strong. As suddenly as the ship had cut out, it was back. It's back, General, Colonel Jennings shouted into the phone, his eyes fixed upon his own radar scope. He dropped the phone without waiting for the General's answer. Good, exclaimed the Senator. I was getting a little bored with nothing happening. Have you got control? Jennings called to the Major. Can't tell yet. It's coming in too fast. I'm trying to slow it. We'll know in a minute. You have it now, Professor Stein spoke up quietly. It's slowing. It'll be in the atmosphere soon. Slow it as much as you can. As surely as if he were sitting in its control room, Eddie slowed the ship, easing it down into the atmosphere. Instruments recorded the results of his playing upon the bank of controls, a sound pouring from a musical instrument. At the takeoff point, Jennings asked, can you land it there? Close to it, Major Eddy answered, as close as I can. Now the ship was in visual sight again, and they watched its nose turn in the air, turn from a bullet hurtling earthward to a ship settling to the ground on its belly. Major Eddy was playing his instrument bank as if he were the soloist in a vast orchestra at the height of a crescendo forte. Jennings grabbed up the phone again. Transportation, he shouted. Already dispatched, sir, the operator at the other end responded. Through the periscope slit, Jennings watched the ship settle lightly downward to the ground, as though it was a breeze-borne feather instead of its tons of metal. It seemed to settle itself, still, and become inanimate again. Major Eddy dropped his hands away from his instrument bank, an exhausted virtuoso. My congratulations, the senator included all three men in his sweeping glance. It was remarkable how you all had control in every instance. My progress report will certainly bear that notation. The three men looked at him, 
and realized there was no irony in his words, no sarcasm, no realization at all of what had truly happened. I can see a vast fleet of noble ships, the senator began to orate. But the roar of the arriving jeep outside took his audience away from him. They made a dash for the bunker door, no longer interested in the senator and his progress report. It was the progress report as revealed by the instruments on the ship which interested them more. The senator was close behind them as they piled out of the bunker door and into the jeep, with Jennings unceremoniously pulling the driver from the wheel and taking his place. Over the rough dirt road toward the launching site where the ship had come to rest, their minds were bemused and feverish as they projected ahead, trying to read in advance what the instruments would reveal of that blank period. The senator's mind projected even farther ahead to the fleet of spaceships he would own and control. And he had been worried about some ignorant, stupid voters, stupid animals, how he despised them. What would he care about voters when he could be master of the spaceways to the stars? Jennings swerved the jeep off the dirt road and took out across the hummocks of sagebrush to the ship a few rods away. He hardly slacked speed, and in a swirl of dust pulled up to the side of the ship. Before it had even stopped, the men were piling out of the jeep, running toward the side of the ship, and stopped short. Unable to believe their eyes, to absorb the incredible, they stared at the swinging open door in the side of the ship. Slowly, they realized the iridescent purple glow around the doorframe, the rotted metal disintegrating and falling to the dirt below. The implications of the tampering with the door held them unmoving. Only the senator had not caught it yet. Slower than they, now he was chugging up to where they had stopped, an elephantine amble. Well, well, what's holding us up? He panted irritably. Cautiously then, Jennings moved toward the open door, and as cautiously, Major Eddy and Professor Stein followed him. O'Noonan hung behind, sensing the caution, but not knowing the reason behind it. They entered the ship, wary of what might be lurking inside, what had burned open the door out there in space, what had been able to capture the ship cut it off from its contact with controls, stop it in its headlong flight out into space, turn it, return it to their controls at precisely the same point and altitude. Wary, but they enter. At first glance, nothing seemed disturbed. The bulkhead leading to the power plant was still whole. But farther down the passage, the door leading to the control room where the instruments were housed also swung open it too showed the iridescent purple disintegration of its metal frame. They hardly recognized the control room. They had known it intimately, had helped build and fit it. They knew each weld, each nut and bolt. The instruments are gone, the professor gasped in awe. It was true. As they crowded there in the doorway, they saw the gaping holes along the walls where the instruments had been inserted, one by one, each to tell its own story of conditions in space. The senator pushed himself into the room and looked about him. Even he could tell the room had been dismantled. What kind of sabotage is this? he exclaimed, and turned in anger toward Jennings. No one answered him. Jennings did not even bother to meet the accusing eyes. They walked down the narrow passage between the twisted frames where the instruments should have been. They came to the spot where the master integrator should have stood, the one which should have coordinated all the results of life sustenance measurements, the one which was to give them their progress report. There, too, was a gaping hole, but not without its message. Etched in the metal frame, in the same iridescent purple glow, were two words. Two enigmatic words to reverberate throughout the world, burned in by some watcher, some keeper, some warden. Not yet. End of Progress Report
by Mark Clifton and Alex Apostolides. Read by Paul Hampton. What's He Doing in There? by Fritz Leiber. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ron Altman He went where no Martian ever went before, but would he come out, or had he gone for good? The professor was congratulating Earth's first visitor from another planet on his wisdom in getting in touch with a cultural anthropologist before contacting any other scientists, or governments, God forbid, and in learning English from radio and TV before landing from his orbit-parked rocket, when the Martian stood up and said hesitantly, "'Excuse me, please, but where is it?' That baffled the professor, and the Martian seemed to grow anxious. At least his long mouth curved upward, and he had earlier explained that it curling downward was his smile, and he repeated, "'Please, where is it?' He was surprisingly humanoid in most respects, but his complexion was textured so like the rich dark armchair he'd just been occupying that the professor's pinstriped gray suit, which he had eagerly consented to wear, seemed an arbitrary interruption between him and the chair, a sort of Mother Hubbard dress on a phantom conjured from its leather. The professor's wife, always a perceptive hostess, came to her husband's rescue by saying with equal rapidity, "'Top of the stairs, end of the hall, last door!' The Martian's mouth curled happily downward, and he said, "'Thank you very much,' and was off. Comprehension burst on the professor. He caught up with his guest at the foot of the stairs. Uh, "'Here, I'll show you the way,' he said. "'No, I can find it myself, thank you,' the Martian assured him. Something rather final in the Martian's tone made the professor desist, and after watching his visitor sway up the stairs with an almost hypnotic, softly jogging movement, he rejoined his wife in the study, saying wonderingly, "'Who'd have thought it by George? Function taboos as strict as our own!' "'I'm glad some of your professional visitors maintain em, his wife said darkly. "'But this one's from Mars, darling, and to find out he's, well, similar in an aspect of his life, is as thrilling as the discovery that water is burned hydrogen. "'When I think of the day not far distant,' when I'll put his entries in the cross-cultural index. He was still rhapsodizing when the professor's little son raced in. Pop! The Martian's gone to the bathroom! Hush, dear! Manners! Now, it's perfectly natural, darling, that the boy should notice and be excited. Uh, yes, son, the Martian's not so very different from us. "'Oh, certainly,' the professor's wife said with a trace of bitterness. "'I don't imagine his turquoise complexion will cause any comment at all when you bring him to a faculty reception. They'll just figure he's had a hard night, and that he got that baby elephant nose sniffing around for assistant professorships.' "'Really, darling?' He probably thinks of our noses as disagreeably amputated and paralyzed. Well, anyway, Pop, he's in the bathroom. I followed him when he squiggled upstairs. 
Now, son, you shouldn't have done that. He's on a strange planet, and it might make him nervous if he thought he was being spied on. We must show him every courtesy. By George, I can't wait to discuss these things with Ackerley Ramsbottom. When I think of how much more this encounter has to give the anthropologist than even the physicist or astronomer, he was still going strong on his second rhapsody when he was interrupted by another high-speed entrance. It was the professor's coltish daughter. Mom, Pop, the Martians! Hush, dear, we know. The professor's coltish daughter regained her adolescent poise, which was considerable. Well, he's still in there, she said. I just tried the door, and it was locked. I'm glad it was, the professor said, while his wife added, Yes, you can't be sure what, and caught herself. Really, dear, that was very bad manners. I thought he'd come downstairs long ago, her daughter explained. He's been in there an awfully long time. It must have been a half hour ago that I saw him gyre and gimble upstairs in that real gone way he has, with Nosy here following him. The professor's coltish daughter was currently soaking up both Jive and Alice. When the professor checked his wristwatch, his expression grew troubled. By George, he is taking his time. Though, of course, we don't know how much time Martians... I wonder. I listened for a while, Pop, his son volunteered. He was running the water a lot. Running the water, eh? We know Mars is a water-starved planet. I suppose that in the presence of unlimited water he might be seized by a kind of madness, and uh, but he seemed so well-adjusted. Then his wife spoke, voicing all their thoughts. Her outlook on life gave her a naturally sepulchral voice. What's he doing in there? Twenty minutes, and at least as many fantastic suggestions later, the professor glanced again at his watch, and nerved himself for action. Motioning his family aside, he mounted the stairs and tiptoed down the hall. He paused only once to shake his head and mutter under his breath, "'By George, I wish I had Fenchurch or Von Gottschalk here.' They're a shade better than I am on intercultural contracts, especially taboo breakings and affronts. His family followed him at a short distance. The professor stopped in front of the bathroom door. Everything was quiet as death. He listened for a minute, and then rapped measuredly, steadying his hand by clutching its wrist with the other. There was a faint splashing, but no other sound. Another minute passed. The professor rapped again. Now there was no response at all. He very gingerly tried the knob. The door was still locked. When they had retreated to the stairs, it was the professor's wife who once more voiced their thoughts. This time her voice carried overtones of supernatural horror. What, what's he doing in there? He may be dead or dying, the professor's coltish daughter suggested briskly. Maybe we ought to call the fire department, like they did for old Mrs. Frisbee. The professor winced. I'm afraid you haven't visualized the complications, dear, he said gently. No one but ourselves knows that the Martian is on Earth, or has even the slightest inkling that interplanetary travel has been achieved. Whatever we do, it will have to be on our own. But to break in on a creature engaged in, well, we don't know what primal 
private activity, is against all anthropological practice. Still, dying's a primal activity, his daughter said crisply. So's ritual bathing before mass murder, his wife added. Please, still, as I was about to say, we do have the moral duty to succor him if, as you all too reasonably suggest, he has been incapacitated by a germ or virus, or more likely by some simple environmental factor, such as Earth's greater gravity. Tell you what, Pop, I can look in the bathroom window and see what he's doing. All I have to do is crawl out my bedroom window and along the gutter a little ways. It's safe as houses. The professor's question beginning with, Son, how do you know? Died unuttered, and he refused to notice the words his daughter was voicing silently at her brother. He glanced at his wife's sardonically composed face, thought once more of the fire department, and of other and larger and even more jealous, or would it be skeptical, government agencies, and clutched at the straw offered him. Ten minutes later he was quite unnecessarily assisting his son back through the bedroom window. Gee, Pop, I couldn't see a sign of him. That's why I took so long. Hey, Pop, don't look so scared. He's in there, sure enough. It's just that the bathtub's under the window, and you have to get real close up to see into it. The Martians taking a bath? Yep, got it full up and just the end of his little old schnozzle sticking out. Your suit, Pop, was hanging on the door. The one word the professor's wife spoke was like a death knell. Drowned! No, Ma, I don't think so. His schnozzle was opening and closing regular-like. Maybe he's a shape-changer, the professor's cultish daughter said in a burst of evil fantasy. Maybe he softens in water and thins out after a while until he's like an eel, and then he'll go exploring through the sewer pipes. Wouldn't it be funny if he went under the street and knocked on the stopper from underneath and crawled into the bathtub with President Rexford? Or Mrs. President Rexford? Or maybe right into the middle of one of Janie Rexford's Oh, I'm so sexy bubble baths. Please, the professor put his hand to his eyebrows and kept it there, cuddling the elbow in his other hand. Well, have you thought of something? The professor's wife asked him after a bit. What are you going to do? The professor dropped his hand and blinked his eyes hard and took a deep breath. Telegraph Fenchurch and Ackerley Ramsbottom and then break in, he said in a resigned voice, into which, nevertheless, a note of hope seemed also to have come. First, however, I am going to wait until morning. And he sat down cross-legged in the hall, a few yards from the bathroom door, and folded his arms. So the long vigil commenced. The professor's family shared it, and he offered no objection. Other and sterner men, he told himself, might claim to be able successfully to order their children to go to bed when there was a Martian locked in the bathroom, but he would like to see them faced with the situation. Finally, dawn began to seep from the bedrooms. When the bulb in the hall had grown quite dim, the professor unfolded his arms. Just then there was a loud splashing in the bathroom. The professor's family looked toward the door. The splashing stopped, and they heard the Martian moving around. Then the door opened, and the Martian appeared in the professor's gray pinstripe suit. His mouth curled sharply downward 
in a broad alien smile as he saw the professor good morning the martian said happily i never slept better in my life even in my own little wet bed back on mars he looked around more closely and his mouth straightened but where did you all sleep he asked don't tell me you stayed dry all night you didn't give up your only bed to me his mouth curled upward in misery oh dear he said i'm afraid i've made a mistake somehow yet i don't understand how before i studied you i didn't know what your sleeping habits would be but that question was answered for me in fact it looked so reassuringly homelike when i saw those brief t v scenes of your females ready for sleep in their little tubs of course on mars only the fortunate can always be sure of sleeping wet but here with your abundance of water i thought there would be wet beds for all he paused it's true i had some doubts last night wondering if i'd used the right words and all but then when you rapped good night to me i splashed the sentiment back at you and went to sleep in a wink but i am afraid that somewhere i've blundered and no no dear chap the professor managed to say he had been waving his hand in a gentle circle for some time and token that he wanted to interrupt everything is quite all right it's true we stayed up all night but please consider that as a watch an honor guard by george which we kept to indicate our esteem end of what's he doing in there by fritz leiber Dead Ringer by Lester Del Rey. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ron Altman. Dane Phillips slouched in the window seat watching the morning crowds on their way to work, and carefully avoiding any attempt to read Jordan's old face as the editor skimmed through the notes. He had learned to make his tall, bony body seem all loose-jointed relaxation, no matter what he felt, but the oversized hands in his pockets were clenched so tightly that the nails were cutting into his palms. Every tick of the old-fashioned clock sent a throb racing through his brain. Every rustle of the pages seemed to release a fresh shot of adrenaline into his bloodstream. This time, his mind was pleading, it has to be right this time. Jordan finished his reading and shoved the folder back. He reached for his pipe sighed and then nodded slowly a nice job of researching phillips and it might make a good feature for the sunday section at that it took a second to realize that the words meant acceptance for phillips had prepared himself too thoroughly against another failure now he felt the tautened muscles release so quickly that he would have fallen if he hadn't been braced against the seat. He groped in his mind, hunting for words and finding none. There was only the hot, sudden flame of unbelieving hope, and then an almost blinding exultation. Jordan didn't seem to notice his silence. The editor made a neat pile of the notes, nodding again. 
Sure, I like it. We've been short of shock stuff lately, and the readers go for it when we can get a fresh angle. But naturally, you'd have to leave out all that nonsense on Blanding. Hell, the man's just buried, and his relatives and friends. But that's the proof. Philip stared at the editor, trying to penetrate through the haze of hope that had somehow grown chilled and unreal. His thoughts were abruptly disorganized and out of his control. Only the urgency remained. It's the key evidence, and we've got to move fast. I don't know how long it takes, but even one more day may be too late. Jordan nearly dropped the pipe from his lips as he jerked upright to peer sharply at the younger man. Are you crazy? Do you seriously expect me to get an order to exhume him now? What would it get us, other than lawsuits? Even if we could get the order without cause, which we can't. Then the pipe did fall as he gaped open-mouthed. My God, you believe all that stuff! You expected us to publish it straight. No, Dane said thickly. The hope was gone now, as if it had never existed, leaving a numb emptiness where nothing mattered. No, I guess I didn't really expect anything. But I believe the facts. Why shouldn't I? He reached for the papers with hands he could hardly control, and began stuffing them back into the folder. All the careful documentation, the fingerprints, smudged, perhaps, in some cases, but still evidence enough for anyone but a fool. Phillips? Jordan said questioningly to himself, and then his voice was taking on a new edge. Phillips! Wait a minute, I've got it now. Dane Phillips, not Arthur. Two years on the Trib. Then you turned up on the Register in Seattle? Philip Dean, or some such name there. Yeah, Dane agreed. There was no use in denying anything now. Yeah, Dane Arthur Phillips. So I suppose I'm through here? Jordan nodded again, and there was a faint look of fear in his expression. You can pick up your pay on the way out and make it quick before I change my mind and call the boys in white. It could have been worse. It had been worse before. And there was enough in the pay envelope to buy what he needed a flash camera, a little folding shovel from one of the surplus houses, and a bottle of good scotch. It would be dark enough for him to taxi out to Oak Haven Cemetery, where Blanding had been buried. It wouldn't change the minds of the fools, of course, even if he could drag back what he might find without the change being completed. They wouldn't accept the evidence. He'd been crazy to think anything could change their minds. And they called him a fanatic. If the facts he'd dug up in ten years of hunting wouldn't convince them, nothing would. And yet he had to see for himself before it was too late. He picked a cheap hotel at random and checked in under an assumed name. He couldn't go back to his room while there was a chance that Jordan still might try to turn him in. There wouldn't be time for Sylvia's detectives to bother him, probably, but there was the ever-present danger that one of the aliens might intercept the message. He shivered. He'd been risking that for ten years, yet the likelihood was still a horror to him. The uncertainty made it harder to take than any human-devised torture could be. There was no way of guessing what an alien might do to anyone who discovered that all men were not human. 
that some were zombies. There was the classic syllogism. All men are mortal. I am a man. Therefore I am mortal. But not Blanding or Corporal Harding. It was Harding's death that had started it all during the fighting on Guadalcanal. A grenade had come flying into the foxhole where Dane and Harding had felt reasonably safe. The concussion had knocked Dane out, possibly saving his life when the enemy thought he was dead. He'd come, too, in the daylight to see Harding lying there, mangled and twisted, with his throat torn. There was blood on Dane's uniform, obviously spattered from the dead man. It hadn't been a mistake or delusion. Harding had been dead. It had taken Dane two days of crawling and hiding to get back to his group, too exhausted to report Harding's death. He'd slept for twenty hours, and when he awoke, Harding had been standing beside him, with a whole throat and a fresh uniform, grinning and kidding him for running off and leaving a stunned friend behind. It was no ringer, but Harding himself, complete to the smallest personal memories and personality traits. The pressures of war probably saved Dane's sanity while he learned to face the facts. All men are mortal. Harding is not mortal. Therefore Harding is not a man. Nor was Harding alone. Dane found enough evidence to know there were others. The Tribune morgue yielded even more data. A man had faced seven firing squads and walked away. Another survived over a dozen attacks by professional killers. Fingerprints turned up mysteriously copied from those of men long dead. Some of the aliens seemed to heal almost instantly. Others took days. Some operated completely alone. Some seemed to have joined with others. But they were legion. Lack of a clearer pattern of attack made him consider the possibility of human mutation, but such tissue was too wildly different, and the invasion had begun long before atomics or X-rays. He gave up trying to understand their alien motivations. It was enough that they existed in secret, slowly growing in numbers, while mankind was unaware of them. When his proof was complete and irrefutable, he took it to his editor, to be fired politely but coldly. Other editors were less polite, but he went on doggedly trying and failing. What else could he do? Somehow he had to find the few people who could recognize facts and warn them. The aliens would get him, of course, when the story broke, but a warned humanity could cope with them. Ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Then he met Sylvia by accident, after losing his fifth job, a girl who had inherited a fortune big enough to spread his message in paid ads across the country. They were married before he found she was hard-headed about her money. She demanded a full explanation for every cent beyond his allowance. In the end, she got the explanation, and while he was trying to cash the check she gave him, she visited Dr. Buell to come back with a squad of quiet, refined, strong-arm boys who made sure Dane reached Buell's rest home safely. Hydrotherapy, Buell as the kindly, firm father image. Analysis. 
hypnosis that stripped every secret from him, including his worst childhood nightmare. His father had committed a violent bloody suicide after one of the many quarrels with Dane's mother. Dane had found the body. Two nights after the funeral, he had dreamed of his father's face, horror filled at the window. He knew now that it was a normal nightmare, caused by being forced to look at the face in the coffin, but the shock had lasted for years. It had bothered him again after his discovery of the aliens, until a thorough check had proved without doubt that his father had been fully human, with a human, if tempestuous, childhood behind him. Dr. Buell was delighted. You see, Dane, you know it was a nightmare, but you don't really believe it even now. Your father was an alien monster to you. No adult is quite human to a child. And that literal-minded self, your subconscious, saw him after he died. So there are alien monsters who return from death. Then you come to from a concussion. Harding is sprawled out unconscious, covered with blood, probably your blood, since you say he wasn't wounded later. But after seeing your father, you can't associate blood with yourself. You see it as a horrible wound on Harding. When he turns out to be alive, you're still in partial shock, with your subconscious dominant. And that has the answer already. There are monsters who come back from the dead. An exaggerated reaction, but nothing really abnormal. We'll have you out of here in no time. No non-directive psychiatry for Buell. The man beamed paternally, chuckling as he added what he must have considered the clincher. Anyhow, even zombies can't stand fire, Dane, so you can stop worrying about Harding. I checked up on him. He was burned to a crisp in a hotel fire two months ago. It was logical enough to shake Dane's faith until he came across Milo Blanding's picture in a magazine article on society in St. Louis. According to the item, Milo was a cousin of the Blandings, whose father had vanished in Chile as a young man, and who had just rejoined the family. The picture was of Harding. An alien could have gotten away by simply committing suicide and being carried from the rest home, but Dane had to do it the hard way, watching his chance and using commando tactics on a guard who had come to accept him as a harmless nut. In St. Louis, he'd used the purloined letter technique to hide, going back to newspaper work and using almost his real name. It had seemed to work, too, but he'd been less lucky about Harding-Blanding. The man had been in Europe on some kind of a tour until his return only this last week. Dane had seen him just once then, but long enough to be sure it was Harding, before he died again. This time it was in a drunken auto accident that seemed to be none of his fault, but left his body a mangled wreck. It was almost dark when Dane dismissed the taxi at the false address, a mile from the entrance to the cemetery. He watched it turn back down the road, then picked up the valise with his camera and folding shovel. 
He shivered as he moved reluctantly ahead. War had proved that he would never be a brave man, and the old fears of darkness and graveyards were still strong in him. But he had to know what the coffin contained now if it wasn't already too late. It represented the missing link in his picture of the aliens. What happened to them during the period of regrowth? Did they revert to their natural form? Were they at all conscious while the body reshaped itself into wholeness? Dane had puzzled over it night after night with no answer. Nor could he figure how they could escape from the grave. Perhaps a man could force his way out of some of the coffins he had inspected. The soil would still be soft and loose in the grave, and a lot of the coffins and the boxes around them were strong in appearance only. A determined creature that could exist without much air for long enough might make it. But there were other caskets that couldn't be cracked at least without the aid of outside help. What happened when a creature that could survive even the poison of embalming fluids and the draining of all the blood woke up in such a coffin? Dane's mind skittered from it as always, and then came back to it reluctantly. There were still accounts of corpses, turned up with the nails and hair grown long in the grave. Could normal tissues stand the current tricks of the morticians to have life enough for such growth? The possibility was absurd. Those cases had to be aliens, ones who hadn't escaped. Even they must die eventually in such a case, after weeks and months it took time for hair to grow. And there were stories of corpses that had apparently fought and twisted in their coffins still. What was it like for an alien, then, going slowly mad while it waited for true death? How long did madness take? He shivered again, but went steadily on, while the cemetery fence appeared in the distance. He'd seen Blanding's coffin and the big solid metal casket around it that couldn't be cracked by any amount of effort and strength. He was sure the creature was still there, unless it had a confederate. But that wouldn't matter. An empty coffin would also be proof. Dane avoided the main gate, unsure about whether there would be a watchman or not. A hundred feet away there was a tree near the ornamental spikes of the iron fence. He threw his bag over and began shinnying up. It was difficult, but he made it finally, dropping onto the soft grass beyond. There was the trace of the moon at times through the clouds, but it hadn't betrayed him and there had been no alarm wire along the top of the fence. He moved from shadow to shadow, his hair prickling along the base of his neck. Locating the right grave in the darkness was harder than he had expected, even with an occasional brief use of the small flashlight. But at last he found the marker that was serving until the regular monument could arrive. His hands were sweating so much that it was hard to use the small shovel, but the digging of foxholes had given him experience, and the ground was still soft from the grave digger's work. He stopped once as the moon came out briefly. Again, a sound in the darkness above left him hovering and sick in the hole, but it must have been only some animal. He uncovered the top of the casket with hands already blistering. Then he cursed as he realized the catches were near the bottom, making his work even harder. He reached them at last, fumbling them open. 
the metal top of the casket seemed to be a dome of solid lead and he had no room to maneuver but it began swinging up reluctantly until he could feel the polished wood of the coffin dane reached for the lid with hands he could barely control fear was thick in his throat now what could an alien do to a man who discovered it would it be harding there or some monstrous thing still changing how long did it take a revived monster to go mad when it found no way to escape he gripped the shovel in one hand working at the lid with the other now abruptly his nerves steadied as they had done whenever he was in real battle he swung the lid up and began groping for the camera his hand went into the silk-lined interior and found nothing he was too late either harding had gotten out somehow before the final ceremony or a confederate had already been here the coffin was empty there were no warning sounds this time only hands that slipped under his arms and across his mouth lifting him easily from the grave a match flared briefly and he was looking into the face of buell's chief strong-arm man hello mr phillips promise to be quiet and we'll release you okay at dane's sickened nod he gestured to the others let him go and tom better get that filled in we don't want any trouble from this surprise came from the grave a moment later hey burke there is no corpse here burke's words killed any hopes dane had at once so what ever hear of cremation lots of people use a regular coffin for the ashes he wasn't cremated dane told him you can check up on that but he knew it was useless sure mr phillips we'll do that the tone was one reserved for humoring madmen burke turned gesturing better come along mr phillips your wife and dr buell are waiting at the hotel the gate was open now but there was no sign of a watchman if one worked here sylvia's money would have taken care of that of course dane went along quietly sitting in the rubble of his hopes while the big car purred through the morning and on down lindell boulevard toward the hotel once he shivered and burke dug out hot brandied coffee they had thought of everything including a coat to cover his dirt-soiled clothes as they took him up the elevator to where buell and sylvia were waiting for him she had been crying obviously but there were no tears or recriminations when she came over to kiss him funny she must still love him as he'd learned to his surprise he loved her under different circumstances so you found me he asked needlessly of buell he was operating on purely automatic habits now the reaction from the night and his failure numbing him emotionally jordan got in touch with you buell smiled back at him we knew where you were all along dane but as long as you acted normal we hoped it might be better than the home too bad we couldn't stop you before you got all mixed up in this so i suppose i'm committed to your booby hatch again buell nodded refusing to resent the term i'm afraid so dane for a while anyhow you'll find your clothes in that room why don't you clean up a little take a hot bath maybe you'll feel better dane went in surprised when no guards followed him 
but they had thought of everything. What looked like a screen on the window had been recently installed, and it was strong enough to prevent his escape. Blessed are the poor, for they shall be poorly guarded. He was turning on the shower when he heard the sound of voices coming through the door. He left the water running and came back to listen. Sylvia was speaking. Seems so logical, so completely rational. It makes him a dangerous person, Buell answered, and there was no false warmth in his voice now. Sylvia, you've got to admit it to yourself. All the reason and analysis in the world won't convince him he's wrong. This time we'll have to use shock treatment. Burn over those memories. Fade them out. It's the only possible course. There was a pause and then a sigh. I suppose you're right. Dane didn't wait to hear more. He drew back while his mind fought to accept the hideous reality. Shock treatment. The works, if what he knew of psychiatry was correct, enough of it to erase his memories, a part of himself. It wasn't therapy Buell was considering. It couldn't be. It was the answer of an alien that had a human in its hands, one who knew too much. He might have guessed. What better place for an alien than in the guise of a psychiatrist? Where else was there the chance for all the refined modern torture needed to burn out a man's mind? Dane had spent ten years in fear of being discovered by them, and now Buell had him. Sylvia? He couldn't be sure. Probably she was human. It wouldn't make any difference. There was nothing he could do through her. Either she was part of the game, or she really thought him mad. Dane tried the window again, but it was hopeless. There would be no escape this time. Buell couldn't risk it. The shock treatment, or whatever Buell would use under the name of shock treatment, would begin at once. It would be easy to slip, to use an overdose of something, to make sure Dane was killed or there were ways of making sure it didn't matter. They could leave him alive, but take his mind away. In alien hands, human psychiatry could do worse than all the medieval torture chambers. The sickness grew in his stomach as he considered the worst that could happen. Death he could accept, if he had to, he could even face the chance of torture by itself, as he had accepted the danger while trying to have his facts published. But to have his mind taken from him, a step at a time, to watch his personality, his ego, rotted away under him, and to know that he would wind up as a drooling idiot— he made his decision almost as quickly as he had come to realize what Buell must be. There was a razor in the medicine chest. It was a safety razor, of course, but the blade was sharp, and it would be big enough. There was no time for careful planning. One of the guards might come in at any moment if they thought he was taking too long. Some fear came back as he leaned over the wash-basin, staring at his throat, fingering the suddenly murderous blade. But the pain wouldn't last long, a lot less than there would be under shock treatment, and less pain. He'd read enough to feel sure of that. Twice he braced himself and failed at the last second. His mind flashed out in wild schemes, fighting against what it knew had to be done. The world still had to be warned. If he could escape somehow, if he could still find a way, he couldn't quit, no matter how impossible things looked. But he knew better. 
there was nothing one man could do against the aliens in this world they had taken over. He'd never had a chance. Man had been chained already by carefully developed ridicule against superstition, by carefully indoctrinated gobbledygook about insanity, persecution complexes, and all the rest. For a second, Dane even considered the possibility that he was insane, but he knew it was only a blind effort to cling to life. There had been no insanity in him when he'd groped for evidence in the coffin and found it empty. He leaned over the wash basin, his eyes focused on his throat, and his hand came down and around, carrying the razor blade through a lethal semicircle. Dane Phillips watched fear give place to sickness on his face, as the pain lanced through him and the blood spurted. He watched horror creep up to replace the sickness while the bleeding stopped and the gash began closing. By the time he recognized his expression, as the same one he'd seen on his father's face at the window so long ago, the wound was completely healed. End of Dead Ringer by Lester Del Rey Me, Myself, and I by William Ten Writing as Kenneth Putnam This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Recording by Barry Howarth Me, Myself, and I by William Ten don't you think you might look up from that comic book long enough to get interested in a last-minute briefing on the greatest adventure undertaken by man? After all, it's your noodle neck that's going to be risked. Professor Ruddle throbbed his annoyance clear up to his thin white hair. McCarthy shifted his quid and pursed his lips. He stared dreamily at an enamelled wash basin fifteen feet from the huge, box-like coil of wire and transparencies on which the professor had been working. Suddenly a long brown stream leaped from his mouth and struck a brass faucet with a loud ping. The professor jumped. McCarthy smiled. Name ain't Noodle Neck, he drawled. Goose Neck. Goose Neck McCarthy. Known and respected in every hobo jungle in the country, including here in North Carolina. And looky, bub, all I wanted was a cup of coffee and a pair of sinkers. Time machine's your notion. Doesn't it be anything to you that you will shortly be 110 million years in the past? A past in which no recognisable ancestors of man existed? That your opportunities to nap? Blathersham University's greatest physicist grimaced disgustedly. He stared through thick lenses at the stringy, wind-hardened derelict whom he was shortly going to trust with his life's work. A granite-like head set on a remarkably long, thin neck, a body whose limbs were equally extended, clothes limited to a faded khaki turtleneck sweater, patched brown corduroy pants, and a worn-out pair of heavy brogans. He sighed. And the fate of human knowledge and progress depend on you. When you wandered up the mountain to my shack two days ago, you were broke and hungry. You didn't have a dime. Had a dime? Only it was lead. All right, all right. So you had a lead dime. I took you in, gave you a good hot meal, and offered to pay you one hundred dollars to take my time machine on its maiden voyage. Don't you think? Bing! This time it was the hot water faucet. 
That the very least you could do, the little physicist's voice was rising hysterically, the very least would be to pay enough attention to the facts I make available to ensure that the experiment will be a success. Do you realise what fantastic disruption you might cause in the time stream by one careless slip? McCarthy rose suddenly, and the brightly coloured comic magazine slid to the floor in a litter of coils, gauges and paper covered with formulae. He advanced toward the professor, whom he topped by at least a foot. His employer gripped a wrench nervously. Now, Mr. Professor Ruddle, he said, with gentle emphasis, if and you don't think I know enough, why don't you go yourself, huh? The little man smiled at him placatingly. And now, don't get stubborn again, Swan Neck. Goose Neck. Goose Neck McCarthy. You can be the most irascible person I've ever met. More stubborn than Professor Dutterall, for that matter. And he's that short-sighted mathematician back at Blathersham who insisted, in spite of irrefutable evidence, that a time machine would not work. Even when I showed him Quartzine and demonstrated its peculiar time-dissolving properties, he wasn't convinced. The university refused to grant an application for my research, and I had to come out here in North Carolina. On my own time and money, too. He brooded angrily on unreasonable mathematicians and parsimonious trustees. Still ain't answered my question. Ruddle looked up. He blushed a little under the fine, wild tendrils of white hair. Well, it's just that I'm rather valuable to society, what with my paper on intra-reversible positrons still uncompleted. Whereas everything points to the machine being a huge success, it's conceivable Dutterall considered some point which I, um, overlooked. Meaning there's a chance I might not come back? Um, well, something like that. No danger, you understand. I've gone over the formulae again and again, and they are foolproof. It's just barely possible that some minor error, some cube root that wasn't brought out to the farthest decimal. The tramp put his hands in his pockets. Even that's so, he announced. I want that check before I leave. Not taking my chances on something going wrong and you not paying me. Professor Ruddle gulped. Sure, Rubberneck, he said. Sure. Gooseneck. How many times... Only make it out for my real first name. It's... The tramp's voice dropped to a whisper. It's Galahad. The physicist added a final scribble to the green paper rectangle, ripped it out and handed it to McCarthy. Pay to the order of Galahad McCarthy $100.00 on the Beet and Tobacco Exchange Bank of North Carolina. Ruddle watched while the check was carefully placed in the outer breast pocket of the ancient sweater. He picked up an expensive miniature camera and slung its carrying strap around his employee's neck. Now, this is fully loaded. You sure you can operate the shutter? All you do... I know, all right. Fooled around with these doohickeys before. Been playing with this one for two days. You want me to step out of the machine, take a couple of snaps of the scenery and move a rock. And nothing else. Remember, you're going back 110 million years, and any action on your part might have an incalculable effect on the present. You might wipe out the whole human race by stepping on one furry little animal who was its ancestor. I think that moving a rock slightly will be a good first innocuous experiment, but be careful. They moved toward the great transparent housing at the end of the laboratory. Through its foot-thick walls, the red, black and silver equipment in one corner shone hazily. An enormous lever protruded from the maze of wiring like a metallic forefinger. You should arrive in the Cretaceous period, the middle period of the Age of Reptiles. Most of North America was underwater, but geological investigation shows an island on this spot. You've been over this 16 times. Just show me what dingus to pull and let me go. Ruddle executed a little dance that a student of modern ballet might have called Man with High Blood Pressure About to Blow His Top. Dingus, he screeched, you don't pull any dingus. You gently depress, gently, you hear, the chrono transit, that large black lever, thus sliding the quartzine door shut and starting the machine. When you arrive, you lift it, again, gently, and the door will open. 
The machine is set to go back a given number of years so that fortunately you have no thinking to do. McCarthy stared down at him easily. <laughs> you make a lot of cracks for a little guy. I'll bet you're scared stiff of your wife. I'm not married, Ruddle told him shortly. I don't believe in the institution, he remembered. Who was talking about marriage? At a time like this, when I think of allowing a stubborn, stupid character like yourself to run loose with a device having the immense potentialities of a time machine, of course I'm far too valuable to be risked in the first jerry-built model. Yeah, McCarthy nodded. Ain't it the truth? He patted the check protruding from his sweater pocket and leaped up into the machine. I'm not. He depressed the chrono transit lever, gently. The door slid shut on Professor Ruddle's frantic last word. A goodbye, turtleneck, and be careful, please. Gooseneck, McCarthy automatically corrected. The machine seemed to jerk. He had a last distorted glimpse of Ruddle's shaggy white head through the quartzine walls. The professor, alarm and doubt mixed on his face, seemed to be praying. Incredibly bright sunlight blazed through the thick bluish clouds. The time machine rested on the waterline of a beach to whose edge the lushest jungle ever had rushed and stopped abruptly. The semi-transparent walls enabled him to see enormous green masses of horsetails and convoluted ivy, giant ferns and luxuriant palms, steaming slightly, rich and ominous with life. Lift the dingus gently, McCarthy murmured to himself. He stepped through the open doors into an ankle depth of water. The tide was evidently in and white-flecked water gurgled around the base of the squat edifice that had brought him. Well, Ruddle had said this was going to be an island. Reckon I'm lucky he didn't build his laboratory shack fifty or sixty feet further down the mountain. He sloshed ashore, avoiding a little school of dun-coloured sponges. The professor might like a picture of them, he decided. He adjusted the speed of the lens and focused it on the sponges. Then a couple of pictures of the sea and the jungle. Huge leathery wings beat over a spot two miles in from the edge of the luxuriant vegetation. McCarthy recognised the awesome, bat-like creature from drawings the professor had shown him. A pterodactyl, the reptilian version of bird life. The tramp snapped a hasty photograph and backed nervously toward the time machine. He didn't like the looks of that long pointed beak, so ferociously armed with jagged teeth. Some living thing moved in the jungle under the pterodactyl. It plummeted down like a fallen angel, jaws agape and slavering. McCarthy made certain that it was being kept busy, then moved rapidly up the beach. Near the edge of the jungle he observed a round reddish rock. It would do. The rock was heavier to budge than he had thought. He strained at it, cursing and perspiring under the hot sun. His feet sank into the clinging loam. Abruptly the rock tore loose. With a sucking sound it came out of the loam and rolled over onto its side. It left a moist round hole out of which a centipede, fully as long as his arm, scuttled away into the underbrush. A nauseous stink arose from the spot where the centipede had lain. McCarthy decided he didn't like this place. Might as well head back. Before he depressed the lever, the tramp took one last look at the red rock, the underside somewhat darker than the rest. A hundred bucks worth of tilt. So this is what work is like, he soliloquised. Maybe I've been missing out on something. After the rich sunlight of the Cretaceous, the laboratory seemed smaller than he remembered it. The professor came up to him breathlessly as he stepped from the time machine. How did it go? he demanded eagerly. McCarthy stared down at the top of the old man's head. Everything okay? he replied slowly. Hey, Professor Ruddle, what for did you go and shave your head? There wasn't much of it, but that white hair looked sort of distinguished. Hair? Shave? I've been completely bald for years. Lost my hair long before it turned white. And my name is Guggles, not Ruddle. Guggles. Try and remember that for a while. Now, let me see the camera. 
As he slipped the carrying strap over his head and handed the instrument over, the tramp pursed his lips. Could have sworn you had a little patch of white up there. Could have sworn. Uh, sorry about the name, Prof. We never seem to be able to get together on these things. The professor grunted and started for the dark room with the camera. Halfway there he stopped and almost cringed as a huge female form stepped through the far doorway. Aloysius! came a voice that approximated a corkscrew in the air. Aloysius, I told you yesterday that if that tramp wasn't out of my house in 24 hours, experiment or not, you'd hear from me. Aloysius, you have exactly 37 minutes. Uh, y -y yes, dear, Professor Guggles whispered at her broad retreating back. We, we, we've almost finished. Who's that? McCarthy demanded the moment she had left. My wife, of course. You must remember her. She made your breakfast when you arrived. Didn't make my breakfast. Made my own breakfast. And you said you weren't married. Now you're being silly, Mr Gallagher. I've been married for 25 years, and I know how futile it is to deny it. I couldn't have said any such thing. Name's not Gallagher. It's McCarthy. Gooseneck McCarthy, the tramp told him querulously. What's happened here? You can't even remember my last name now, let alone my first. You change your own name, you shave your head, you get married in a hurry, and, and you try and tell me that I let some female woman cook my breakfast when I can wrestle up a better tasting, better eating. Hold it! The little man had approached and was plucking at his sleeve eagerly. Hold it, Mr Gallagher, or Gooseneck, or whatever your name is. Suppose you tell me exactly what you consider this place to have been like before you left. Gooseneck told him. And that thingamajig was laying on that whatchamacallit instead of under it, he finished lamely. The professor thought. And all you did, when you went back into the past, was to move a rock? That's all. One hell of a big centipede jumped out, but I didn't touch it. Just moved the rock and headed back, like you said. Yes, of course. Hmm, that may have been it. The centipede jumping out of the rock may have altered subsequent events sufficiently to make me a married man instead of a blissful single one, to have changed my name from Ruddle to Guggles, or the rock itself. Such an intrinsically simple act as moving the rock must have had much larger consequences than I had imagined. Just think, if that rock had not been moved, I might not be married. A Gallagher? McCarthy, the tramp corrected resignedly. Uh, whatever you call yourself, listen to me. You're going back in the time machine and shift that rock back to its original position. Once that's done, if I go back again, I get another hundred. How can you talk of money at a time like this? What's the difference between this and any other time? Why, here I am married, my work interrupted, and you chatter about, oh, all right, here's the money. The professor tore his checkbook out and hastily scribbled on a blank. Here you are. Satisfied? McCarthy puzzled over the cheque. This isn't like Tuffer. This is on a different bank, the Cotton Growers Exchange. That makes no difference, the professor told him hastily, bundling him into the time machine. It's a cheque, isn't it? Just as good, believe me, just as good. As the little man fiddled with dials and adjusted switches, he called over his shoulder. Remember, get that rock as close to its original position as you can, and touch nothing else. Do nothing else. I know, I know. Hey, Prof, how come I remember all these changes and you don't, with all your science and all? Simple, the professor told him, toddling briskly out of the machine. By being in the past and the time machine, while these temporal adjustments to your act made themselves felt, you were, in a sense, insulated against them, just as a pilot suffers no direct personal damage from the bomb his plane releases over a city. Now, I've set the machine to return to approximately the same moment as before. Unfortunately, my chrono-transit calibrations can never be sufficiently exact. Do you remember how to operate the apparatus? If you don't... McCarthy sighed and depressed the lever, shutting the door on the professor's flowing explanations and perspiring bald head. He was back by the pounding surf off the little island. He paused for a moment before opening the door as he caught sight of a strange transparent object just a little further up the beach. Another time machine. 
and exactly like his. Oh well, the Professor will explain it. He started up the beach toward the rock. Then he stopped again, a dead stop this time. The rock lay ahead, as he remembered it before the shifting. But there was a man at it, a tall, thin man in a turtleneck sweater and brown corduroy pants. McCarthy got his flapping jaw back under control. Hey! Hey, you with the rock! Don't move it! It's not supposed to be moved! He hurried over. The stranger turned. He had the ugliest face McCarthy remembered having seen on a human being. His neck was ridiculously long and thin. He examined McCarthy slowly. He reached into his pocket and came out with a soiled package. He bit off a chore of tobacco. McCarthy reached into his pocket and came up with an identically soiled mass of tobacco. He also took a bite. They chewed and stared at each other. Then they spat simultaneously. What do you mean this rock ain't supposed to be moved? Professor Ruddle told me to move it. Well, Professor Ruddle told me not to move it. And Professor Guggles, McCarthy added as a triumphant clincher. The other considered him for a moment, his jaw working like a peculiar cam. His eyes travelled up McCarthy's spare body. Then he spat contemptuously and turned to the rock. He grunted against it. McCarthy sighed and put a hand on his shoulder. He spun him around. What for you have to go and act so stubborn, fella? Now I'll have to lick you. Without changing his vacant expression to one of the slightest hostility, the stranger aimed a prodigious kick at his groin. McCarthy dodged easily. That was an old hobo trick. He chopped out rapidly against the man's face. The stranger ducked, moved away and came back fighting. This was a perfect spot for the famous McCarthy 1-2. McCarthy fainted to his left, seemingly concentrating all his power at the other's middle. He noticed that his opponent was also making some awkward gesture with his left. Then he came out of nowhere with the terrific right uppercut. Wham! Right on the... on the button. McCarthy sat up and shook his head clear of bright little lights and happy hums. He had connected, but... So had the other guy. He sat several feet from McCarthy, looking dazed, and said, You are the stubbornest cuss I ever saw. Where'd you learn my punch? Your punch? They rose, glowering at each other. Listen, bub, that here is my own Sunday punch, copyrighted, patented, and incorporated. But this ain't getting us nowhere. No, it ain't. What do we do now? I don't care if I have to fight you for the next million years, but I was paid to move that rock and I'm going to move it. McCarthy shifted the quid of tobacco. Looky here, you've been paid to move that rock by Professor Ruddle or Guggles or whatever he is by now. If I go back and get a note from him saying you're not to move that rock and you keep the check anyways, will you promise to squat still till I get back? The stranger chewed and spat chewed and spat. McCarthy marvelled at their perfect synchronisation. They both spat the same distance, too. He wasn't such a bad guy, if only he wouldn't be so stubborn. Strange. He was wearing a camera like the one old Ruddle had taken from him. OK, you go back and get the note. I'll wait here. The stranger dropped to the ground and stretched out. McCarthy turned and hurried back to the time machine before he could change his mind. He was pleased to notice, as he stepped down into the laboratory again, that the professor had re-won his gentle patch of white hair. Say, this is getting real complicated. How'd you make out with the wife? Wife? What wife? The wife. The battle axe. The ball and chain. The steady skirt, McCarthy clarified. I'm not married. I told you I considered it a barbarous custom, entirely unworthy of a truly civilised man. Now stop babbling and give me that camera. But... McCarthy felt his way very carefully. But don't you remember taking the camera from me, Professor Ruddle? Not Ruddle. Rudels. Rudels. Ooh, as in goose face. And how could I have taken the camera from you when you've just returned? You're dithering, Mr. McCarney. I don't like ditherers. Stop it! McCarthy shook his head. 
forbearing to correct the mispronunciation of his name. He began to feel a vague, gnawing wish that he had never started this combination merry-go-round and slap-happy funhouse. Look, Prof, sit down. He spread a great hand against the little man's chest, forcing him into a chair. We're going to have another talk. I gotta bring you up to date. Fifteen minutes later he was winding down. So this character says he'll wait until I get back with the note. If you want a wife, don't give me the note and he'll move the rock. I don't care one way or t'other myself. I just want to get out of here. Professor Ruddle, Duggles, Rudels, closed his eyes. My, he gasped. Then he shuddered. Married to that Battle axe, that st st steady skirt? No! Uh, McCarney or McCarthy, listen, you must go back. I'll give you a note. Another check. Here. He tore a page from his notebook, filled it rapidly with desperate words. Then he made out another check. McCarthy glanced at the slips. Another bank, he remarked wonderingly. This time the Southern Peanut Trust Company. I hope all these different checks are going to be good. Certainly, the professor assured him loudly. They will all be good. You go ahead and take care of this matter, and we'll settle it to everyone's satisfaction when you return. You tell this other McCarney that... McCarthy. Hey, what do you mean, this other McCarney? I'm the only McCarthy. Only gooseneck McCarthy, anyway. If you send a dozen different guys out to do the same job... I didn't send anyone but you. Don't you understand what happened? You went back into the Cretaceous to move a rock. You returned to the present, and, as you say, found me in somewhat unfortunate circumstances. You returned to the past to undo the damage to approximately the same spot in space and time as before. It could not be exactly the same spot because of a multitude of unknown factors and because of the inescapable errors in the first time machine. Very well. You, we'll call you U1, met U2 at the very moment U2 is preparing to move the rock. You stop him. If you hadn't, if he hadn't been interrupted in any way and had shifted that stone, he would have become U1. But because he, or rather you, didn't, he is slightly different from you, being a you who has merely made one trip into the past and not even moved the rock. Whereas you, you one, have made two trips, have both moved the rock yourself and prevented yourself from moving it. It's really very simple, isn't it? McCarthy stroked his chin and sucked in a great gasp of air. Yeah, he mumbled wildly. Simple ain't the word for it. The professor hopped into the machine and began preparing it for another trip. Now, as to what happened to me, once you, you one again, prevented you two from moving that rock, you immediately precipitated uh, not so much a change as a, an unchange in my personal situation. The rock had not been shifted, therefore I had not been married, was not married, and let us hope will never be married. I was also no longer bald, but by the very fact of the presence of the two yous in the past, by virtue of some microscopic form of life you killed with your breath, let us say, or some sand you impressed with your feet, sufficient alterations were made right through to the present so that my name was, and always had been, Rudolph, and your name is probably McTavish by now, McCarthy yelled. Look, Prof, are you through with the machine? Yes, it's all ready, the professor grimaced thoughtfully. The only thing I can't place is what happened to the camera you said I took from you. Now, if you won in the personification of you two, McCarthy planted his right foot in the small of the little man's back and shoved. I'm going to get this thing settled and come back and never, never, never go near one of these dinguses again. He yanked at the chrono transit. The last he saw of the professor was a confused picture of broken glassware, tangled electrical equipment, and indignantly waving white hair. This time he materialised at the very edge of the beach. Getting closer all the time, he mumbled as he stepped out of the housing. Now, to hand over the note, then... then... Great suffering two-tailed exploding catfish! There were two men fighting near a red rock. They wore identical clothes, they had identical features and physical construction, including the same lanky forms and long stringy necks. They fought in a weird pattern of mirror imagery, 
each man swinging the same blows as his opponent, right arm crossing right, left crossing left. The man with his back to the rock had an expensive miniature camera suspended from his neck. The other one hadn't. Suddenly they both fainted with their lefts in perfect preparation for what hundreds of railroad bulls had come to curse as the gooseneck McCarthy won too. Both men ignored the feint. Both came up suddenly with their right hands and they knocked each other out. They came down heavily on their butts about a yard apart, shaking their heads. You are the stubbornest cuss I ever saw, one of them began. Where did you learn my punch? McCarthy finished, stepping forward. They both sprang to their feet, stared at him. Hey, said the man with the camera, you two guys are twins. His former opponent differed with him. You mean you two guys are twins? Wait a minute. McCarthy stepped between them before their angry glances at each other could be translated into action. We're all twins. I mean triplets. I mean, sit down. I got something to tell you. They all squatted slowly, suspiciously. Four chores of tobacco later, there was a little circle of dark nicotine juice all around them. McCarthy was breathing hard, all three of him. So it's like I'm McCarthy 1 because I've seen this thing through up to where I stop McCarthy 2 from going back to get the note that McCarthy 3 wants from Ruddle. The man with the camera rose and the other followed. The only thing I don't get, he said finally, is that I'm McCarthy 3. Seems to me it's more like I'm McCarthy 1. He's McCarthy 2. That part's right. And you're McCarthy 3. Uh-uh. McCarthy too objected. You've got it all wrong. The way I look at it, now seeing if this doesn't sound right, is that I'm McCarthy one, you're... Hold it! Hold it! The two men who had been fighting turned to McCarthy one. I know I'm McCarthy one. How do you know? They demanded. Because that's the way Professor Ruddle explained it to me. He didn't explain it to you, did he? I'm McCarthy run, all right? You two are the stubbornest bindle stiffs I've seen, and I've seen them all. Now let's get back. Wait a minute. How do I know I'm still ain't supposed to move this rock? Just because you say so? Because I say so, and because Professor Ruddle says so in that note I showed you. And because there are two of us who don't want to move it, and we can knock you silly if and you try. At McCarthy 2's nod of approval, McCarthy 3 glanced around reluctantly for a weapon. Seeing one, he started back to the time machines. McCarthy's one and two hurried abreast. Let's go in mine. It's closest. They all turned and entered the machine of McCarthy one. What about the checks? Why should you have three checks and McCarthy two have two while I only got one? Do I get my cut? Wait till we get back to the professor. He'll settle it. Can't you think of anything else but money? McCarthy one asked wearily. No, we can't, McCarthy too told him. I want my share of that third check. I got a right to it. More than this dopey guy has, see? OK, OK, we'll get back to the lab. McCarthy 1 pushed down on the chrono transit. The island and the bright sunlight disappeared. They waited. Darkness. Hey, McCarthy 2 shouted. Where's the lab? Where's Professor Ruddle? McCarthy 1 tugged at the chrono transit. It wouldn't move. The other two came over and pulled at it too. The chrono transit remained solidly in place. You must have pushed down too hard, McCarthy 3 yelled. You busted it. Yeah, from McCarthy 2. Whoever told you you could run a time machine? You busted it and now we're stranded. Wait a minute, wait a minute. McCarthy 1 pushed them back. I got an idea. You know what happened? The three of us tried to come back to, to the present, like Professor Ruddle says. But only one of us belongs in the present. See what I mean? So with the three of us inside, the machine just can't go anywhere. Well, that's easy, said McCarthy 3. I'm the only real... Don't be crazy. I know I'm the real McCarthy. I feel it. Wait, McCarthy 1 told them. This ain't getting us any place. The air's getting bad in here. Let's go back and argued it out. He pushed the lever down again. 
So they went back 110 million years to discuss the matter reasonably. And when they arrived, what do you think they found? Yep, exactly. That's exactly what they found. End of Me, Myself and I by William Tan. Writing is Kenneth Putnam. Recording by Barry Howarth, Brisbane, Australia. The Fight of the Good Ship Clarissa by Ray Bradbury. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Dale Grothman. The Fight of the Good Ship Clarissa by Ray Bradbury. The space rocket Clarissa was nine days out from Venus. The members of the crew were also out for nine days. They were hunters, fearless expeditionists, who bagged game in Venusian jungles. At the start of our story, they are busy bagging their pants, not to forget their eyes. A sort of lull has fallen over the ship. Note, a lull is a time warp that frequently attacks rockets and seduces its members into a siesta. It was during this lull that Anthony Quelch sat sprawled at his typewriter, looking as baggy as a bag of unripened grapefruit. Anthony Quelch, the cosmic clamor boy, with a face like turned linoleum on the third term. Busy writing a book, fascism is communism with a shave, for which he would receive 367 rubles, 10 paziskas, and incarceration in a cinema showing Gone with the Wind. The boys upstairs were throwing a party in the control room. They had been throwing the same party so long, the party looked like a worn-out first edition of a trapeze artist. There is doubt in our mind as to whether they were trying to break the party up, or just do the morning mopping and break the lease simultaneously. Arms, legs, and heads littered the deck. The boys, it seemed, threw a party at the drop of a chin. Sort of a space cataclysm with rules and little regulation. Kind of an atomic convulsion in the front parlor. The neighbors never complained. The neighbors were 450 million miles away. And the boys were tighter than a ketchup bottle at lunchtime. The last time the captain had looked up the hatch and called for his kiddies in a gentle voice, Hell! The kids had thrown snowballs at him. The captain had vanished. Clever the way they made these space bombs nowadays. A few minutes previous, the boys had been tearing up old amazings and throwing them at one another. But now they contented themselves with tearing up just the editors. Palmer was torn in half, and he sat in a corner arguing with himself about rejecting a story for an hour before anyone put him through the orange juice machine, killing him. Orange juice. Sorry now? And then they landed on Venus. How in heck they got back there so quick was a wonder of science. But... There they were. Come on, girls, cried Quelch. Put on your shin guards and get out there and dig ditches for good old WPA and the Rover Boys Academy, Earth Branch 27. Out into the staggering rain they dashed. Five minutes later, they came back in, gasping, reeling. They had forgotten their corsets. The Venusians closed in like a million landlords. "'Charge, men!' cried Quelch, running the other way. And then, battle. "'What a fight, folks!' said Quelch. Twenty thousand Earthmen against two Venusians. "'We're outnumbered, but we'll fight.' "'Bloosh! Correction! Ten thousand men fighting. Kerblum! 
One hundred men from Earth left. Boom. This is the last man speaking, folks. What a fight. I ain't had so much fun since... Help! Somebody just clipped my corset strings. Boom. Someone just clipped me. The field was silent. The ship lay gleaming in the pink light of dawn that was just blooming over the mountains like a pale flower. The two Venusians stood weeping over the bodies of the earthlings like onion peelers or two women in a bargain basement. One Venusian looked at the other Venusian and in a high-pitched hoarse voice said, I, 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 this, it should happen to a dog, not a doity little dog and dawn came peacefully, like barrels of beer rolling. The End of The Fight of the Good Ship Clarissa by Ray Bradbury